uh, I'm very sorry for the uh, conference. Uh, we'll start the session right away. So uh, I would like to welcome you all to the international conference on advanced computing, communication and, te and communication technology ICA WCD 2021. Morning, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, sir. You are audible. Yes, thank you so much, sir. I'm really sorry for the delay. Uh, we'll start the session right away. Just give me a minute to share the presentation. Uh, so, uh, welcome you all to our international conference on advanced computing and communication technology, which is going to be held at uh, international conference, which is going to be held at ICC, ICA WC 2021, jointly organized by Department of Information Technology, Francis Xavier Engineering College, Thinner Way. Yes. And uh, coming about our college, I would like to so, uh, I, I would like to uh, talk about our college, so which is the Francis Xavier Engineering College, popularly known as FX Engineering College, was established in the year two thousand with the vision of empower body engineers in technology, technical and entrepreneurial training, and to contribute to the socio-economic augmentation of the nation. The college is located in the heart of the city of Tirunelveli, Herald, worldwide as the Oxford of South India, and is well connected by road, rail, and air. Students of FX Engineering College are given the opportunity to pursue first rate and advanced technical education regardless of background, gender, or financial constraints. The necessity to promote most advantageous learning and service is well harmonized and clearly expressed by allowing students to successfully plan their education and competently achieve the education they need. Circular and co-circular programs from an integral part of the curriculum and help students to have commanding incorporation of theory and practical knowledge. Each individual is motivated to increase the gravity of responsibility and be committed to serve the nation. So the college is full of opportunities where students' talents can thrive and it systematically transforms and they graduate to a future-ready professional. The institution is open to the exchange of ideas where discovery, creativity, and personal and professional development can flourish. It's a responsive, student oriented institution that is committed to the creation, dissemination, and acquisition of knowledge 
for teaching research and service. So now coming about prior to the uh, our dignitaries, I would like to give a small brief introduction about our conference and the IFERP. So IFERP Institute for Engineering Research and Publication is one of the world's largest non-profitable professional associations operating under Technorate Research and Development Association, which is FEDA, meant for research and development in the field of engineering, science, and technology. IFERP is a paramount body which has brought technical revolution and sustainable development in the field of technology, engineering, and science. So coming about our conference, which is International Conference on Advancing Computing and Communication Technology, aims to bring together leading academic scientists, researchers, and research scholars to exchange and share their ideas and research results about all aspects of engineering technology and innovation. Nowadays, the academia and researchers are not playing content, but also experience the overwhelming outcomes of interdisciplinary research. Moreover, it has been curiously appraised by the governments, research agencies, and by the academic institutions. It has been the contest of the conference is to foster as well as exaggerate the conference the research culture among academia and industry facilitated by the sprinkled out ideas by exchange of intellect during conduct of conference. So now I would like to uh, welcome our all our honorable dignitaries. Firstly, I would like to welcome the first three dignitaries who are first uh, is Dr. Jay Kumar. Is from SCAD Group of Institutions and Dr. Veer Murugal, sir, from Francis Xavier Engineering College and Oscar Korea from IT Directorate Marifa Education, Kenya, and Dr. Richard Sinot, Director at Research Institute of Melbourne, Australia, and our Honorable CEO of Technology Research and Development, Mr. Rudra Banu Satpati. Welcome all our dignitaries uh, to be a part in our conference and thank you for joining us during this pandemic situation and imparting their expertise with us. I would like to also take this opportunity to welcome all the presenters across the India who have spared a valuable time in lighting with us for the valuable researches and closing with our conferences. So, prior, uh, I would like to uh, so uh, I would like to uh, address and welcome our valuable keynote speaker. The first keynote speaker is uh, Dr. Oscar Korea from IT Director at Mari for Education in Kenya. And the second keynote speaker who is Dr. Simot Director at Research University of Melbourne and University. Thank you so much for your valuable keynote speakers uh, for be joining us. And I would like to uh, hand over this inauguration session. And prior to that, I would like to proceed with our session chairs, which will be uh, which will be our session chairs for the upcoming session plans. Who is Dr. T. C. Subalakshmi? She is a professor at the Department of Information Technology at Francis Xavier Engineering College, Tirunal Valley. And Dr. K. Lakshmi Narayanan, who is an associate professor at the Department of Computer Science Engineering, Francis Xavier Engineering College at Tirunal Valley. And Dr. Kutesh Kumar is a professor, faculty of computing and software engineering at Ardha Minch University, Ethiopia. Thank you so much uh, for being joined with to a valuable conference. Uh, so, prior to going to the proceeding books, I would like to hand over this virtual inaugural session to Dr. Jainul Fatima, who is Assistant Professor IT at Francis Xavier College. So, I would like to uh, take over the session by Ms. Uh, Jainul Fatima, ma'am. Very good morning, ma'am. 
Yes, sir. Am I audible, sir? Yes, you are perfectly audible, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much for the participation, so that we can proceed with your inaugural sessions. Yeah, thank you, sir. On behalf of Francis Xavier Engineering College, I welcome you all for this international virtual conference on advanced computing and communication technology. Dear participants, kindly mute your mic. I have a problem. Dear participants, please mute your mics. Welcome you all for this international conference on advanced computing and communication technology. So I request Ms. Monica Ma'am to start the session with a prayer. So good morning all. Uh, prayer. Our loving and most gracious Heavenly Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you and praise you for the new day and, this con and for this conference. Before starting this conference, we stand before you, Father, and seeking, seeking you for your grace and guidance throughout this conference. Be with us and guide us. You ask all these things in the name of our love, Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Mom. So we'll start the session. Yes, ma'am. Uh, do you want to proceed with any of the presentations? Yes, sir. I mean, yes, ma'am. You can you can proceed. Okay. Facing any trouble to start? Ms. On behalf Jackman. of France, yes, sir. Yeah. No, I'm sorry, ma'am. I'm sorry to interrupt. You can proceed. Thank you. On behalf of Francis Xavier Engineering College, very good morning to one and all present here, and thank you for joining us at the two day international virtual conference on advanced computing and communication technology in association with Institute for Engineering Research and Publication. First and foremost, I would like to thank the Almighty for showering his blessing on us. I would also like to welcome our Chairman, Vice Chairperson, MD Sir, GMD Sir, Principal Sir, Professor Academics, Ma'am Hachodi Sir, faculty members and delegates from various institutions. It's my pleasure to welcome you all for the International Conference 2021. It's my pleasure to walk you through the conference, introduce you to the speakers and delegates, who have come from all over the country today to share their knowledge to widen our mental horizon. I welcome all the eminent speakers and guests from all over the country belonging to different walks of life who have come here to share their knowledge and vast experience with the student community. The theme of this conference is on recent advancement in advanced computing and communication technology. We have around 128 research papers, out of which 60 papers were shortlisted after a technical review and selected for presentation. We are proud to announce that this conference is being conducted in association with Institute for Engineering Research and Publication, who have been consistently supporting us. There will be a plenty of knowledge enhancing session with eminent speakers. 
the delegates and the esteemed panel members and juries will be judging the paper presentation sessions. The main outcome of this conference is to come up with innovative ideas in computing and communication field. The crux of this conference will be the use of digital technologies such as artificial intelligence, augmented reality, and virtual reality that is being increasingly adopted after the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic. We hope this two-day conference would help the participants to expand their mental horizon and help the researchers to share their knowledge. I request all the delegates and participants to make use of these two days to the best of their abilities. Thank you. Thank you for joining here. Next, I request Professor G. Prince Devraj, Head of the Department, Department of Information Technologies, to share a few words about the conference. Sir? Ah, no, ah, yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir, please do. Uh, good morning. Am I audible? Yes, yes sir, sir. You are audible. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, already, um, Mr. Pratik uh, spoke about uh, the institution. And uh, just I want to give introduction about this uh, conference as well as the uh, department. And this International Conference on Advanced Computing and Communication Technology is the uh, fifth conference conducted by our department. And this institution, Francis Xavier Engineering College, was um, uh, started by our uh, chairman, Dr. Cletus Babu, in 2000. On the same year itself, uh, we have started the IT department also. We started the institution with the three departments, Information Technology Department, Computer Science and Engineering Department, and Electronics and Communication Engineering Department. Later, uh, during 2007, uh, we started MTech IT with the intake of 18. And we uh, did our first international conference during 2007. And uh, our institution, um, Francis Xavier Engineering College, is an autonomous institution. We got the autonomous during 2019. And our department, um, Department Information Technology, uh, is uh, having more than six gold medals from Anna University. Our uh, PG students, MTech students, uh, six uh, students have got gold medals. And totally, we have received more than 13 university ranks uh, from Anna University. And uh, we are very thankful to the management uh, for providing uh, various uh, infrastructures for our department. Our uh, department is uh, uh, has already received uh, 50 lakhs from DRDO uh, for various research funding activities uh, from ICMR, AACP, and MODROPS. And we in the IT department are providing uh, skills using a skill rack and hacker rank. And we are experts in Arduino programming. Uh, our uh, department uh, faculty are experts and uh, they are doing projects in Arduino. And we are having two separate labs, special labs funded by AACT. Uh, one is Cyber Forensics Lab, uh, which is uh, under the guidance of Dr. Ravi. He is uh, double doctorate uh, in uh, Cyber Forensics. And one more special lab is being um, Data Science Lab, and that is taken care by our um, uh, professor, Dr. Anita. So our department is uh, having various value-added courses. It is providing Oracle certified courses, Java certified courses, and we are having separate uh, IBM Bluemix courses. So our department, uh, when a student is coming to our department, our department, uh, he is being uh, trained in uh, 360 degrees. Our ultimate aim is to produce technical engineers with strong ethical and moral background. So um, our department, after uh, from uh, the uh, 2000, we are uh, conducting these uh, international conferences. And this is the uh, fifth international conference that department is conducting. 
and i thank uh, the keynote speakers uh, mainly uh, the people from um, various countries uh, dr richard asinat uh, dr askar korenia uh, so i welcome all those people and also all the participants and we are going to give um, we are going to uh, find the best paper in every session so uh, i thank the keynote uh, people as well as the session chairs our department faculty dr subalakshmi dr carlin uh, dr anita and uh, uh, others who are, are going to uh, work uh, from behind uh, for the success of this uh, uh, conference thank you all and uh, um, be interactive and always uh, learn uh, whatever thing you can from this conference thank you thank you sir now i request to play a video about our college Francis Xavier Engineering College, one of the best in the world, is one of the best in the world in the world of institutions in Tamil Nadu. The college is awarded with gold category in the AICTE CII survey for two consecutive years. Ethix provides holistic education and enhanced skill training to make its students industry ready. Unbeatable placement record. cutting edge research state of the art applied labs are the hallmark of fx easy get enrolled and experience unlimited learning Life is a journey full of challenges, and sometimes it can be a challenge to make the right decision. Hi, this is Sundar Raj from Ram Sundar Engineering College, Department of Information Technology of 2020 Batch. This four years of engineering journey taught me many lessons. The first lesson that I found was that it guided me in the right way to choose my domain. On my second year of engineering, I got IBM certified. done many projects on data science uh, which is related to the real time projects and helped me in a way to get based in my major of course you know college means degree degree means job thanks to francis andre college for providing me a best training regarding the placement which helped me to get placed in car technologies with the annual cpc of 5 lakh and also in cognizant with the annual cpc of 4 lakh being in francis andre college is like a staying on the road to the damascus 
where you can gain the required knowledge to achieve your goals. Thank you. Francis Xavier of Engineering College, Panarpete Tsunarvili, is one of the best autonomous NBA accredited institutions in Tamil Nadu. The college is awarded with gold category by AICTE CII survey for two consecutive years. FX provides holistic education and enhanced skill training to make its students industry ready. Unbeatable placement report, cutting edge research, state of the art applied labs are the hallmark of FX Easy. Get enrolled and experience unlimited learning. Life is a journey full of challenges, and sometimes it can be a challenge to make the right decision. The Raj from a Francis Xavier Engineering College, Department of Information Technology of 2020 batch. This four years of engineering journey taught me many lessons. This is the platform that I found myself. My department faculty guided me in the right way to choose my domain. On my second year of engineering, I got IBM certified on predictive modeling, which helped me to choose my domain as a data scientist. I have done many projects on data science. Uh, Ma'am, it seems related to the same video project, is repeating it. And helped me in a way to get grades in my major. Of course, you know, college means degree, and degree means job. Thanks to Francis and Drake College. For it will get finished within two minutes, sir. Oh, okay, okay. I thought the same video is repeating again. In car technology. Yes, sir. Okay. So my leg. And also in car business with the analogy of four legs. Being in Francis and Drake College is like a string on the road. To the Damascus. Now you can gain the required knowledge to achieve your goals. Thank you. Uh, the video presentation shows a few glimpses of our campus, Francis Xavier Engineering College. So, without much delay, we'll start with the uh, keynote speaker address. So, the first speaker is, sir, can you please introduce the speaker one? Definitely, definitely. I will yeah. proceed with thank you so much, ma'am, for your valuable information on the college. So, it's a valuable and uh, attractive video that we have seen so far. So, I would like to uh, call our first eminent keynote speaker, who is Mr. Oscar Correria, at IT director at Mari for Education in Kenya. Just a brief information about him. So, Mr. Oscar has more than 20 years of experience in information technology spanning various sectors, including education, telecommunications, mobile financial services, IT outsourcing, and product management. His last assignment was leading one of the largest mobile phoning and managed services as vice president. Financial services at Mahindra Kumbiva. Prior to that, he spent 10 years at Atal Africa, working in Kenya, where he played various roles from IT director to head of products. Oscar has a degree in electrical engineering from the University of Nairobi, a postgraduate diploma in telecommunication from Aston University, and an MBA from Warwick Business School. He also holds <laughs> certifications in ITIL and Cisco, as well as Prince2 certification. So uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Oscar Correria uh, to give this valuable presentation. 
Very good morning, sir. Morning, morning. Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. So we can hear you. Thank you so much. We are so glad to be uh, you that you are being a keynote speaker for us. I request you to proceed with your uh, invaluable sessions. Okay. May I share my screen? Definitely. Uh, so you should see my presentation. Yes, your screen is yes, it's visible, sir. Okay, so so thank you very much for having me. Uh, I was very impressed uh, by the video. <coughs> you saw. Thank you so uh, much, yeah, so thank you again uh, for for the introduction. And basically, without further ado, I will just dive into my topic. Uh, <clears throat> it was very interesting to see that you are very focused on engineering and that you'll see you all are a leading university in ai and automation so i think my topic may be quite appropriate for you which is ethics in ai <clears throat> so basically uh, i think uh, ai for many years for, at least in the recent past has become very popular uh, but one of the things that's not very discussed about AI is actually the ethics, although there's a lot of anecdotal discussion around it. So I just wanted to present a few things on, on AI, you know, a little bit of the history, which I'm sure you all know very well. And I believe uh, uh, some of the recent advances, which again, I think you will cover much <coughs> detail in your, in your conference. But I want to also highlight some of the risks of AI and some of the solutions and, and henceforth the way forward. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, one of the important things is to understand how we got here because uh, AI is uh, becoming part of uh, our society but AI has not always been like that. Uh, we know technology started in the late 50s and there was a lot of uh, enthusiasm about artificial in intelligence. And in the next slides, I just want to show you a little bit about the history of AI, which again, I'm pretty sure you're well aware of, but uh, I think it's important to understand a bit the history of AI from a philosophical point of view and that uh, it's important to understand that you know man and machine have been around for a long time for from uh, I mean as early as as actually 70,000 years ago when when man first appeared on the earth you know uh, people have been using technology and technology has evolved over time uh, through all kinds of uh, evolutions. But in truth, it has really accelerated in the last 200 years. And uh, one of the most significant events probably in the history of AI was a famous conference in, uh, in 1956 called the Dartmouth Conference. Uh, when AI was first born. And uh, basically there was a lot of uh, hope, uh, a lot of uh, ambition about what AI could do, how AI could replace human beings and, uh, and do what they were doing. But the truth is that very quickly people found that actually computers were quite limited. Uh, that all the power that they seemed to have was not something you could easily control, uh, that you, they couldn't do even the most basic activities. And so for, for, for years, for several years, like between in the, in the late seventies, you know, people gave up on it. And then there was a little bit more boom when, you know, the first personal computers came out against, they were, again, there was enthusiasm that, uh, you know, AI could really change the world. Uh, but again, people got stuck, engineers got stuck in developing algorithms and technology that could mimic human beings. And basically these two periods of history, we know them, they were like AI winters when nothing was happening. 
But recently advances in, in hardware, I mean, you've been talking about Adreno, that's fantastic. Uh, advances in algorithms, the internet, you know, and the coming of big data have created a new, a new launch pad for AI. And, uh, and as much as technology is improving, you know, it's not just the technology by itself, you know, not the number of processes itself, it's also the environment in terms of data, in terms of connectivity. And basically this has given rise to something which I'm pretty sure you're well aware of, the fourth industrial age, you know, where everything is connected. So the, the, the one thing about AI is that uh, in my view, AI is not just, uh, just a part of information technology. You know, AI is something that is reaching out to each and every uh, domain. Yeah, over here I've shown you a little bit about AI in uh, robotics and uh, and HR. Yeah, AI is beginning to uh, touch every aspect of our lives, and we don't even realize it. And and this is uh, sometimes a bit of a challenge because uh, many times we are using Google and Google is using AI and maybe we don't appreciate the ethics or the risks behind what we're doing. Uh, moving on, I mean, AI is also very heavily used in marketing. Uh, every time you click, there's an AI engine behind what you're doing. Even today, IT operations is, uh, has become something that is AI driven. You know, in the past, we used to have ITSM. Okay, we still have it, but now it's AI driven and you're moving towards, uh, you know, more predictive uh, analysis of, of, of false than, uh, than reactive. <clears throat> moving still further, I'm sure that you are well aware of using AI in education and especially during this uh, COVID period, yeah, and uh, I know right now in India it's a bit tough. I hope you're all well. <laughs> uh, but basically, uh, COVID has given a boost to technology in education. And in addition to that, it has given a boost to AI in education because, uh, because by going online, you're able to reach way more students. And if you're able to reach way more students to actually manage them, it doesn't just scale in having, you know, a certain number of, of lecturers per student. You need some kind of technology to, to automate the learning process. Uh, and then just as well in law, okay, you have uh, discussions about, you know, uh, I'm sure you, I've noticed that you have IBM, so you must know quite well about IBM Watson. And you'll know that IBM Watson can analyze documents much faster than uh, lawyers and with a higher level of accuracy. Yeah, at least the documents, the legal documents that are common, you know, or 80% of the work. So you can see that AI is touching every single aspect of our lives. And, uh, and while IT used to do something similar, AI has the potential to make a difference. So in my view, it's gaining much more traction than the traditional IT used to. <clears throat> so, so moving on, uh, when we talk of AI, one of the challenges with AI is what exactly is AI? Is it a robot? Is it a program? Yeah, and, and this is uh, one of the challenges in terms of defining what is AI. And uh, uh, taking a, something from Russell, okay, who is, whose textbook is quite popularly used in AI courses, uh, you can see that, you know, when we have technology and when we have, uh, <clears throat> we have an independence of thought, we have an independence of action, and today you all are well aware that we have, you know, narrow AI and uh, general AI, you know, and, and the main area of focus uh, is in the narrow AI domain. Yeah, but 
and basically these are solutions meant for very specific situations whether these situations are just software based or hardware based you know but there's a growing demand or there's a growing uh, let's say movement to put some kind of let's say in quotes consciousness in machines you know a way of machines thinking and working independently you know and already you have robots that have a certain level of independence although they don't think in very advanced ways like i'm sure you've heard of sophia or you've seen the boston atlas robots you know but uh, the danger is becoming that you know slowly that you know that great computing power will become embodied in a very uh, let's say independent uh, independent robot you know and are we going to get a terminator like situation okay that's a bit extreme i think <laughs> you know but uh, the, the the real problem is not uh, that it might not happen the real problem is we don't know where we are going and uh, it's important to with all these technologies to have control of where we are going you know and we need to to balance you know the service to mankind with human dignity yeah and i think in your introduction video you'll mention that one of the key elements is is ethical education <clears throat> so moving on uh you know one of the interesting things about human beings is that you know when, when it, uh, let's say in the when the mammoths were around on earth you know when the mammoths moved from one part of the earth to the other part of the earth they 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 had a change in their dna you know they used to have fur because they were in the very cold parts of the earth but when they moved you know to the hotter parts they kind of lost the fur so actually what happened is that their dna changed and you see this kind of uh, evolution in many types of animals where you know there were changes in dna because of changes in environment but what's interesting about man is that man doesn't need a dna change to move to a new environment man has technology and using technology is part of our dna so if we want to go to a you know a colder or a, well let's take a colder climate for example we will just build clothes that will keep us warm you know so basically this is something that dif makes us different from you know the other other animals let's say and it's something that uh, is part of our dna and the challenge we have today is uh, and and i'm sure you experience is that this is that there's a lot of solutions out there on ai you know a lot and it's it's not only you know as as we've seen in the previous slides restricted to it but it's touching all kinds of domains and and this brings a new ethical challenge you know that we need to build ethics not as a fence but as part of the design you know that when we are designing we need to think already of ethics yeah and uh and because tomorrow you know like we have democracy we are going to have algo algocracy you know where algorithms determine our life almost in a similar way we need to have something called algorithms you know and the ai solutions we need to develop need to be human centered machines must adapt to man and not the other way around you know so machines need to defer to man and and accept what man want so one of the key things in any technical design uh is is a uh, is the, the human dignity you know and human dignity needs to be at the core of our of our designs and not data you know i mean we all know that many of the solutions we build are based on data but we need to at the same time consider human dignity in these designs so just a few risks on ai and the truth about the risks on ai there are a lot of people who have written a lot about this so i've just chosen a few and uh, i have lots of resources on this and if you wish we can uh, i can share them with you uh, but basically one of the one of the uh, main challenges with ai comes from bias the fact that uh, what we think applies to one group doesn't apply to another group 
and uh, and uh, basically you find this uh, case study here where <coughs> uh, you know we're applying normal facial recognition to uh, to members of Congress in the U.S. turned up totally different results than what was actually on the ground. Yeah, so. One of the things we need to be careful in the development of AI is, uh, you know, the inclusion of bias in the data, you know, and what's interesting, um, again, I'm pretty sure you may be aware of it, but already there are movements and there are startups that are using not only real data, but synthetic data, you know, so they go ahead and they create their own data in order to train their, their AI machines. Yeah, so basically <clears throat> we need to understand that you know bias can come from the data, bias can come from the way the algorithm is designed, and we need to be aware of this, you know. And this awareness is not just for technology people; it's for everyone, because everyone needs to be aware that okay, if there's an AI machine behind making a decision, there could be some form of bias. <clears throat> Another aspect is safety, and this is a very uh, a fairly big debate in the AI world because safety is, uh, you know, safety is a bit relative because when you have an algorithm that is doing something, you know, that doesn't have a big impact, maybe you don't care too much about the safety of it. But then when it gets into a, a more sensitive environment, like, okay, you see like the driverless cars, okay, then safety becomes more critical. And, uh, you know, I think you're all very familiar with programming paradigms and the time, the problem is that many times we use libraries and uh, we don't know exactly how the libraries are built and how safe they are. And obviously one danger is if we just blindly use libraries in all, you know, in any environment, we may end up, uh, you know, causing more harm than good. And, uh, and obviously, uh, I mean, other aspects of safety include, you know, the possibility of being hacked, you know, AI algorithms are a bit uh, obfuscating, you know, sometimes you don't know really what's happening. And then if a hacker is able to hijack it and put his own logic, you may not even realize this. Yeah. And then obviously there are risks around data poisoning, why someone uh, changes the data according to their own intention. And then uh, lastly, uh, without doubt, we are all aware that uh, a lot of people have seen robots and automation away as a way of uh, building weapons, AWS, not at the Amazon one, but autonomous weapon systems, you know, and, and this is becoming more and more popular and, uh, and we don't know where it's actually going to go. So this is why ever more than ever, we need to, to think of ethics in our, in our development of technology. So in <clears throat> another way of looking at it is coming from Florida is chairman of the European institution, Institute of AI ethics, <coughs> is to look at, you know, a technology or AI specifically brings a lot of benefits to us. But too much of a good thing is a bad thing. And, and sometimes what happens is that, you know, you try to do too much good or people, people can misuse the good that you're trying to do. Uh, so while enhancing self-realization, you may devalue skills, you know, while trying to improve human agency, you may remove your responsibility, improve societal capabilities, you remove control, you know, and I guess, to one extent you have, uh, uh, you know, what happened with COVID. I mean, th theoretically uh, people have, you know, cameras in cities to monitor, you know, CCTV, CCTV cameras, but these are normally meant, you know, to identify malicious elements in society, but they can all also be used, you know, to control or monitor people's movements. Uh, <clears throat> All right, so moving on uh, to the solutions. Uh, I believe you can still hear me. Uh, yes, uh, we All right. able to hear you. All right, great. So moving on to the solutions, uh, I'm going to just look at four solutions. And basically one of the first solutions is collaboration. 
So basically this calls for the design process to involve everyone in the, not in the organization, but from different functional units, you know, people who are in marketing, engineering, production. Typically what we do when we design things as IT people is we design them and then we go and present them. Here we're asking for a different approach when you're developing AI systems. You need to involve the users. You need to involve uh, people who are not necessarily users, but who have an idea of it. And one of the key things behind this type of collaboration is diversity. You need people from different backgrounds. Yeah, you just, uh, it's not just about having everyone with the same mindset. In fact, that's the worst thing you can have. You need people with different uh, backgrounds, different understandings, and you need to have conversations that uh, don't, uh, you know, where people reason aggressively, I would say, and even freely, but that you explore all the possibilities of what could happen with a specific solution. Uh, another, <clears throat> another interesting approach uh, to to developing, uh, you know, responsible AI is something called algorithmics, you know, which was initiated in Rome in, and is supported by IBM and Microsoft. And I'm not sure if, uh, I'm pretty sure that you'll have done the IBM uh, course in, uh, in uh, artificial intelligence, but you'll notice that in the IBM uh, courses, they do stress a lot on ethics. You know, there's a lot of focus on ethics. Yeah, and the basic idea is that, you know, uh, the code must be transparent. We need to explain everything that these AI systems do. We need to be inclusive. We need to consider everyone. And this is difficult because, I mean, if you develop a solution in India, you might not necessarily have tested it in Africa, you know? Uh, so how do you know it's going to, to work there? And then obviously there's the element of responsibility, you know, that, I mean, we know to a certain extent what is right and what is wrong and and we need to make sure we do that but also we know that you know i mean typical parts of software development include testing and you know at least all these things need to be done properly then also there's the element of impartiality yeah to to ensure that we're not <clears throat> we're not uh, building biases and sometimes this is difficult and this is why you have the cross-functional teams because you have people of different diverse backgrounds. And sometimes what happens is that for you, it may be a very normal thing, but someone from a different background may see the bias. And then because AI solutions are now becoming such a part of reality, you know, they're becoming critical everyday things. They need to work reliably. You know, we need like 99.9% .9 availability, you know. And then lastly, as I mentioned, you know, security and privacy is even more complicated now with AI. Yeah. And, uh, and you have a whole uh, department on cybersecurity, so I will not say more there. <clears throat> Another way of looking at AI is to build what is known as trustworthy AI, where you focus on human oversight. Humans need to understand what is happening, where you have technical robustness and safety. Yeah, so uh, basically this is about, and I think this is something that goes back a little bit to the design aspect of AI, that when you're designing AI, you need to understand in which environment it's going to work and clearly define the limits to what it's going to, to do. Yeah, another element of trustworthy AI is the data from which you use, yeah. Basically, we know that the engine of AI is data you know, and, uh, and we need to be very clear about where we get the data from. If we're getting it from people, they need to have signed for it. We need to make sure that the data has the right quality. I think many of you may be aware of the case with Amazon where Amazon were using AI to, to identify potential employees. And then there was, they actually detected a bias in selecting potential and, uh, candidates. Uh, transparency. The problem with AI is that some of the algorithms are so complicated. We've seen computers play man and beat man in games like chess and go. And to understand the logic up behind them sometimes takes more than just, uh, you know, a few minutes to understand. It's not just looking at a flowchart. 
because sometimes these machines are even building their own algorithms. Uh, the other thing, which is about diversity, which we've mentioned, you know, and uh, also about understanding the well being. So, one of the biggest challenges with AI is that it's very difficult to, you know, when, when you have a civil engineer, you know, in order to be a civil engineer, you do your degree, then you do some, you have to practice for several years. You get registered by, you know, the civil engineering society, and everyone knows you're a civil engineer, and you can only take up a job to build a building uh, because you're a civil engineer, a registered one. With AI, you know, you can be in India, you may not be certified by anyone, but you can be building uh, AI technology for someone in another country. So the problem with AI is that it's very difficult to, uh, to actually restrict it. Yeah, and this comes to the last point here, which is about accountability <clears throat> and tracing back, you know, and sometimes the problem with AI is, okay, I developed this algorithm for a specific function, someone took it because I put it in open source and they used it for a totally different purpose, which caused harm. So who is responsible for that? And then <clears throat> lastly, uh, I think one of the key solutions for AI is we need to teach AI across uh, all disciplines. AI is not just something for, for IT people or technology people. You know, we need people to understand that these algorithms can have bias and to identify where the bias is coming from. And, uh, and so what I'm actually proposing is that, I mean, obviously the technical people, the IT people will have more knowledge, more, you know, specific technical knowledge, how to do a specific task, but everyone needs to know what AI is and what it can do and the harm it can do. Uh, and with that, I just uh, propose a, a little bit of a way forward. You know, that uh, typically when we come from a scientific background, our main focus is can something work? You know, we don't really, we're not so keen whether it's the right thing or the wrong thing. And then ethics is asking us, should we really do it? Because you can do it, should we do it? You know, and so this is the classical dynamo. Uh, and then, as I said, it's very difficult to govern AI. Uh, it's very difficult to govern AI because uh, uh, AI is not something that, uh, you know, you can visibly control, you know, you register your, it's very difficult to say, let's register all our programs a as AI. You know, there are people who are just going to write applications anyway and deploy them and you'll have no control over that, you know, and you'll find people who want to buy them. So one of the challenges, it's a bit different from data because in data you have things like data protection acts and, and these are a little bit more easy to control. It's difficult to control AI and that's why you don't really find any country that has actually you know developed like AI laws because AI is constantly changing. The thing that is more common is you have like frameworks yeah and I've just given you some examples there. Uh, Actually in Kenya, the, 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 we don't have any, we have a data protection act, uh, but recently one, uh, there, there was an analysis from uh, Oxford University in the UK that, um, you know, ranked Kenya number five in Africa, <laughs> but actually it's not true. Kenya doesn't really have a proper, uh, you know, AI framework. Uh, and then basically my last slide just is, you know, about recommendations, you know, we need to understand that we are, living in a very dynamic world and that ordinary regulation is not going to work, you know, and we need to identify certain no-go zones, you know, areas we wouldn't get into. And then based on this to build frameworks, you know, uh, frameworks and guidance uh, and implement this both on the supply side and the demand side, you know, making sure that, uh, you know, developers uh, follow the regulations Again, it's hard to implement them, but at least to have some guidelines. Uh, and then also to, to create multi-stakeholder evaluation groups, you know, to demand this. <clears throat> and then lastly, at a higher level is to have a body of experts who can provide guidance. And then the last point is to try and build virtuous AI, which is basically means that every step of development of AI, you uh, involve, you know, you involve ethics, a certain code of ethics. All right, 
with that, uh, I thank you. Sorry, I have some references, but that's not all. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for your valuable speech and the information. Participants, Sorry? thank you so much, sir. I hope I'm audible to you. Yes, I am. You are, sir. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for your valuable session. Uh, so, uh, technically, participants or any other eminent speakers or any, any other uh, any other can raise any questions or ask any inputs, get any inputs from our eminent keynote speaker. If they won't raise any queries, they can raise the queries right away. No problem. Okay, thank you so much. If they want to raise it later, they can do it uh, through the chat box. So next I would like to proceed uh, with our eminent keynote speaker, second keynote speaker uh, by Dr. Is Mr. Dr. Richard Sinot. He's a director at the Research University of Melbourne, Australia. The small information about him is like Professor Richard is a professor of applied computer systems at the University of Melbourne. He has been technical lead on a multitude of large scale international projects with emphasis on security worth over $500 million. This includes numerous projects in the defense, intelligence, and biomedical domains. He has over 400 peer reviewed publications across a range of computing and application specific domains. So I would like to uh, call Dr. Richard, sir. Dr. Richard sir, uh, can proceed if he's available. Or I request uh, all the participants to give him give me a minute so that uh, I will be back by confirming about Sir's presentation. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for being based, so patient with us in this valuable conference. Uh, so uh, we have contacted our second keynote speaker, and he will be connecting to us shortly. So I request everyone to be uh, please wait for his valuable session to get inputs. I request everyone to be uh, please be on hold for your future conferences. We will be connecting with him shortly. Thank you so much.
social, cultural, scientific and economic development of the country. In this uh, pandemic uh, situation, we provide safe and secure environment following the rules and regulations, procedures and instructions given by Government of Tamil Nadu, Central Government, ICMR and World Health Organization. also like to emphasize that even though the corona situation is on a global level we are ready to take up this as a challenge to ensure that we are completely sanitized and we are taking it very seriously protecting our campuses and our students giving utmost importance to each and every point with regard to social distancing and to face this COVID pandemic situation. In our uh, small group of institutions, we have taken utmost care to give the best safety and a healthy life. And all the uh, measures prescribed by the government and WHO are being followed. And I wish that every one of us in this community also follow those things and stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Science Civil Engineering College was established in the year 2000 and has reached various milestones. It is an autonomous and newly accredited institution with a great effort to keep everyone who enters the campus safe. The college follows all COVID-19 preventive measures. Further, adherence to COVID-19 hygienic practices make the campus amiable. Your safety is our priority. The salubrious atmosphere and conducive environment makes the college the best abode to transform its students into a future ready professional. We create a strong academic foundation, not only in technology development, but also in social, cultural, scientific and economic development of the country. In this uh, pandemic uh, situation, we provide safe and secure environment following the rules and regulations, procedures and instructions given by Government of Tamil Nadu, Central Government, ICMR and World Health Organization.
also like to emphasize that even though the corona situation is on a global level we are ready to take up this as a challenge to ensure that we are completely sanitized and we are taking it very seriously protecting our campuses and our students giving our most importance to each and every point with regard to social distancing and to face this covid pandemic situation in our start group of institutions we have taken utmost care to give the best safety and the healthy life and all the measures prescribed by the government and who are being followed and i wish that every one of us in this community also follow those things and stay safe and healthy thank you so much excuse me sir sir i think uh, the speaker has joined shall we start the session sir yes definitely we can yeah. proceed thank you sir now i would like to uh, welcome dr richard sinot sir hello folks good morning sir we are really glad to be as a part you and you be as a part for this respective conference so uh, we have given the introduction of of your uh, professional work so you can proceed with your uh, session sir you can start sharing your presentation we can proceed okay will do let me just share my screen Hopefully you can all see my screen okay? Absolutely. Okay, so I I have uh, I I someone reached out to me on LinkedIn and asked me to be involved and I'm more than happy to. I just like to say from the from the outset I I I I'm deeply um thinking about all the things that are going on in India right now and it's a terrible time for everyone. Um but anyway. So what I'm going to talk about I wasn't entirely sure of the audience which is never a good sign so I thought I'd talk a little bit about what I do and the kind of platforms I build and how it's changing the world in different areas. So um just a little bit of background about myself to start with. So once upon a time I used to do marathons I don't do them very much anymore. Uh but my background is in theoretical physics uh, many years ago. I did a master's in software engineering, I did a PhD in distributed systems. I did my postdoc work in Germany, so I was there for maybe 5 years I guess. Uh I've been a lecturer. I was also editor of some international standards in in the um going into distributed systems. This is pre-Corba and if anyone said about the sort of distributed platforms that were very much in favor flavor of uh, maybe 15 20 years ago I was the editor of a lot of those kind of works I guess I had my own company I was at the University of Glasgow before I came to Melbourne and I was there for 8 years or so and I was the director of something called the National E-Science Center which I'll talk a little about in a, in, a, in a moment I was all been involved in life sciences bioinformatics and I came to Melbourne in 2010 and my job really is to be the director of e research i also have a chair in applied computing so most of my work is uh, in this sort of e research space for those who don't know anything about what that means i mean there's words that we label um various sort of activities the e research or e science as it used to be known meant many things to many people it was about e-commerce originally that was the basic idea electronic commerce but it meant many things so many people took e-research to be dealing with high performance computing and grid technologies and dealing with 
petabytes and exabytes of data and running supercomputers at, at our full capacity. Um, I was kind of more pragmatic. My, I guess I've been fairly successful, I guess you can say, in building software systems that people use. And for the most part, this is because it's never about me. I mean, I'm a professor. I publish papers in journals and conferences. But most of my e-research efforts are targeted to building systems for other people, to th for them to do what they want to do. And I've had many, many projects, maybe a few hundred projects now working across the, um, the, the research landscape from art and humanities to zoology. So I've, there's very few areas I haven't touched in my research in the last 20 years, I guess, from a non-computing science domain. A lot of the time I'm dealing with sensitive data, which I'll talk about in a little while. So dealing with ethics and consent and whose data is it anyway. And so from my side, the, the, a large part of my work is about uh, building systems for researchers. It's not about, it's not about the, the, the platforms I build. It's about what people want to do with them and, and how it enables them to do things they couldn't without me, basically. So uh, I came to Melbourne in 2010. Uh, as you can see from the slide here, I, I've now built up quite a large team of software engineers. We work on all kinds of different projects. I've, I, I get lots of grants all the time. This is kind of what I do. I probably had, well, Australian dollars, probably over $300 million now because I've got new grants coming. And I work with many, many um, researchers who have many different challenges. I work on projects with US defense, US intelligence, that's DARPA and IARPA. I, I do a lot of work in defense in Australia, looking at um, things like human resource planning, how many helicopter pilots will Australia need in the next 20 years, and how many students are coming in to get trained up as pilots or submarine commanders, things of that nature, very diverse sort of projects. I have a lot of projects in the health domain. And so I'd say, probably more projects than most people in right across from mobile apps for patients through to national registries to international registries and clinical trials and biobanking and genetics and things of that nature. So I, I have a lot of um, capability that I built up over, over some time in, in that area, I guess. I also uh, supervise literally hundreds of dissertations. So I've had over 750 master's dissertations, including many from India and from China and from all over at the University of Melbourne. So a lot of the people in the image here, I supervise their dissertation and they are good. So I gave them a job. I teach high performance computing and cloud computing. And so I, I mean, right now I'm teaching a class of 400 students. So we have large scale numbers of students doing uh, uh, um, cloud computing and, and cluster computing. But I guess the, one of the reasons I've got such a large team is that I'm very applied. I mean, some academics will publish a paper in a journal, which is very hard to IEEE transactions of whatever it might be, and it might get heavily cited. And then they build a prototype to do, write that paper, then they throw it away, they get another grant, they get the next, um, you do some more research. I tend to be more practical. I build systems that people use. And so I, I'm, I'm a bit like a, a small company within the University of Melbourne where I build software that people use, they get grants, they pay me money, we grow systems together. So that's kind of a large part of what I do. I'm very a, a practical software engineer. The people in this picture, uh, you know, they're experts in security, in cloud computing, in mobile apps, user interfaces, the whole spectrum of, uh, of software engineering. Um, so we have quite a, a, a large team doing many different projects all the time. So what I den tend not to do is pretend I understand what people want be at the beginning. So I'm very much in the Steve Jobs sort of uh, mentality. The customers that come to me to have a system built often have an idea of what they want, but I, I generally don't presume that I know what that is. Uh, I, we, I, we design systems from the ground up every time. And so we're very much an agile shop in my, my team. So from zero to a, a working system in a, a few weeks is typical to get the customer feedback. And then we evolve and grow the system with the customers themselves. So that's kind of how we do what we do. It's very rarely about what I want, it's what they want. And if they don't like the button in the left corner and they want it somewhere else, et cetera, then you know, they, they're the ones that are always right, I guess. 
most of my projects, if I had to say, are data driven. So very rarely does someone come to me and saying, hey, I've got this algorithm. Can you make it go faster? Some do. I've had some projects in that area. Uh, but for the vast majority of people, most researchers I work with have problems with data. And as I guess everybody's heard about big data these days. So there are much, many people who talk about big data, but there's not that many people who actually deal with big data. So I tend to build platforms for researchers in the big data area. And that is the volume of the data is growing. As, as we all know, there's, there's almost no research discipline these days that is not impacted by uh, the amount of data that is now being produced. Whether that's um, from arts and humanities to zoology or, or, or sort of sciences to the uh, medical disciplines, everyone's creating data and it's being increasingly stored uh, in digital form in different places. So my work is typically trying to unlock a lot of that data. Sometimes it's it's publicly accessible data, like say the Higgs boson, the Large Hadron Collider, that was a good example of a big data project where they generated petabytes of data and they tried to find you know the, the, the Higgs boson, which they did, I guess. Uh, sometimes I'm dealing with um, genetics and, and genomics and, and other flavors of omics data. I mean, I'm not a biologist, I'm not a clinician, but sometimes to build software systems, you have to actually work with the researchers themselves to understand uh, their vocabulary to build the system that they want. I have lots of projects working in the analyzing social media data and from every platform. So Twitter, Instagram, Reddit, you name it, if there's an API, we generally get that data and we do things with it. I tend to use a lot of that data for teaching. Uh, so collecting terabytes of Twitter data and then getting my students to do some analysis of what the people in Australia think of Donald Trump or you know, can we use social media to analyze movement patterns of people uh, in pre-COVID and post-COVID and a whole range of different scenarios like this, I guess. Uh, but most of the days, most of the time, I mean, there are bigger companies like your Googles and your Facebooks and all these, you know, mega giant companies that are just grabbing all of this data. So they 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 collect it all the time and they're using it for all kinds of personalized advertisements for people to, you know, you know, knowing what you like and what your friends like, they'll they'll provide you with targeted advertisements, I guess, and that's kind of what their business model is. I tend not to work in that space. I'm, if it's public data, then you know, we can build systems that can access that, and, and we do. I tend to work more where the data is not publicly accessible. So when that data is sitting behind a firewall or it's protected or there are sensitivities on access and usage of it, that could be for a whole variety of concerns. How do we build systems that work in that area where we, we are dealing with sensitive data and there are lots of it? It's distributed, it's heterogeneous, it's got different restrictions on access and usage. How do we build platforms that allow that kind of data to be brought together? So a large part of my work, work is building those kind of platforms um, for different research communities. There are many challenges in doing that. So for the most part, you know, most organizations, whether it's a government organization or a defense or a hospital or whatever, they tend to have a big thing called a firewall. And across that firewall, I mean, they might have a, you know, a website, but inside their organization, they'll have ranges of databases which collect information and file systems and et cetera. And so part of my work is to build systems that can programmatically access those resources behind the firewall. And I've had many, many recipes and built many systems that do that. Um, we often use things like service-oriented architectures, if that means anything. So looking at RESTful APIs and SOAP-based APIs and spatial APIs and medical APIs. There are many, many flavors of doing this. A large part of the challenge is there's, um, the, the actual data itself. It's typically completely heterogeneous. So you have things in a spreadsheet, things in a relational database, things in a file system, things in a, you know, whatever. Um, there are all kinds of flavors of data. It's all got different metadata. It's all labeled differently. And how do we bring these kind of you know, data sets together? A large part of my work is, is solving those kind of problems where I can take random data sets from different organizations and um, make it all look like it's the same so that you can compare them. 
I think it's fair to say that most organizations I work with have a very uh, limited view of the benefits of sharing data, uh, or uh, there are sensitivities around it going verging on paranoia, um, which is necessarily, I mean, often that's a good thing, I suppose, but it is the case that there is a, a non-technical challenges in opening up access to sensitive data, which sometimes uh, stops everything. I mean, people want to cure cancer, but you know, there has to be a way to get access to pan cancer patient data, which is, I mean, you're not going to cure cancer inside of a hospital. You're going to cure cancer by, I mean, cancer is just one example, by bringing all this data sets together and allowing researchers to, you know, uh, perform you know, various sort of research on the aggregation of data sets to, to work out which uh, treatments might work and are the particular genetics of mutations which you can identify as target therapies for particular drugs etc and the only way you can do that is by bringing data together so we, i guess we have a, a range of challenges in trying to get organizations to share data in this kind of context and and i think as as, uh, as covid is now showing we're very poor at doing this sometimes we have many challenges in sharing data and and, and the transparency and, and legitimacy of, of doing that all of my systems, generally speaking, are deployed on, on, on different clouds. So when I say cloud, I don't just mean public cloud on like Amazon, et cetera, or Azure or Google. We use all of those kind of platforms. For the most part, mo most of my sensitive data is stored on a, a private availability zone, if that makes any sense, at the University of Melbourne. So I have teams of software engineers that can manage sensitive data. And they've been doing this for a long time. And we lock down those machines to the outside world and only certain people can have um, access to them at certain times, et cetera. So we do a lot of that kind of security um, related work in setting up systems. So a lot of the time, it's not just building the system, which is the challenge. It's actually documenting how you build the system and how you, are you compliant with the legislation that's required uh, to be able to do what you do. So that's kind of the, my world, I guess. I, I kind of have many, many projects in that space. I thought probably the simplest way is just to show you a few examples of what these systems look like once I've built them. So I, I've chosen three. I have many other projects I work on, but these are three of the more transformative uh, projects, I guess you could say. So one of them is called ORIN, with the Australian Urban Research Infrastructure Network, which I'll talk about. And that's about, about data in cities, in the cities of Australia. So we want to be able to understand cities at, lot, at scale because they're very complicated um, and we want to understand how things are connected and what's the best way to design a city, et cetera, et cetera. Another platform which I, my team have built is called ADDEN. And this is very much focused on type one diabetes and collecting data from hospitals across Aust Australasia, that's Australia and New Zealand into a national registry. And the processes we, we have now for not just having some data entered into the system, but having this data um, extracted from the hospitals themselves. And then a final project I'll talk about briefly about is uh, called NSATS, the European Network for the Study of Adrenal Tumors. And if like me, you'd never heard of your adrenal gland before, the, I, I mean, I, I'm not a medic, as I say, uh, but we built a system which I guess is probably galvanized global research into the adrenal, which is a, 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 uh, right next to your, your, your kidneys, basically. But I have other projects I work on which, with defense intelligence doing computer chip design where it's, you know, we've commercialized, companies have been spun out and, and bought out, et cetera, but based upon the systems that we've built. I think, so that's kind of what I was going to talk about in the, in, in the next 40 minutes or so. So Orin is a project that I, when I came to the University of Melbourne in 2010, the university had been awarded a large grant, which was called Orin. And I build similar systems like this in the UK where I was using health data from the NHS, so the, the, the hospital systems in the UK. And I was linking that with census data and I was doing spatial analysis of that kind of data to look at, you know, people who commit suicide, are they rich, are they poor? Did they have access to parks where they lived, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd, I'd done a bunch of work previously in, in, in dealing with sensitive data and across different disciplines. So from the medical side, from the social sciences to the spatial. So it's not just a case of a, a platform for one uh, clinician, let's say. So 
I was asked by the when I when I took the position here at the university, I was told to be involved in this project and design the systems, which we did. And if I could summarize what the, what the challenges of building a, a, a platform for dealing with data in cities is integrating data or getting access to data and making it available. So you'd be amazed how many organizations, both at the local government level, at the state level, and at the federal level, and at the, in commercial, in academia, everybody has bits of data. And all of this data is uh, inconsistent incompatible and my role in this in this space was to build a system that could somehow bring it all together and so where there is no single schema there is no let's define a, a data model or there is no ontology or any none of this exists people pretend they can try and solve it but right now it doesn't exist and so we have to design a system to to tackle that the question is, what was it supposed to be used for? Well, there's a range of challenges living in cities. So you can, you know, there's children are having increasing, um, they're increasingly obese. So is that because they play computer games all the time? Is that because all the parks have now been taken away and they've been used for making houses? Is that because there's too many fast food restaurants? There's a whole range of potential answers to things like this, the growing epidemic of obesity. And that's just, I mean, you, obesity is one example. It could be, you know, depression, it could be cancer. It could be any kind of stories around what the, the, the cities in which we live. Melbourne's a really wonderful place. It's one of the most livable cities in the world, but we have a population that is growing and growing. So every year, well, pre-COVID, about 100,000 people came to live in Melbourne. And so the population is now over 5 million. And in about a few years time, 50% of the population of Australia, so Australia is very big, as you know, will live in either Melbourne or Sydney. So two cities are growing and growing and growing effectively. And yet we have a transport system that was designed 50 years ago. So it's not designed for the number of cars. So we have challenges in, you know, and these things are connected. I mean, you you know, health, you know, the, the, pet, the, the, the pollution that the cars create impacts on health so that it's these things are always interconnected the number of people living in australia is another challenge how do we provide fair access to services and uh, and and health and schools when the population is growing and growing and growing and growing so there's a and not just what how do we respond to things that are happening now how do we plan for the future there's another challenge that we face we all want cities to be happy and livable places where we can you know, feel comfortable and there's low crime and everyone's having a good quality of life. But how do you design cities that are, you know, support that? I mean, it's, it's a challenge. Australia is a very livable place, but it's also a, a place where there are, the price of property has gone crazy. So this is an example of a, sim, a little house near the city and it was falling apart. It's a very small little old Victorian house, which is you know, on a, a hundred square meters of land. And it's actually advertised for over $2 million, Australian dollars. So it's incredibly expensive to live in Australia, to buy a property. At the same time, if you wanted to live in the South of France, in the Chateau, this is, this is, these are actual, I didn't just make this scenario. This is actual legitimate sort of costs that I found. This is a Chateau in the South of France with seven bedrooms, 27 acres, swimming pool, vineyards, and it's for three quarters of a million. I mean, it's all relative. I mean, people make more money in Australia so they can afford more, but it's still, there's a crazy sort of um, things happening in the, in the housing market. And all these, as I say, all of these things are interconnected. Your quality of life is massively impacted on where you live. If you can afford to live in the nice places, you know, it's, life is great. If you can't afford and you've got a three hour commute every day to get to work because you can only live in the poorer places outside of the town, then that's going to impact you and it's going to impact on the, the, the whole of the city more generally. So what we want to be able to do is to answer these kind of very broad questions and get access to the data that is underlying them. The problem is that most of this data is locked away. It's hidden in, in government silos or government spreadsheets or, you know, industry databases and whilst you can use google i could use google to say australia and cancer the problem is i get 214 million web pages which mention that which isn't really useful it's kind of 
I want you know official statistics on cancer. So Google is amazingly good at processing and giving you access to data, but it doesn't have the definitive data from the definitive cancer agency in Australia, for example. So this is what Aurum was trying is tasked with was tasked with doing, unlocking that kind of data. Similarly, uh, Google and Google Maps, they fly over or they use street maps and they produce images of what the actual, if you type in an address, this is where you would see that address is located, et cetera. The problem is that that data is out of date. So this um, satellite image was taken where I used to live, in some part of Melbourne, but most of the houses here are, are, are completely changed. The, it was a very nice area. And we were renting there at the time, but so the builders came in, they, the, the property developers, they took all these little cottages uh, and they knocked them down and they build apartment blocks on them. And so again, the problem is not just like I'm complaining about property redevelopment. It's a case of the data that you think you're looking at at certain locations is out of date. And that's kind of a classic example of what people would typically do. They would look for the a location, they'd see it on Google Earth or Google Maps, and they, the, but the data is out of date often. So we wanted to give access to data. And then there's a whole range of tools and analytics that was required by the research community, the urban research community to make sense of all this data. And there was no single expert. So you might have people that are, you know, know everything about transport or health or crime or housing. There is no single person that knows it all. So we had to build an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary platform that allowed different experts to collaborate and work together. So that's kind of what I was tasked with doing, as well as solving the problems of all this data is locked away. So it's not just sitting on a website that we can get access to. So we had to build a system that allowed remote access to lots and lots of different types of data in different formats. And we built a system that does that effectively. So anyone in Australia can log into the system. If you're an academic, we're using um, federated authentication. So if, if you're from the University of Sydney or University of Melbourne or University of wherever, you can log in using your username and password for your own institution. Once you've logged in, you have ways to access all these kind of very heterogeneous distributed data sets from the census or from crime or from alcohol or the environment, whatever the scenario might be, we have lots and lots of data. In fact, we have about 6,000 definitive data sets from 150 government agencies at the moment. And these cross the complete spectrum of local government, state government, federal government. Australia is very complicated in this way. So you can access lots of data. We then have a whole range of tools for analyzing this data. We have over 100 tools, which we've delivered through this platform which allows people to say, look at the, you know, take say one example of, um, let's focus on crime. Where does crime take place? And how much alcohol is consumed in those areas? These are two, two different data sets. We can connect them together and then we can do analysis on them and saying, okay, if there is more crime or more, uh, then there'll be, um, it's more likely that there's more places to buy alcohol or if there's increased levels of, um, BMI and uh, the body mass index of children in schools and how many fast food restaurants are in that area or how many parks. So we have a, a system that allows many people to ask these kind of very broad questions and interconnect their research with the different data that's there. If I, I, I tried to summarize or in the actual example in one slide. So or in, it allows you to bring your own data. So we have access to as I say, several thousand data sets, but you can also import your own data. So I do work with uh, lung cancer patients as well, as well as other areas. So I've imported into this map, what you see here, the actual lung cancer data. So you can sort of see how many patients per postcode. Uh, and so we have one person or 11 people lived in this particular postcode, which is this, the center of Melbourne. So I can sort of see now I can what, create what we call a choropleth map which shows the distribution of patients. So there seems to be quite a lot of patients in this area who have lung cancer, and yet there's no one here, for example. So what that's typically what the doctors would see at the, at the hospitals, you know, patients coming from certain areas, but they don't know why. So certainly if you know if someone smokes or doesn't smoke, then that's gonna be important. But there are many other factors that can influence why someone might get lung cancer. One of them could be to do with 
uh, organizations and companies that pollute. Uh, in generally speaking, the, the quality of air in Australia is very good. You know, it's, I know there's certain parts of the world where it's not quite so good. But we, we also monitor all these companies. So this big circle here is an oil refinery. And they every year they get assessed of how much pollution they are releasing, so small particles. And the bigger the circle, the more pollution. We can also link the, the data of how many trucks and how many cars and how many, uh, you know, how many vehicles go through this area. So this, this area here, for example, is where we have the large coal fire power stations that are for, for the energy of Australia, no, for, for Melbourne. So you can sort of see there's, a, there's a, an extensive story that you can look into to say, why are people getting certain types of cancer in certain areas, which allows people to undertake research, which they would never have been able to do otherwise. So we have about 20,000 users of Orin. So it's, and given the fact that Australia is not, I mean, there's not that many urban researchers in Australia, we have a large portion of, of users. We have you know, up to, I think we've had 7,000 users in one day was our, our record. Uh, so there's lots of people using it all the time for different things. So it's kind of um, captured a large part of the, the urban research community in Aus Australia effectively. If people wanted to have access to, <clears throat> to this system from elsewhere, it's possible, but we have to set you up with an account. So anyone can log in if you're an academic, but if you're not an academic, we have to set you up with an account. So this is one project that's kind of galvanized urban research in, in Australia. I take you to another story now, which is to do with a, a different model, which is to do with type one diabetes. <coughs> so, when I, this is another project where we started and there were some researchers that came to me that were wrestling with trying to build a system that could capture information on patients with diabetes and type one diabetes in particular. And so unlike other conditions, which I'll talk about in the next example, which is to do with rare conditions, there are thousands and thousands of people with diabetes. And it's unrealistic to have a system where people's, people are entering data directly. We, can't, we have to reuse the existing data. Uh, and so this is what this project was about. How do we build a platform that allows different hospitals to, to actually feed in their own data to the system? The reality is these hospitals would never allow an incoming connection to their database. So we couldn't build a, you know, a, a service which we could talk to and it go through their firewall and access the data. In this domain, it was just not possible. So we had to come in with a, another model of doing it, which we, we, we realized. Just to give you an example of the scale, we have both adult and child, pediatric and adult centers. And there are many of these centers scattered around both um, Australia, as well as in New Zealand. So there's, and these are the major centers. These aren't like small hospitals with like five patients. These are the ones like the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne deals with several thousand patients who have type one diabetes. So they have these major centers where there's lots of patients being treated all the time. So what we wanted to do is bring, bring in a lot of this data so that the doctors could see what treatments are working best. And, you know, there are certain things that they want to measure, you know, if they're rolling out a certain treatment type. So for example, in Australia right now, it's possible to get a, a you know, historically people would either go on dialysis or have insulin injections. There is work now looking at um, supporting continuous glucose monitoring. And so, yeah, so we, we needed to have a, a, all of this data aggregated together to allow and understand that, those phenomena. Just to give you an idea of the scale, we have 21,000 or so patients in the system right now, both children and adults. And importantly, we also have 273,000 uh, visits. So. Each person will, might have, you know, 10, 12, 15 visits at a given hospital. And we can also track how the, you know, the, the way you treat a child as they're growing up to when they become an adult, the, the whole sort of lifetime of managing and living with a disease is something that we track as well. So we can actually see which interventions, if they have a certain type of treatment, younger does it impact them on their quality of life, et cetera, later. So the way we had to build this one is that we, we ended up building a system for hospitals to debug their own data. So they could upload their own data to our system 
and then we could identify a whole range of issues with it if there were any. So if this was a, a 300 kilogram baby or if it was someone who's, you know, was seven foot or, or four meters tall or, or lots of these kind of, and they're the simple examples, the more complicated ones are, you know, um, are, are supported as well, I guess, in terms of seeing how the data that we're getting, if it's within the expected ranges and if it, the combinations of data are sensible. So we have ways to, for the sites to check. They upload the data, we give them, a bunch of um, messages and warnings and errors potentially if we find no you've missed some data here and we can't do this data can't be correct etc cetera, etc cetera. they then revise their local data upload again and then if it passes all the tests then it becomes it gets ingested into the main system so effectively i think it's fair to say that every hospital we work with has a variety of issues with in terms of their data quality and so improving their data quality is a large part of this project um, once you have this red once this we have this national registry now people can use it for all kinds of research questions looking at you know um, the, the body mass index of children and the you know how they get treated and etc or looking at the the way they are how many events how many um adverse events are they having that, you know, uh, as part of their uh, living with the condition, et cetera. One interesting part of this registry is that our funders, the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation pay when not only we have a lot of data in the system, but when we have good data, as in there are many registries that I've been involved in where we've built it, but it's a very sparsely populated database. There's not many, I mean, not many people collect this, but other people collect that, et cetera. To tackle that, our funders in, required that we had a core set of data that had a very good coverage. So some of it is like 100%. So we absolutely know which center the, the patient is coming from. We, are, we always know the date of birth. We always know when they were diagnosed, et cetera. Sometimes we, went, we, we may not get all the information like whether they were hospitalized for a particular episode, et cetera. Some centers might have that, some might not have that, et cetera. But when we it's collect this data, we, we're obliged to make sure that we have a good coverage of the data. And with this, then they, the doctors can work out a whole range of, you know, looking at, you know, the guidelines that and this, you know, ideally the, the sort of the blood sugar, the HbA1c that people, are, you know, if you have diabetes, that's one of the main things you should always be controlling. Yeah, there is a national standard of you should be between seven or below seven and a half. But actually, when you start looking at it, the age distribution, there are many people who aren't, uh, you know, meeting that target. So, for a particular hospital, if they have a lot of patients that are, have a uh, high levels of patients who are missing the guidelines, what what steps can they take? And then tracking this over time, these are the sort of things that you know the the the, the diabetes doctors we work with are interested in. Similarly, looking at the different types of treatments that the patients are getting. So they can have injections or in infusions and then they're getting once or twice a day, et cetera. Looking at the patterns of treatment and then impacts on how they are dealing with the blood sugar levels is something that we, we can support right now. So it's a very rich uh, data resource that we've built and people are using it for many research questions at the moment. So there's many, many people who want to have access to extracts of the data to do analysis of uh, impacts of, you know, social economics on diabetes and, or ethnicity challenges, et cetera, et cetera. We also built mobile apps. Part of my, well, the work we do is build mobile apps where you can assess, you know, if you have a child or you have diabetes yourself, you can say, how do I compare with everyone in, in Australia in terms of my BMI or my HbA1c, my blood sugar levels, effectively. We can also do other things. I mean, just to connect it back to Orin, I can take the diabetes data from Adin and then I can import it into Orin. So I can say, you know, how does this correlate with areas where there are lots of patients with diabetes? You know, what's the average BMI level or the, how many people are obese in those areas or of you know other factors you know where are the, how many parks are in those areas how many fast food restaurants how many whatever it might be we have a whole range of other data sets we can start connecting with the diabetes data okay and my final just a little case study just to take you on a bit of a um, well of what i do uh, is in the adrenal tumor space so 
your adrenal glands are right next to your kidneys. And so they are very small glands that control hormone levels in your body. So they re re release a variety of hormones that can control you, uh, like adrenaline, for example. And so generally speaking, if you get cancer in one of these glands, it's the prognosis is not good um, because you never know you have it till it's too late. And so there are different types of cancer. I won't, I mean, adrenal cortical carcinomas and paragangliomas and all complicated sounding words. And the researchers that we work with are interested in all of these kind of different types of cancers and how do you treat them and how do you manage them? Reality is it's very poorly understood because a lot of the time the patients who have these cancers, the prognosis is, is very poor. You would not know you had a count, one of these cancer types probably until it's too late. You have slightly lower back pain, which most people would probably just ignore, or slightly eleva elevated blood pressure, hypertension, which again, people probably would not really notice. So it's only when it, the cancer metastasizes and spreads and it becomes visible uh, or you, you, you know, you're coughing blood or whatever horrible scenario it is that they realize you have a particular cancer, one of these adrenal tumors. Luckily, they are very, very rare. So in the case of a, you know, adrenal cortical carcinomas, you get maybe one or two cases for every million people. So it's, it's not a common condition at all. And so I was asked maybe eight, nine years ago, no, 10 years ago, I guess, to build a system for a bunch of doctors that could support this. We built that system in four weeks. It's basically just a database, which gives access to um, capture this information. On, on these patients. That resulted in a grant, which was successfully funded. It was the NSAC Cancer Project. And that ran for five years. There's been a follow-on grant called NSAT HT, which looks at hyper, uh, hypertension. And, and that was another European project that was funded. So there's been a, a lot of effort going into this space for some time now. And this is kind of the story around that. So I mentioned that these are very rare. So only one in a million people might get one of these cancers. And yet we have a lot of, we have nearly, it doesn't sound like a lot, but there's nearly 20,000 patients from 112 hospitals around the world. And these are coming from Russia, from South America, from Australasia, all over Europe, etc. And we also have a lot of clinical annotations. So every single patient will have if they have a, a surgery or they take chemotherapy or whatever the treatment might be, that's one data point. So we have a, 104,000 data points on these patients. So there's very rich information on them. And by having all of this information, we can now use this to recruit patients for clinical trials. So there's maybe 40, over 40 major clinical trials running right now. This is just one example where we've recruited two and a half thousand patients and it's a full four phase clinical trial which is looking at, uh, it doesn't really matter what it's looking at, but re recruiting patients to understand the, 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 the hormones and how they change at the molecular level um, as part of a, a PO yeah. study. So the system itself, the, we, we build it in such a way that not everyone shares everything. So this is an example of our record. Yeah. From a certain, I'm hearing background noise here. Sorry, but I'll, I'll carry on anyway. So I, I will carry on. Just I, I'm, I'm nearly at the end of my talk. So you sort of see that we, we have ways to say who can access this data. So only people from Europe in, in this part project can access this. We have a whole range of information, what surgery, what chemotherapy, et cetera, did these people have and when did they have it? We can track that over time. And again, it, hopefully no one ever gets one of these conditions, but you all, I always thought that if I had a certain type of cancer, there would be a, set, a standard recipe for how to, to treat me and my condition. Reality is everybody has a slightly different recipe and these re recipes are different, evolving. So some will give a certain drug some would never give that drug. Some would take an operation to remove the tumor. Some wouldn't remove it, et cetera. So there's a whole range of possible ways to manage patients uh, based upon, you know, if they are young, their body can tolerate a lot more aggressive therapies. If they're older, they maybe can't. But how do we know? The only way you know is that when you have thousands of patients and you're treating them in different ways, which the, the centers regard as the best way, 
you can start seeing the long-term survival and outcome for those patients, which one, which of these cocktails of treatments works the best for them. So we've had a lot of use of this system. It's actually being used all the time uh, by hospitals around the world. Now, as I say, they published lots of papers in the very top journals in the medical field, like the New England Journal of Medicine and Nature, et cetera. They've recently published a paper in The Lancet, maybe a couple of weeks ago, which was looking at trying to tell you which type of cancer you have just from a, a urine sample, which is kind of at the forefront of, the, of, the, of, of research in this domain. We also did some analysis of the, this is all the data from PubMed, of people who are publishing it using the data from the NSAT registry. So uh, long story short, the higher impact journal publications are increasingly based upon NSAT. And I think that's kind of key. So we have a statistical power. If you're trying to write a paper for a, a competitive journal like the New England Journal of Medicine, for argument's sake, based on five patients that came to your hospital, you won't get it published. If you publish a paper on 5,000 papers uh, on 5,000 patients, and you can see statistical significant uh, outcome, you will you might well get published. And this is kind of aggregation of the data is key. I won't really go into the back end of all of this. I mean, we have access to large scale compute facilities. I teach cloud computing and high performance computing. This is the data center at the University of Melbourne. It's locked down. It's in a physical building where uh, you only certain people are allowed in. We have ways to protect access to that infrastructure, both digitally and physically. So no you know, CCTV cameras everywhere, et cetera, et cetera. And so we're doing a, all of these systems are deployed on the cloud and we'll sit in on this infrastructure and they are managed in a, in a way that complies with all the regulations we need. So it's not just about building the technology sometimes, it's documenting how you are protecting access to that data going forward. So final conclusions, I guess I build systems that people used and I tend to grow these systems with communities. I teach cloud computing and high performance computing and things of that nature, but for the most part, people engage with me not to be educated on how to do it themselves, but actually they just pay me money to, for them, me to do it for them because they're doctors. So they are art and humanities people that have a problem. They don't want to learn about Python or XML or whatever the technology might be. So a large part of my work is, is engaging in re with researchers and building what they want. Um, I work across the an interdisciplinary space. And sometimes that can cause challenges where you have different experts with different, some, some people want the expert view of this world and some people want the really simple, give me a Google kind of interface. Where's the balancing act between that? So I tend to work with researchers who are fairly sort of um, advanced in their careers, I guess you can say. People who get the larger grants. This is kind of where I, I spend most of my time. Having said that, I also do a lot of work and you know supporting others who who are at the beginning of their careers, and that's even doing things like applying deep learning or image recognition to help a PhD student do stuff. I mean, I do my 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 scope is very broad, I guess you can say. Um, one of the challenges is that the technology is always changing, so it's you know, what I'm building now in the next year, I'm, I'm using this technology and in, in two years time, like just taking cloud computing as an example. We've been building cloud compute, computing infrastructures for several years now. We're now using container technologies like Docker. We're using Kubernetes. All of these things are evolving as we speak. And so my part of our work is to make sure that we are keeping up with the latest, greatest versions of the technologies. Uh, one of the lessons I've learned in all of this work, though, is that whilst I can build the technology, sometimes it's not always about building technology. It's dealing with the lawyers and contracts and intellectual property and all the other things that people are caring about. And I don't know what the solution is for that. All I know is I spend a, a very large amount of my time not building systems, but dealing with the process and the people and the the documentation and convincing people to provide access to their data, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that's part of the deal. It's not, not just about uh, building technology. It's about getting this, you know, if I, if I have to do certain things to unlock certain data and that's the law, I have to do that. That's kind of just part of the deal. 
All right, and I think that's the end of my talk now. I, I'm, I'm more than happy to ha answer a couple of questions if there is any. I'll just stop sharing. Thank you so much, uh, sir, for your valuable presentation. Technical participants or any other delegates can raise the questions or if you have any inputs, they can share it. Okay, that's great. If, if they want to raise the questions, they can uh, proceed with the chat box as well. Uh, one more time, and I want to uh, thank our eminent keynote speaker, Dr. Richard, sir, for giving this valuable information to all of our participants. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, no worries. I wish you very well with your conference. Thank you so much, sir. Take care. So Bye-bye now. Like, uh, thank you, sir. Bye. Next, I would like to proceed. Uh, with the session plans information. So which will be starting post lunch. So by 1, 1 15, we will start with the technical sessions now. So we have uh, two technical sessions, which is going to be conducted for this day one, in which the first session, which is going to start around 1 15 p.m. post lunch, will be with 15 presentations and the technical session two, followed by the technical session two, will be with 16 presentations. So I hope uh, you can, the, the participants and all the presenters, and all the delegates can proceed with their lunch now and we'll be back at 1.15 p.m. sharply so that we will start with our technical sessions as per the agenda. I request everyone to proceed with their lunch and we will be back exactly at 1.15 p.m. Thank you so much.
thank you all welcome back to the respective conference i hope everyone had their lunch welcome back to our conference just day one and now we will proceed with the technical sessions part prior to that i would like to introduce our technical session one session chairs who is miss dr tc subalakshmi who is a professor in it executive at, at, at fxp which is francis xavier engineering college and professor d bhupesh kumar faculty at csc from arba mins university Heartily welcome to both of your uh, session chairs, ma'am, Subalak Sunna and Bhuvesh Kumar. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. So, would you like to uh, share any inputs uh, regarding the session, ma'am, or shall we proceed? Uh, good afternoon, sir. I am Fatima here. Sir, let me introduce the resource person. Yes, yes please. So good afternoon to everyone present here. Welcome you back for the technical session one. Technical session one is session by chairperson Dr. P. C. Subhulakshmi, ma'am, professor, Department of Information Technology. She has around eighteen years of teaching experience. She did her doctorate degree in visual sensor networks and visual data processing in the year twenty twenty, and she did his master degree in. Tiaraja College of Engineering and Bachelor Degree in Tamil Nadu College of Engineering, Coimbatore. She has published her research findings in Scopus and uh, High Impact SEA Index Journal. She also published a patent in Australia, in Australian patent, and uh, she has did certification with Oracle and uh, SQ, Oracle SQL and Java certifications. And uh, she is a strong educational professional with a passion towards imparting skills. So welcome, ma'am, for the session, technical session one. Thank you, ma'am. It's my pleasure to join this session, ma'am. Uh, next, uh, next session chair is Professor Dr. Bhupesh Kumar, faculty, CSE department from Arba Minch University. Let me introduce the uh, session chair person details and. Uh, Dr. Bhupesh Kumar Singh is a professor in the Faculty of Computing and Software Engineering at the University of Arba Minch University, Ethiopia. He received his PhD degree in Computer Science from Birla Institute of Technology, Ranchi, in the year 2013. And his research area is designing agent and debugger for complex sketch recognition. He also holds a bachelor degree in computer science engineering from government college of engineering tirunal veli he is having a rich experience of teaching and research along with academic administration he is a member of association for the advancement of artificial intelligence and a board member for several universities most of his research centers were around uh, sketch recognition and intelligence skill systems hepatics and uh, human computer interaction he also guided several students at the master and doctorate level for their research. His research focuses on he focuses on a significant amount of his efforts on improving the variety of uh, variety of field in computer science. Welcome, you sir. Welcome. I welcome both the session chairs, Bhupesh Kumar sir and Subhalakshmi ma'am. And thank you ma'am for your valuable uh, introduction about both the session chairs. So shall we proceed with the uh, session plan? Yes sir. We'll proceed. Thank you so much. So, uh, thank you. No way. Yes sir. Thank you so much. So I request everyone to be uh, keep under mute so that our technical sessions will be started now. And with this, we will start with the first presentation, who is by Mr. Vinay Kumar. And prior to that, I would like to tell uh, all this session for to all the session uh, participants, the time is exactly for 10 minutes. So I request them to uh, make their presentations crisp and clear. 
So 10 minutes for the presentation and five minutes for the session chairs inputs or suggestions. So we'll start, proceed with the first, who is Mr. Vinay Kumar and co-author is Jyoti Agarwal, going to present on RTC drone implementation of intelligent autonomous patrolling using round the clock drone. So Vijay Kumar. So Vijay Kumar or Jyoti Agarwal. Any one of the persons are available? Mr. Vijay Kumar or Jyoti Agarwal? Okay. So I would like to go with the next presenter. Once if they join, we will be back with the presenters. So the next presenter is Mr. Ganesh. Yenurka and the co author is Manchu Dehankar on employee payslip application. Mr. Ganesh or Himanshu. Any of the persons are available? Yeah, Himanshu already joined Sriniket. They will yes. start the presentation. Okay. Uh, Mr. Himanshu, can you please respond? Himanshu or Ganesh Yenukar. So we are presenting just a second. We're talking to Mr. Himanshu or Ganesh. I know who I'm talking to. Excuse me, sir. Please tell me, ma'am. Uh, so we are presenting just a second. Yes, ma'am. Uh, are you Jyoti Agarwal? No, sir. I'm Sakshi Pindam from group of Himanshu Dehankar. Okay. Oh, please proceed. Yes. Sakshi? Yes, sir. Please start presenting, ma'am. We cannot waste the time. We are running out of time. Kindly proceed. Yes, sir. Just a second, sir. Kind, kindly share the screen and proceed. Um, excuse me, sir. Am I talking to Mr. Himanshu? Uh, yes, sir. We are actually facing some uh, technical issue. We are Request not able everyone to be uh, with their network have issues. A Zoom client installed. Yes, I understood, Mr. Himanshu. But, uh, I request everyone to please be particular with their network uh, because session time is only 10 minutes. So request them to make a try before connecting. So, Mr. Himanshu, can you proceed now? Can you present the screen? No, sir. I'm not able to join the meeting from laptop because my uh, PPT is in my laptop. Okay, then. Uh, please do one thing. So, sir, kindly correct the uh, resolve, resolve the issues from your side. And yeah, yes, sure, sir. Contact. By the time you can start another uh, Yes, I, I'll proceed with the next participant. You, once your issue is resolved, you can come back. Yes, sir. So, I would like Thank to you call much. the next participant, Mr. Kartikeyan J. And the co-author is Dr. C. Jyoti Venkateshwan on image mining hybrid algorithms on classifications of CT scan brain tumor images. Can I talk to uh, Mr. Kartikeyan or T. C. Jyoti? Kartikeyan Ji, C. Jyoti Venkateshwar. Any of the participants are available?
Mr. Karthike. Sir, I think the um, serial number 13, Pucha Agarwal is online here. We can ask them to present, sir. So for the technical session one, we have totally 15 papers. Yes. So I think Pucha Agarwal is online here. Understood, ma'am, but we cannot we can ask directly her. directly to the 13th question. Um, as for the agenda, okay. we can proceed. We cannot directly skip to the 13th question. I'm sorry. Uh, we will call the rest okay, of the sir. persons. Let, let her wait. So once the okay, first sir. persons are not arriving, then we can go back. With yes. Okay. okay. So we'd like to call Mr. Karthikein, J and C, Jyoti, Venkateshwar. One more time to or the first participant, Mr. Vinay Kumar or Jyoti Agarwal, any of the participants are available. I would like to call the next participant, Mr. Kamal Kumar and Amritpal Singh on a topic of a comprehensive survey on learning models used in sentiment analysis. It seems Mr. Karthikeyan is available now. Mr. Karthikeyan? Yeah, now only he joined uh, Mr. Srinikin. Yes, we can yes, go ahead. I have now. seen that. I have seen that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Karthikeyan, I request you to unmute. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, very good afternoon, Karthikeyan. Are we ready to present the your presentation? Yes, sir. Ready, sir. Yes. Kindly share the screen and your time is 10 minutes. You can proceed. Okay, sir. Thank you. Very good afternoon, Shual. This is Karthik again. My paper title is Image Mining Hybrid Algorithms on Classifications of CT Scan Brain Tumor Images. Abstract on the paper is for reduction of brain tumor, first we have to read the CT scan image of brain and the pre process of the image. Then we have they can classify the various image mining hybrid algorithms to identify the brain tumor. This image mining classification hybrid algorithms include extracting futures done by K nearest neighbor, KNN classifier that supplies all future vectors and classifies the generate. New features depends on the distance function, then extract the futures from finding database. To generate future vectors using the Navy-Bayesian classifier and CT scan brain tumor image classification done by SVM that is support vector machine classifier. The CT scan brain images are classified by Benin or malignant trait, which, which is taken by TCIA medical image repository. The proposed mine, image mining hybrid algorithm technique is implemented using the Python software. The general parameters of the image like entropy, mean, variance, standard deviation, contrast, correlation, smoothness, and in coefficient of contrast and root mean square error. 
This analysis is based on the extracted future values and classified using image mining performance by minimizing the root mean square error and increasing the accuracy. Next introduction. The process of computer tomography CT scan medical image is to generate 3D image of all internal parts of object from single axis rotation of X-ray 2D images. Abnormal or uncontrolled, uncontrolled growth of cells can cause the brain tumor. There exist in different categories or grades of brain tumor. The abnormal type of brain tumor may categorize into cancerous and non-cancerous that is benign or malignant type of tumor. The primary brain tumors are called as brain tripe and in secondary brain tumor or metastatic brain tumor called as the malignant brain tumor. The image mining supports the reduction of brain tumor CT scan images with adequate information. The CT scan brain tumor image is suitable procedure for full information of brain and it can be simply find out the area of tumor region. The classification of CT scan brain tumor images with the algorithms like KNN classifier, Navisian classifier and SVM classifier to detect the brain tumor. Uh, next, move on to proposed methodology. So in this proposed research paper, the systematic user-friendly approach of CT scan brain image segmentation, a reduction of brain tumor, and it can be computed using hybrid classification algorithm. But uh, the existing methodology, the CT scan brain tumor images are processed by histogram analysis and pre-processing stage done by image denicing algorithm. After pre-processing, the segmentation done by can is reduction. And in mining case, the association rule mining have been constructed from stored future vectors. Instead of association rule mining, here, I'm using the classification algorithm for better segmentation. So in this diagram shows and block diagram of each process of proposed methodology, the CT scan brain tumor images are downloaded from the cancer imaging archive, TCIA repository, which are present in DICOM format. Using NBIA data retriever, the Python software, and in medical data images are converted into image formats. In the pre-processing of an image is to segmented and in edge detecting of an image using canny edge detection. After pre-processing of image, future extraction is done by using the gray level co-occurrence matrix, that is CLCM future. And then the classification algorithm like KNN classifier, SVM classifier, and ABSM classifier are applied to the stored future vector, extracted vectors. So these extractions of images are compared and classified as normal brain image as well as the abnormal brain image. In case of abnormality, at first the images are further classified as brain tumor, that is begin brain tumor and malignant brain tumor. Next is CT scan brain image. So image mining classification technique are analyzed using TCIA image repository, which are retrieved from NBIA data retriever. It consists of 15 modalities, namely normal, benign, and malignant. For patients with brain tumor, physical symptoms vary from patient to patient. CT scans of patients are more reliable than physical symptoms. Pre-processing of image. The image pre-processing steps helps to improve the quality of an image. In image mining, the data cleaning process involved in pre-processing of image. In the pre-processing of image, is segmented and in edge detecting of an image using canny edge detection. And future extraction, the gray level co-occurrence matrix GLCM texture feature are widely used in image classification problem. GLCM represents the second order statistical information of gray level between the neighboring pixels in an image. Using GLCM, the quality can be increased by future extraction. K nearest paper. So the distance functions or similarity measure is based on the new cases or available cases of all classifications are stored by simple KNN algorithm. The distance metric function is calculated by KNN amongst the most classes of case as assigned by neighbors of the classified case. The nearest neighbor of class is simply assigned to the case if k is equal to one. So Euclidean distance, Manhattan distance, and Minkowski distance of all three distance measures are noticed by distance function, which is valid for continuous variable only. And Navisian classifier, the base theorem with individuality of statements of predictors is done by Navisian classifier. A very large data sets are used for a Navisian classification model of particular data is easy to develop with the lack of complicated parameter of iterative estimation. So let us consider the Navisian classifier is the effect of predictor value and a particular class C is liberated to the other predictor value. So this is termed as conditional independence. And next SVM classifier, a supervised learning algorithm for classification is support vector machine. The SVM classifier based on classifications of high accurate result, but the time of planning data is extremely slow. So there are two categories of linear and nonlinear SVM. So linear SVM is termed when training data are linearly separable, and nonlinear SVM are the classifications of technique training data are sequentially non-separable. 
So this figure shows the results. So a computer aided system of classifications can be used in the Python software. After analyzing the data set converted into image format, the data is applied to proposed hybrid algorithm, which can be classified either normal brain image or abnormal brain image. When the abnormal brain image is considered as the brain tumor, can be detected either beginning tumor or malignant tumor. In conclusion. So classifications of CT scan brain tumor images are detected using the proposed hybrid mining algorithm to avoiding human error and labeling manual process can reduce the automatic brain tumor process. And the classifications of hybrid algorithm like the combination of KNN classifier, SPM classifier and ABCN classifier, the GLCM extracted features are used and those results are compared and diagnosis the results of normal image, benign image and in malignant image. Here I list out the different references which I followed. Thank you. So much, Mr. Karthikeyan. Yes, sir. Session chairs can proceed with any queries. Uh, thank you, Karthikeyan. It's a nice presentation. You have concluded the concepts in a very decent manner and uh, within the uh, provided time slot. Uh, I have few doubts uh, regarding your data set. Uh, can you know me the size of your data set? What is the size of your data set? What is the size of your data set? Yeah, you did not mention about the size of data set. Yes, sir. PCI, yes, sir. That is a... No, what is the size? What is the volume of the data set? How much you took for the training and how much you took for the yes, testing? Yes, sir. Actually, I taken the 15 data sets, sir. Hello? Actually, I take 15 data sets, sir. No, 15 is the number of the data, 15 numbers of data sets? Or 15 features uh, you have taken? Sorry, sorry, sorry. 15 images. 15 images I taken, sir, from the data sets. So, uh, can, uh, can you tell me that uh, by this uh, very less, uh, I think it's a very less number of images for the training and testing in the case of uh, machine learning concept or the data mining concept because it required a huge amount of data because only the 15 number of data is uh, quite less what I feel it. Yes, sir. Actually, the usual volumes of data are there, but actually, I selected only 15 data. Uh, whether the 15 data is having the uh, accurate results given in my, uh, my research. That's why I taken 15 only, sir. And uh, how do you call it? Uh, call your algorithm as a hybrid algorithm? Because these algorithms are the already uh, uh, old algorithm. There is nothing new in this algorithm. So how can you call your algorithm as a hybrid algorithm? Uh, sir, actually, hybrid algorithm, uh, I, I termed the... Uh, because the K nearest neighbor and neighbor classifier, SPM classifier are different classification methods. So each and individual classifiers are having their different classification methods. So that's why I, I combined to perform both these uh, three classifier, classifier to perform the hybrid algorithms. So it, it may so, take... Uh, so your machine is using the uh, three, three classifiers at the same time? Ah, yes, sir. Just comparing three classifiers to the no, same. No, you are thing. comparing. Uh, comparing cannot be an algorithm. No? Comparing means what? You are comparing with one algorithm with another algorithm. That means the performance comparison is done. But the algorithm is same. The KNN is there only and the uh, other algorithms are also there only. So uh, how your algorithm will be a hybrid algorithm? Because you are not proposing any particular algorithm which is hybrid, what I feel. Okay, sir. I'll check, sir. Okay. And uh, one more thing. Uh, when you selected this uh, Kelly as detection method or the gray level matrix score, uh, G, uh, G, uh, sorry, uh, what do you call it? GLCM. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, did you check the complexity in these cases? Because I feel in the case of Kelly as detection method, the complexity will be more. Yes, sir. I just uh, performing the performance based sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy results only I taken, sir. No, accuracy will be only based on the uh, pre-processing and the, uh, what do you call it, after the pre-processing, whatever the method you have taken, I agree to you. But uh, what I feel is, if you use some other method better than Kani, uh, Kani is there, why don't you take that one? Because whenever you are selecting a particular uh, algorithm for the pre-processing, you must have to answer that means why you have selected this one, because that should be very clear. Okay, sir. In future, I will check the kernel function. Yeah, please. please take this points. Please take this okay. points. It can improve your quality of the paper and the research in the future. Thank you okay. very much. Thank, thank you very much. You. Nice thank presentation. You. Thank you, Mr. Kartikeyan, and thank you, sir, for your valuable inputs. The next presenter is Mr. Kamal Kumar and co-author Amritpal, Amritpal Singh on a comprehensive survey on learning models used in sentiment analysis. Mr. Kamal Kumar. or complete pulse.
सर हेलो सर आई विनय प्रताप सिंह एक्चुअली सर माय वाज फर्स्ट प्रेजेंटेशन बट आई थिंक आई हैव व्हेन आई हैव जॉइंड इट वाज गोइंग ऑन तो व्हेन आई हैव टू गिव प्रेजेंटेशन सो विनय कुमार यस सर यस इफ यू आर रेडी प्रेजेंट यू कैन प्रोसीड ओके Can you share the screen, Mr. Vinay Kumar? And your time is exactly ten minutes. So uh, now it's mine, sir. I can present. Sir, me, Mr. Vinay. Can you share the screen, Mr. Vinay? Okay, okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Vinay. Yeah, yeah, sir. I am presenting, sir. Sir, just give me one minute. Sir, I am sharing. Yes, yes. Uh, I am getting some error in sharing. So can I uh, present next? Just after next, I will fix it. Just make sure. Ha, sure, sir. Sir, sir, sir. Present later. Ha, like no, sir. Just next. Sir, sir, just next. After next, uh, one after. Because I am facing some issue in okay, sharing okay. my okay, screen. Okay, Mr. Yeah. Rakumar. Okay. No yeah. problem. You make it clear, and I'll call you the next presenter. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sir. Uh, I would like to call one more time the Kamal Kumar and Amrit Pal Singh. Any of the participants are available? Amal Kumar or Amritpal Singh or their team. Okay. We we'll go with the next presenter. Is with Mr. Ganesh Sherkar and Devashish Nagpure on the topic. Detection in Twitter dataset using Python. Mr. Ganesh Yerukar or Devashish. So Devashish Nagpure, I request you to unmute and proceed. So Devash is not correct. Can you hear me, Mr. Devash is not correct? Yes, sir. Can you please start sharing the screen present? Yes, sir. Sir, am I audible clearly? Yes, you are audible.
sir is screen visible yes it's visible your time is exactly 10 minutes kindly proceed yes, sir sir our uh, project name is topic detection in twitter dataset using python uh, we are four members including me uh, uh, there is krishna marathi vrushali vidya and gaurav chaudhary our guide name is uh, professor ganesh anurkar so uh, as i am starting with the project so uh, our uh, main aim in this project is to uh, detect uh, topics in twitter dataset using uh, latin dirichlet uh, al algorithm which is a topic model algorithm and uh, we are uh, finding uh, in, uh, in topics in twitter dataset so nowadays twitter is a, a popular social media which is a abundant source of lot of information and from this data we can find uh, much more uh, trending topics or uh, any kind of information so using uh, algorithm uh, uh, many topics from twitter data set can be find out Uh, Twitter is a uh, uh, worldwide social media platform and used by many users. Uh, so, uh, with this much information, uh, many topics from this uh, data set can be detected and they can be used for uh, uh, at business level, such as in marketing. Topic detection is a uh, technique. Uh, which uh, different topics from uh, bigger data sets and uh, python provides uh, uh, in a gensim library in which uh, ld algorithm is uh, there and this ld algorithm is a topic model modeling algorithm and it provides uh, topics in big data sets uh, so uh, in normal terms uh, input text in terms of uh, twitter data set is, uh, twitter data set is given uh, data pre processing techniques such as stemming tokenization are applied and uh, using uh, topic modeling methods such as here uh, latent dirichlet algorithm uh, different topics are created also uh, in final uh, out uh, in final stage uh, so sample output is like this different words are uh, created in dictionary and we can infer from the uh, from the from these words that uh, uh, to which topic these words belong. These are the research stages of our project. Uh, in preparation phase, all the uh, necessary Python libraries are imported. Then, uh, using Twitter API object uh, data query is carried out, and uh, through Twitter API object. Uh, last 2000 feeds of end user can be downloaded for data processing and after that stemming and tokenization is applied uh, url and uh, unwanted uh, words uh, and punctuations are removed then these uh, remaining uh, data is uh, loaded into python dictionary and latin digital algor allocation algorithm is applied then it produces required topics uh, this is concept of similarity of text and topics Uh, this is graphical uh, this is visual uh, uh, graphical visual of our project uh, the bubble shown are uh, show, bubble shown are uh, indicating different topics uh, some bubbles are uh, uh, intersecting each other uh, that means uh, they have some common uh, common words to them and uh, red portion is uh, showing some words and this Red bar indicates that uh, how much uh, weightage is given to, uh, to for that word to given topic. Uh, in final output, topics uh, uh, are given with uh, indexes uh, with their words, and words are given uh, different weights. Uh, the weights is uh, the weight shows that uh, how how uh, important a given word is to given topic. Uh, in future, uh, 
now your main problem is uh, many topics have same words so uh, it get uh, it gets difficult to tell uh, we, uh, to which topic some words belong so uh, in future uh, it can be uh, if there are multiple words contributing to the same topic then uh, we can uh, improve that so uh, any questions So much for your presentation. So much as can proceed with the presentation. Sorry, sir. Yes, uh, Karthik. Uh, nice to interact with you and see you doing something good. Um, I have a small doubt that how you are going to connect this tutor for the marketing. That I want to know. Uh, sir, uh, nowadays AI is using uh, through AI. Uh, 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 if uh, someone uh, uh, surf for internet or use uh, any social media platform, uh, then uh, the uh, post uh, which he sees or the site uh, through which he goes, uh, AI algorithm. They... And then you could have selected uh, Facebook. That could be better than uh, this tutor for the marketing purpose. If you are highlighting your projects towards the marketing. it can uh, target uh, audience from uh, trending topics okay okay no problem thank you thank you so much yeah sir, next sir please mr uh, request request the person to share sharing Uh, and book uh, mr vinay kumar is ready to present yes sir yes sir yes sir uh, good morning good afternoon all of you uh, my name is uh, vinay pratap singh and uh, my topic is uh, is rtc drone implementation of intelligence autonomous patrolling using round the clock drones so uh, we are three uh, me and jyoti agrawal and manoj kumar and now uh, i would like to tell some uh, into little bit introduction so me as a vinay patap singh and i am a student of computer science uh, from amity university noida i have completed my btech from aktu in 2019 and uh, also completed diploma in engineering from up bt in 2016 my research interests in including internet of things machine learning image processing data science new, uh, natural language processing And Jyoti Agrawal obtained her PhD from Computer Science uh, uh, in uh, Amity University, Noida. She is gold medalist in MTech CSC and completed her B Tech in 2010 from UPTU. She is currently working as an assistant manager in Amity University, Noida, since 2011, and also has six months of teaching experience in Amity University, Tennessee. She has published many research papers in reputed journal and conference. She is a member of International Association of Engineers. Uh, her current research interests including software engineering, data mining, and machine learning. And third, in Manoj Kumar, obtained his PhD from computers uh, in computer science from uh, Norse University, uh, Gurugram. He obtained a MSc in Information Security uh, degree from IIT Dubai. Uh, Mr. Uh, Kumar has nine plus five years experience in research and academics. He published over forty three publications in reputed journal and conference. Presented Mr. Kumar is working on the post of assistant professor S G in University of Petroleum and Energy Studies, Dehradun. He is a member of various professional bodies and reviews from the reputed international journal. His current research is interested including digital. forensic information security image processing network internet of things and uh, back back blatch and uh, technology so uh, now uh, i will come uh, my topic so nowadays we know that drones are usually in uh, in our daily life for security purpose and forming uh, for in forming area and video shooting in uh, movies industry and products delivery 
for e commercial so drones are working on the principle of uh, uh, newton's third law of the motion that is also known as uh, action and reaction so mostly used in uh, airlines law of the motion is also known as uh, sorry uh, in uh, photographical or films express shipping gathering information geographical mapping of the location so those are uh, also used for patrolling by, uh, by the government police so they are monitoring the particular area by the drone's camera for the work here is a need to a skilled drone driver so for flying and monitoring we are going to present a model of drone which is automatically flying around particular area in fixed timing and automatically detect the objects animals humans and their activity and it will detect fire violence if any chemical activity are detected by the drone camera or drone then it directly reported to the in device in this model we used to com satellite communication for the controlling drone and information transmission internet of things and machine learning computer vision model from crime detection so first uh, its rtc drone is a special types of drone which work on the basis of previously set location those drones revolve around the particular area as fixed before and called and in types of information and helping as needed by the user and programmed before and send the whole information to the ground control center from where the authorities extract the information and take required action so these drone work with the help of satellite so it can be used anywhere without depending on the location of the ground control station these drone are useful for authorities like defense police security agents in this model we identify the fire vehicles and their speed lights gun detection means the, uh, like we know that nowadays we are uh many many we are facing in many types of uh, crimes so police guys are different that uh, so uh, it's my, my model is be having like it's it will be behaving like a police so uh, it's artificial police so uh, it's round per clock drones flying around given by time fixed area using uh, google map so what we we, ha we will have just we will have Uh, select the one area by google map and after that drones are flying part, uh, that selected area time to time like we have to fix what time it's what time it what delay time for the flying so after selecting these all that drones are flying uh, every suppose i we will fix uh, like 10 after 10 minute gap 10 minute so every 10 minute a uh, flying drone will be fly, flying in that particular area and detect every crimes if like nowadays it's pandemic time we can also uh, we can also detect the crowd if like the people are gathering uh, like 10 20 people are gathering uh, at a pro, uh, at any location it will inform the uh, ground level location so uh, we can say ki we we can say that my drone will be uh, can be uh, with the uh, my drone uh, this drone can be maintain the social distancing also so this is my uh, communication model uh, this is my model so what we we will doing here see just we know that there are the uh, there are lots of drone in the market so uh, we can use that uh, and uh, we have to uh, add more things like first uh, blos link with the satellite we have to connect drone to the satellite by blos link and after that drone has some uh, device some uh, other uh, devices like compass gps camera raspberry pi 4 and etc basically raspberry pi 4 is the microcontroller microprocessor we know that uh, then by the raspberry pi by the raspberry pi 4 we will uh, include our model detection model like we will we, uh, for the detection of crime we are using here computer vision so computer vision algorithm will run in raspberry pi 4 and camera will be attached uh, with the raspberry pi 4 and with the camera we uh, it uh, crime will be detected 
so if any crime will be detected it will uh, inform to the ground control station so uh, these are this is my model actually so how to select the uh, map map plan so here you can see first what we will have to do we will have to select the particular area as like that i have selected here sector 125 so it's the uh, noida location if i will select sector 125 location drone will fly automatically in this particular area only and some steps here for the uh, map planning so we will have to go first google map so uh, there we have to follow these all the steps for the uh, draw the map and we have here some uh, detection model with the uh, so what we will have we have raspberry pi in raspberry pi we have to connect the camera module and camera will be streaming video video will, uh, camera will be take the video and after that we have to separate the frame and fill instruction then what in between we have in between uh, that uh, our uh, cv our cv2 will be uh, two will be detected the uh, all different types of uh, crime and after that came uh, we are using k means caustic uh, algorithm it will detect the which type of crime uh, is happening there so after that crime will be analysis and if uh, crime will be analysis by drone if any if after that it if any crime is found they will uh, uh, gps module will detect the location after that lo location a uh, display message will be uh, presented in the ground control uh, Yeah, yeah, sir. I am here. Yes, you can proceed. Yeah, sir. Sir, uh, I think I am facing some uh, my in my laptop hanging problem. So uh, next, there is one page. There is only one page. so i want to in there is one only one page only conclusion it's not uh, okay fine application so next will be application so by this model it can detect gun also like it can detect gun by the uh, computer vision so there so there are lots of research and like uh, gun detection by gun detection by uh, computer vision so uh, researchers presented uh, uh, detection model with computer vision so i uh, we can use this uh, we can use different different whatever whatever we can use on uh, we can use in our raspberry pi and after that uh, it will detect uh, gun also and it will detect vehicle speed because model uh, detect vehicle speed by computer vision so we can use that model on is here so it is also a detecting crowd crowd and uh, of uh, and uh, it will detect the accident case also and after that this model is no need to uh, a skilled driver means no need to driver for the flying it will automatically flying on the round of the particular area which is given by control uh, station it is detecting crime scenes and crime activity automatically so my conclusion in this work rtc drone uh, this helps detect any types of crimes which we, which we uh, we will fix the uh, in my drone by resolving around the particular area as previously thought uh, the process these drones is earlier for the authorities uh, authorities action is Drones or help the at least to estimate that causes due to the crime or due to the accident cases, and thus the take proper uh, pre precautions. Take proper precautions so that its accident is not spreaded further. Since these drone work and communication with the help of satellites, so these drones can be used 
at any times and it's any places without depending on the location of the ground control centers these type of drone are very much useful for the armies police security agencies and help them to work more efficiently so uh, these are some references uh, for the uh, crime detection uh, with C a computer vision so which i which i used so thank you it, it thank you. have you any question please ask thank you so much mr so vinay yes. question test yes. question three please uh, <clears throat> thank you mr vinay uh, yes. you have done something good uh, in, innovative and uh, i appreciate being a graduate student you have moved towards this direction uh, I just want to ask you one question that uh, while calculating the weight of the drone, what are the parameters you have considered while considering? Because when you are sir, designing a drone, okay, the okay. weight is one of the most important parameters. Sir, what we will have, sir, yeah. just normally we can take, in, there are lots of drone in the market. And just we are considering microcontroller. So, so microcontroller weight uh, maybe can be 100 grams or 50 grams maximum with camera and uh, uh, Raspberry Pi 4. It just is 100, mean, uh, like uh, minimum, maximum 100 grams. So, no, sir, no need to uh, take care of uh, drone weights, I think. So, oh, uh, how much thrust is required? So, how? how uh, how much thrust is required to uplift the drone in if your total weight is 100 grams? Because you need oh, to apply uh, the, sir, yeah, uplift your drone. Yeah. Sir, because drone, it's, it's any normal drones you can take, it's just 100 grams weight. Uh, uh, like drones can easily carry 100 grams. So that's why I'm I, saying you no need to uh, no, no, worry I about. I got your point. I got your point. But when you are doing a project at that time, you yeah. need to know the how because it is uplifted from the ground. So uplifting it requires a thrust. How much thrust is required for the hundred grams? My question is that, as you mentioned that you are using the Newton's third law. Sir, I just tell you it's uh, working on Newton's third law. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. One more uh, question. One more yes. question. Yeah. Uh, in the last uh, this one uh, diagrammatic rep representation of your project, you have mentioned activity analysis. Yes. Yeah, so, so uh, which algorithm you are using for this one? Sir, uh, uh, as I told you, ki, uh, for activity analysis, uh, analyze we are using computer vision. So uh, in com no, computer vision is not an algorithm. Computer it, vision is a. Yeah. I, I said, know the name of the algorithm. Modern. Sir, for the categorization, we are uh, we are using K means clustering algorithm in machine. I learning. got your point. Uh, my question is activity analysis. Yeah, sir. Activity analysis, sir. Uh, I, as I told, sir, I am telling you this this only. Ki, uh, for activity analy analysis, we are using just uh, we just for the uh, detection of the. Uh, activity we are using computer vision but for the classification of the types of okay. activity we are using k means clustering algorithm okay okay thank you yes. thank you yes sir yeah, one thank question you, sir. from my side uh, uh, sir uh, vinay yes sir uh, this is yes, Kalashmi here yes ma'am yes you mentioned that uh, when we consider uh, uh, the weight of the drone you just mentioned only your camera and uh, uh, your raspberry pi uh, uh, take this uh, taken into account, but yes. I would like to say I would like to insist upon that the frame, uh, the quadcopters frame. When you say drone, uh, your frame will be there, right? So the material yes. which you're using for the quadcopter frame uh, gives more uh, also... gives more sense to the weight of the drone. I think. Okay, uh, what yeah. what kind of a frame do you think you have suggested for your okay. drone? Okay, okay, ma'am. We, we we know that in the market there are camera for the. Uh, so in movie area for the shooting, so it's already uh, they are using uh, high quality camera which is taking like a th 30 uh, second per uh, 30 second per frame. So we can use uh, we will use that camera. So its camera resolution is very high. So we can detect for uh, detect from the very long distance. So because uh, this drone is flying for uh, like from very uh, long distance from very far from the ground to the uh, flying distance. 
so uh, we will use high quality camera and we know that ki that uh, in in movie industry they are using high quality camera for the detect uh, for the shooting so we will use that we are just adding uh, 100 grams on that so we know that ki th- that camera is th- uh, that camera is also flying very very yeah. well yeah. we know so the camera very well of course uh, give you uh, it's going to be lightweight Uh, yeah, i'm not ma- talking about the camera which is going to uh, uh, impart the weight of the uh, drone uh, the frame which you are using for the quadcopter that is your drone ma'am minimum 30 minimum uh, minimum 30 uh, uh, second can second you please what can you please suggest what kind of a frame that you can use for this drone a frame that frame camera uh, ma'am you are you asking about uh, uh, camera or drone frame Sorry, uh, let drone, me clear. Drone, your drone frame, your drone frame. Ma'am, four, four quad car. Four quad car. It will be fine. Huh? It will be fine, ma'am. Four. Because ma'am, in movie area also they are using a uh, four. But we are not going to use very heavy camera. We are going to use very very good resolution camera. So we can use a uh, four quad car, ma'am. It will be fine. Definitely. Yes. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. So. Uh, it, Thank you so much, Mr. Munir. Okay, okay, sir. Thank you. I'd like to call the next participant, uh, Mr. Vishal Ramani, with Anand Gurdwale on a novel approach towards video ranking using intent and relevance feedback. Vishal Ramani, Anand Gurdwale. Hello. Yes. We start sharing this. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Uh, is this being visible sir yes it's it's going to be uh, stopped so if there is an error issue it's still yes now it is shared the time is exactly 10 minutes please proceed sir uh, sir mr vishal Yes, I have clicked on the present. Uh, Click on uh, share and uh, present. Uh, the title screen is visible. Hello. Yes. Good start, sir. Uh, this is my first okay. yes. okay. uh, uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my paper is titled "A Novel Approach Towards Video Ranking Using uh, Intent and uh, Relevance Feedback." Uh, about about me, uh, my full name is Vishal Ramani. I am currently pursuing my master's in technology in computer engineering in Sardar Patel Institute of Technology, Mumbai. I did my postgraduate diploma in advanced computing from SIDAC and BTEC in electronics and telecommunications. My research interests lie in image and video analysis, system design, digital systems, machine learning, and NLP. So, Vishal, I'm going to ask for a bit of you. On your background, there is a lot of noise. I request you to. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Is it fine? Yes, no, it's clear. Okay. So I call that. Uh, there is some construction uh, as well. Uh, so um, yeah, introduction uh, to the topic. Now we know that internet has transformed into a platform for learning from past few years, and even more so in uh, this COVID period. There is a massive uh, development in. Um, uh, there is a major development in massive open online courses, open uh, online learning portals, and lecture. Even the lecture videos are being hosted in uh, video platforms such as YouTube. So, searching for a topic uh, uh, in, on the internet and these video platforms have become a day-to-day daily task in our lives. However, this uh, search experience uh, is not always that fluid because we often find ourselves going through each and every search result. one by one just to really find what we were looking for so uh, uh, there is uh, this issue uh, uh, the, the issue is that these uh, video platforms let's say for example youtube uh, 
majorly uh, heavily depend on uh, video description and user ratings as a direct criteria in their video ranking and indexing uh, methodologies. So uh, that results in a less relevant video, lesser relevant videos as per the search query to be ranked higher than the others. This is what we were calling uh, as search intention and relevance gap. The gap between what user was intending to look for and uh, what actually uh, he was presented with and the relevance of that uh, result. So this is what the gap that we are calling. And uh, this is where we uh, have uh, trying to, this issue is where we are trying to address in our paper. We have uh, proposed a methodology called IRF, Intent and Relevance Feedback Methodology to improve the rank of the relevant videos. And we emphasize uh, on using unexplored video aspects such as uh, user ratings, video, uh, user comments, and videos content to determine uh, video relevance and then use it into video ranking and index calculation. So let's have a look at the uh, system design for this uh, setup. Uh, our system uh, is mainly divided into three basic stages, three main stages, which is first stage being text feature extraction stage. For the scope of this project and uh, uh, the paper, uh, we are focusing on lecture videos and uh, instructional videos where uh, video contains some information in textual format as well to derive some cue from it. So that's our first stage is uh, text feature extraction stage. The second stage would be intent and relevance feedback system where we have used some natural language processing process to uh, derive the relationship. And finally, we will be doing index calculation for that particular video. So let's uh, go through the flow of the system one by one. Uh, sorry. So once we have a user search query, it will be fired on YouTube data API, which will then fetch us uh, with a list of videos for, uh, for the respective query. And from those list of videos, we will uh, pick one video one by one, and we will uh, feed it to the further processing. So once we have picked a video, we uh, form a video stream using Pappy uh, Python library. And once video stream is formed, we process it using OpenCV uh, frame by frame and feed it to the text detection and definition model called EasyOCR, which is an open source model uh, for the text detection and recognition. So once the text has been localized and uh, uh, recognized, we will then extract the textual content of the video into a corpus, uh, uh, into a total uh, corpus. For uh, here, are some of the frames that were uh, used uh, that were uh, done during the processing. The localization is indicated by the bounding boxes of the text, which is then extracted into a different corpus. And these are the search queries that were there the for an example. So once we have a query and corpus ready, uh, our corpus ready, we will use the query that, was, uh, that user used to search and the corpus that was extracted from the video to form a relationship between the two as we want to look whether the query and the corpus have some similarity or not, whether they are related or not. For this purpose and to maintain this and to form this relationship, after sanitization, we use natural language processing concepts. Uh, so for this, we are using cosine similarity matrix of query versus corpus. Now, uh, this, uh, uh, for, to find the relationship between the words of this query and corpus, uh, and to find the cosine similarity distance measure, we have used glove vector model, which is Stanford's, which is Stanford's word embeddings, word vectors which are uh, pre-trained uh, on Wikipedia and uh, Twitter crawl uh, uh, databases. Each vector is of 100 dimensions. So once we have uh, formed a process symmetry matrix using glove model, we uh, uh, normalize the score and uh, uh, it, normalize the matrix and convert it into one score. So once we have similarity score uh, calculated, we use another uh, metadata of the YouTube video, which is comments in the YouTube to find out the polarity of the comments. Now, what do we mean by polarity of the comments? Polarity of the comments means we find out uh, whether the comments are uh, positive or negative uh, or what the feedback given by the user to the, on the video. So if it is positive, uh, it will be on the positive side. If it is negative comments, it will be on the negative side. So polarity score is ranges from minus one to uh, plus one. And uh, similarity score was uh, from zero to one, zero being no similarity to one being high, higher similarity. 
So once we have uh, processed the comments uh, using a uh, text blob uh, model, which is a natural language processing library given by Python, we use those scores along with uh, the metadata of the video, like views, likes, and dislikes, uh, to finally calculate the index on that video, on the particular video. Now, index calculation stage, uh, we have uh, this uh, index calculation formula. Uh, now, uh, instead of using views as a view count as a direct uh, participant in this uh, formula, we have used uh, the ratios of likes to views and dislikes to views. Now, reason to do so can be explained with a small example as well. So, why view count versus like dislike ratio? So, if we consider, let's say, a small example of two videos. Uh, two videos uh, and two parameters of view count and likes. Uh, in first video, let's say only 3,000 people have seen that video and second 10,000 have seen. So if you look at only one parameter, we erroneously would assume that second video is more relevant or more uh, uh, famous for that particular search query. And uh, first is not. Or looking at the likes as well, we will come to same conclusion. However, if we look deep enough and we uh, compare the, uh, uh, the, the ratio, we will get to know that uh, the ratio is one is to two, meaning out of uh, 3,000 people, only 1,000, uh, uh, out of 3,000, almost 1,000 liked the video, actually gave a feedback on the video. And out of 10,000, only 2,000 actually gave a feedback on the video. So a deeper uh, meaning could be extracted from the ratios in this case. That's why we consider the ratios here. And similarity in polarity score would uh, add to the index uh, uh, and uh, increase or decrease the uh, index accordingly based on the relevancy uh, that was uh, calculated and relationships that was taken. So once index is calculated for a video, we finally are uh, ranked based on their videos are finally ranked based on their indexes. Uh, 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 briefly discussing experimental results. So uh, while experimentation, per, uh, we divided uh, uh, different videos per query and we considered uh, a different number of videos per query and their statistics and data is shown, likes to views ratio, dislikes to views ratio, the similarity score that was calculated, the polarity score that was calculated and for more visibility, the number of percentages of positive, negative and neutral comments. And finally, the index value and the ranks that were changed and they were there in the YouTube, the relative ranks, and after the change. I would like to draw the attention to one of the special case where if a uh, author of the YouTube video has turned off the commenting, uh, the feature of the commenting can be turned off and we can stop people from commenting on your video. In that case, uh, as a special case, what you've done here is, uh, since we cannot comment whether the uh, whether we cannot determine whether the comments are positive or negative, uh, the polarity is assigned to neutral, which is the zero value, and uh, the overall determination of the index is based on other parameters, likes, views, dislikes, and similarity score. And in this case, even if it is in the under the same query, if uh, some video has uh, uh, comments turned on, then it will be given preference and it will be calculated as per the model working uh, of the system. As giving feedback is also one of the uh, important ways to actually determine. So whether it is positive or negative, uh, based on that, the index will be calculated. So uh, in concluding, uh, we can say uh, we illustrated the impact of uh, using intent and relevance feedback methodology in video ranking to improve the rank of relevant videos. And in the future, we could extract our feature extraction stage to uh, detect different types of audio visual cues instead of only the textual content that we did, so that we can include a more variety of videos other than only the instructional or lecture videos. Also, we can include multilingual language models in addition to the English to include in our similarity and polarity score calculation on topics and textual uh, content so that we can process multiple languages and feedback given to the people. Uh, uh, these were a few of the references that were uh, uh, studied in the this paper. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, patience. And thank you so much, Mr. Uh, yeah, the session chairs can proceed with any queries. Yeah, uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, and, uh, this is Lakshmi here. Uh, is Mr. Vishal, like I would like to ask a few questions from my side. Yes. Yes. 
like uh, is your application very specific to a particular application or it is uh, it is going to be a general application like which can work on any kind of yeah. So, uh, for this presentation, we uh, focused on YouTube because uh, uh, it was easily accessible. Uh, so, it can be implemented in any video platform where we have uh, search result and ranking. So, for ease of uh, implementation and proof of concept, we use YouTube because we have access to YouTube data API. Uh, so, I can like use that API to process the videos. But this uh, this feature or this uh, Topic can be implemented in any video platform uh, that has the ranking and feedback mechanism because it is important that there is some feedback mechanism uh, like province uh, uh, that where user can basically give some feedback because that's from where we are driving the cue that whether user is finding it relevant or not. And another uh, uh, signal score would work because we are just using uh, visual aspect here. But for polarity, it is important that. Uh, you know, uh, to, to give a better relevance feedback, it is uh, if there is a comment, we can then implement in any uh, video platform, uh, similar video platform. Uh, of course, your presentation was too good, and we had a very good an, uh, analysis of your algorithm. And one uh, one uh, final uh, um, query is that, and you would have uh, mapped this metadata and content to create your search intent, right? Uh, what kind of an approach that you have used to map your uh, metadata and the content to create your uh, intent because intent is a very secret ingredient for any uh, video searching algorithm in video analytics. Uh, what kind of a mapping that you've given with your metadata and uh, your content type to create your uh, perfect uh, search intent? Yeah, right. So, uh, so there are two uh, things. Uh, so uh, like how to map, like your question is basically how, what kind of mapping was, how it was used, right? So uh, when uh, so there are two uh, to determine the intent. Uh, firstly, uh, we will be using a search query. Uh, basically, what I'm looking for, I'll be generally using a search query, a small number of token or a sentence to look for a topic. And uh, what we did uh, is we take that search query. And uh, since we are focusing on lecture kind of videos, we are drawing you uh, what is the video offering. You're drawing, uh, drawing cue of that from the textual content here for this uh, scope. So text, uh, it is the general understanding that a video will ex expand on its title. Uh, whatever the title or description of the video is, it will expand on that topic in its content using textual or any other form. So we use that content in here, textual content, and we want to build a relationship between what uh, the search query used by the user was and this content. Now, basically, these are words, uh, words and sentences. So, how to uh, draw a relationship, relationship between these words? For this, uh, we use uh, natural language processing, uh, where we use word embedding uh, word vectors, where word vectors are basically, uh, you can say, uh, vector is like an array, you can say, where a particular word, for example, king, would have different relationship with other words. For example, king is very close to prince or emperor. So there will be cosines, there will be values assigned to uh, uh, values assigned for this one word to many other words depending on the dimension and the whole data set how it was created. So in this case, it was 100 dimensional glove vector pre-trained model from the Stanford. So basically it has a relationship between one word and other words that are there in the vocabulary generally. And the data set that was used in glove training was Wikipedia as well as Twitter for this mapping this relationship. So I used a pre-trained model here because we cannot uh, do a common crawl of the whole web. It will require a lot of research power actually to uh, train a corpus where we have word mappings to each other. So that's why we have used a pre-trained glove model, uh, global vector. Uh, it full-form is global vector word embedding by Stanford. So that's why here we use pre-trained model to maintain that relationship. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's the answer that I've received from you. Yes, thank you so much. And my uh, uh, suggestion is, if you can uh, incorporate AI into the search engine with the search engine optimization, that would of course be uh, much more, uh, um, uh, uh, what to say, uh, intelligent yes. search kind yeah. of thing might might be. Yes, yes. Thank you. So much, ma'am. Thank you so much, Mr. Vishal. I would like to call the next participant, Mr. Doctor Again, let's be present, now. Miss.
three high vegetable or minimal spanning three for efficient cluster in lakshmi prasanna and we sai vegetable lakshmi prasanna and sai vegetable or for that team any of the persons who are available Go to the next participant. Is Mr. Kapoor? Yes, sir. I am here. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Kapoor. Of course, you can start okay. chatting. Start chatting. Okay. Ah, oh, is it visible, sir? The screen is visible. Yes. Yes. Oh. Time is right. Right. Uh, good afternoon, all the uh, respected panel members and uh, all the other participants. Uh, me, Kaushik Ghosh, and my co-worker Suganda Sharma. Uh, this is the paper: a comparative study of different neural network models for identification and classification of diabetic retinopathy on the basis of severity. How severe it would be? Actually, uh, Ms. Suganda was supposed to present it, but she is down with COVID, uh, so I am. I think I can do justice. to the presentation so well uh, ms suganda she did her be in information technology from government engineering college of gujarat in 2009 she was in kawasaki japan she worked in corporate sector there as a web developer and content technical writer she completed her mtech and now at present she is doing her phd from university of petroleum and engineering energy studies uh, dehradun her area of interest is blockchain iot she has a total of 6 years of academic and 9 year, uh, 3 years of corporate experience and i am kaushik ghosh i am working in the same organization university of petroleum and energy studies i did my uh, be from sikkim manipal institute of technology mtech and phd both from jadavpur university kolkata uh this uh, work of ours is about diabetic retinopathy uh we'll discuss about the disease we have what we have done is we have taken four different models and we have seen how effective each of those models are in predicting the severity of the disease we have classified the disease into five different parts five different levels from 0 till 4 0 will represent that well there is no problem uh, in that person and uh, let me tell you uh, first of all that if a person has diabetic then only we are going for this thing diabetic retinopathy thing if no i mean then uh, loss of vision can be due to some other uh, cause as well one will indicate mild diabetic retinopathy just the initial stages two will indicate moderate three indicate severe but non proliferative four indicates proliferative stage of diabetic retinopathy which will cause loss of vision so we have taken different images of uh, varying contrast intensity and brightness in order to train our model and then uh, verify actually validate the things and finally we have seen that uh, the overall performance of the models were seen to improve will increase in the number of the epochs so first of all uh, let me uh, spend uh, one or two slides about diabetic retinopathy and its effects it is about having a person suffering from diabetes they can get hampered in, in their retina as well why is this so because with increase in the glucose level in the blood this will actually harm the veins of the retina now when the veins of the retina are not capable of taking the blood to the light receptacle tissues then it can finally cause loss in vision so this additional liquid blood cholesterol along with different fats in the retina that cause thickening of the macula and there are certain irregular fragile veins matlab when the actual veins the original veins the healthy veins are getting blocked with advance in advancement in the stages of this particular disease the original veins the uh, the proper veins are getting blocked so what happens on the top of retina some abnormal uh veins started protruding out they are not healthy veins they are not robust veins and they actually block the vision now diabetic retinopathy is in fact uh, a major problem because uh, what it has been seen that between 2015 till 19 that 
of people who are suffering from diabetes are actually prone to diabetic retinopathy of one stage or the other between the stage of one till four. Zero means no diabetic retinopathy. In 2010 alone, 3.7 million were affected visually and 0.8 million, other than these 3.7 million people, 0.8 million people, they have completely lost their eyesight. And many patients remain asymptomatic. If, I mean, uh, they don't get any symptoms, but even, uh, uh, I mean, and when it is late, the more late it is in detecting this thing, the diabetic, the stage of the diabetic retinopathy, more prone he or she will be to loss of vision. So that is why we are, uh, we have done this work in order to see that which models with uh, uh, models are accurate for <coughs> detecting diabetic retinopathy. So there's a day of hope because not everything is that gloom that if a proper or timely detection can be done, well, it can reduce this thing up to 57% in 50, a proper treatment uh, after a proper detection can uh, reduce the chances of loss or in the vision. Now, how we can go for the detection? One technique is optical coherence tomography. Another one is fundus photography analysis. So what we have gone for is the fundus photography analysis for detecting the stage, in which stage of uh, diabetic retinopathy the subject or the patient is at present. Now those images, different fundus images are collected and those images are fed into different deep learning models or CNNs, the convolution neural network model, in order to <coughs> sorry, <coughs> classify and analyze in which stage of diabetic retinopathy the subject is at present. So as I said, zero means no diabetic retinopathy. One, stage number one is the mild non-proliferative retinopathy. This is the early stage. And it is, uh, uh, I mean, at this stage, if uh, the subject is detected, then with proper treatment, he can get back his vision, he can be cured. Second is non-proliferative, but, but this is moderate. And what happens during the moderate is the retinal veins, as I was saying, that with accumulation of glucose and fat, the retinal veins, the veins, they start getting twisted. Okay. And then in the next stage, if, and in the stage number two, even after twisting, well, uh, they are carrying uh, blood to the light receptors, light recepting tissues. But in stage number three, what happens is those twisted, uh, those things, they are actually blocked. This denies blood flow into the retina. And when the retina is denied from uh, blood flow by the healthy tissues, the original tissue, sorry, the original veins, not the tissues, then in the fourth stage, what happens? Then finally, those, uh, those uh, blood vessels are damaged. And what you uh, get is new retina, new, new uh, veins are actually generated. The non-robust abnormal blood vessels are generated. So they grow on the retinal surface. They are not uh, capable of carrying blood to the uh, light receptive tissues and that will actually disrupt the blood supply into the retina and finally causing loss of vision. Now these are the <coughs> images. The left hand two, this two, the left hand two are the Sorry, images of healthy most, retina. Almost Sorry. eight minutes are completed for your presentation, still two more minutes are there. Yes, sir. yes, sir. yes, sir. So these two are for healthy. Uh, next is uh, the stage number one, two, three and four. The last one is actually for the proliferative, the last one is actually proliferative image. <clears throat> These are the four algorithms that we have considered. This the, and uh, for results, we have taken 3,648 high resolution fundus images. And uh, <coughs> of this total number of images, 80% were used for uh, training, 10% for testing, and 10% for validation. <coughs> now, when we look into the uh, results, uh, what we found was with increase in the number of epochs, accuracy increased and the loss decreased for all these. This is for inception V3. This is for all, all of them. Now, this proves that actually the image was trained and it is giving a proper result because if uh, with increase in the number of epochs, the uh, loss is increasing and the accuracy is decreasing, that means the image is not uh, sorry, the model is not uh, operating well. It is, it was trained, but it is not operating properly. Again, for this thing for ResNet 50, the same thing with increase in the number of epochs, the accuracy increased and uh, the loss actually decreased. 
And many a time it happens like with increase in the number of epochs, both the accuracy and loss are increasing. So that is the problem of overfitting, which was not present in our case. Again, for mobile net V2, this accuracy and loss graphs. And finally, for VGG16, we had this accuracy and loss graphs. And when we compared the training and testing accuracy of the different models under consideration, we considered we can we could consider only these four models. We found that MobileNet V2 had the highest training and testing accuracy. To conclude, what we found the inference that we drew was with increase in accuracy, uh, sorry, in increase in the number of epochs, the accuracy increased and the loss decreased. The overall performance of all the four models got better with increasing the number of epochs. And of this four, MobileNet V2 was the best model for classifying the images. So uh, thank you for so giving me the chance to present. Objection. Yes, sir. So who has contested any of the games? Uh, sorry, sir. Okay, okay. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, sir. Nice presentation and uh, the work is reflecting your good quality work and uh, you have used the good algorithms also. Uh, but uh, uh, thank you. I suggest that the data says size. Right. Increase the size. Sir, could you please repeat the question, sir? Because the data says uh, size yeah. is 3,500. Uh, 3, right, 3,600. 3,600 something. Yes, sir. 3,600. So if yeah. you make it to nearly to 7 or 8,000, the performance of the machine can go to 90 plus, I think. Yes, sir. Actually, the problem was uh, getting the data. So what we could manage was uh, something, whatever we found in uh, this Kegel. So actually, yeah. getting data was uh, a big problem for us. Sir. Yeah, because the, uh, the efficiency, in case of machine learning, 70% or 80% efficiency is not very uh, accountable. We can go for some more uh, data sets, and after that, the accountability of the algorithm will be more, what I feel. OK, sir. Okay, sir. Yeah. I'll keep that in mind. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank nice presentation. Yeah, thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I want to call the next presenter. Mr. Selva Mukunda, Selva Muttukumaran. N. Selva Muttukumaran in Nagalakshmi on intelligent security. Yeah, yes, sir. Shall I present? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am, your presentation is visible. Start presenting, okay, the time is exactly 10 minutes. Okay, sir, thank you. A very pleasant good afternoon to one and all present here. We are about four members, uh, Selva Muttukumaran N, Nagalakshmi R, Shanti G, and Lokesh VS. Uh, myself, uh, R, Nagalakshmi. I am currently pursuing my uh, undergraduate degree uh, in BTEC IT at Coimbatore Institute of Technology. So I'm very glad to present my project an intelligent security monitoring system with video based face recognition in international conference on advanced computing and communication technology, which was conducted by Francis Javier Engineering College, Tirunelveli. Not 
Yeah, you can just roll your mouse and uh, yeah, once it's spent and roll your mouse, your presentation will be uh, moved. Since there is a network issue from your site, I'm glad to hear. Oh, sure. Is your network stable? Still hanging in the plane here, so you can see. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Is it working now? Snagalakshmi, ma'am. Snagalakshmi, I request you to uh, resolve your network issue. Come back so that we will present with the next presenter. Please, Mr. Devanarayan Sudhidhar and Dibyanshu Jaiswal, Karakala Gaurav, Prabhu, and Saurav Rizal on a survey on order forecasting methods. Dave Narayan should be that. Sir, good afternoon, good afternoon, sir. Yes, please. You can start sharing the screen in person. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, so we, uh, we did a survey on order forecasting methods along with my teammates, uh, Dave Narayan, Devyanshu Jaiswar, and Saraja. Our guide is Rekha, Ms. Rekha GS. Uh, so uh, go to abstract. Yeah, so uh, main reason we did this survey is because we are working on a project for restaurants to be able to predict uh, orders, uh, the, dip, uh, the number of orders uh, on the in future of each individual item. Uh, so, this, so that this can help restaurant know how much uh, ingredient stock they need and also uh, they can know uh, they can uh, prepare early all the uh, ingredients. Uh, this can help in faster service of the dishes uh, and it will help in inventory management. So for this reason, we were researching on various uh, models which were uh, used for revenue prediction and also uh, forecasting customer flow uh, and also uh, orders. Next. Okay, so uh, the first paper we saw was uh, restaurant revenue prediction using machine learning. So in this paper, they are, uh, they want they want to predict the uh, revenue of the restaurant of an existing restaurant when they want to open a new outlet, uh, uh, so, so that they can know whether opening in this location can help uh, in generating good amount of revenue. Uh, so they use uh, three different models, random forest, support vector machine, and Gaussian naive. Uh, so uh, they had a data set with 37 parameters, including opening date, type, uh, the type of restaurant, the kind of food they serve, uh, the cities, uh, the parking space, and the points of interest around that area. So after comparison, the random forest uh, model provided a wider range of values compared to the other two models. Uh, so the next one, uh, restaurant sales and customer demand forecasting. Uh, so they had done a categorization of different uh, uh, methods, forecasting methods. So they have included seven techniques, including multiple regression, Poisson regression, Box Jenkins, uh, exponential smoothing, whole printers, uh, artificial neural network and Bayesian model, and even include some hybrid models. Uh, so uh, they found neural networks had the uh, more at most advantages compared to the others, and they had uh, high noise tolerance. Class uh, they could classify patterns uh, and works with little knowledge on relation between the classes and variables included in it. Uh, even Bayesian model was considered to have not have any disadvantages and had a, uh, and all the parameters in it had a good interpretation. Uh, the exponential, exponential smoothing uh, 
provide a reliable forecast and it's generated quickly. Uh, and it doesn't require much external data, but it, uh, the, but it depends on outliers where sales are unusually high or low. Uh, the ARIMA or box Jenkins models, uh, the external data is not required for prediction. But the input says has to be stationary, otherwise uh, it can't give proper uh, output. Uh, next was digital ordering system uh, and, uh, and customer flow uh, using data mining. Uh, so uh, in this one, they were uh, they decided to uh, digitalize their restaurant using Android devices, so that the customers can directly uh, order from the Android device at the restaurant. Uh, the advantage of this is that uh, the data directly goes to the uh, kitchen and also to the manager, gets stored, and then uh, there's a data mining done in the background which helps predict the customer flow uh, at the restaurant. Uh, it is uh, said to be better than uh, the kiosk systems. Uh, then, next, uh, next slide. Yeah, so uh, machine learning for sales forecast in restaurants. Uh, so, uh, this this was mainly for uh, finding out if this uh, restaurant can uh, get more accurate sales forecast uh, than by just comparing the last year's manually comparing last year's sales uh, on the equivalent day. Uh, in this one, they used uh, uh, models like decision tree, randomly trained decision trees, random forest uh, model. Uh, so. Decision trees uh, behaves like any other tree. It has a root node at the top, uh, it, which can be internal or uh, it can be a split node. Uh, so, uh, in decision tree, the testing is done like at each level, at each node, uh, to give an accurate result. Uh, it, it has a high quality output. Uh, then next one is the randomly trained decision trees. So uh, this in this case, this decision tree is split into two parts. One is the training uh, decision tree and a testing decision tree. Uh, so all uh, in the testing decision tree, all the uh, uh, nodes uh, in the tree are tested. Uh, and the objective, it's not been previously tested or not. Uh, and it has to be completely new set of data. Uh, after that, it, they go to the training part and they train each separate nodes. Uh, then we stop at the leaf node and uh, which becomes a predictor and helps to map input with the output. Uh, in random forest, it is a combination of the randomly trained decision tree. Uh, so it, the, uh, the combination makes up the random forest. Uh, so each tree is like very different from one another. Hence, it helps in give, uh, giving a lot of uh, abilities to the uh, model. So uh, this, and they found that this model gave far better predictions than the other two. Uh, next was a Bayesian approach. So uh, in this one, uh, so it, over here. Uh, various techniques are uh, used for predicting the uh, future values of daily sold uh, quantities. Uh, so they uh, uh, so in this one uh, there are seasonality and trend functions. This uh, basically checks the trends and seasonality of the value of uh, the uh, items and helps to uh, know because uh, based on the supply and demand, it tries to predict this uh, value of that uh, item in the future. Uh, so in this one, they had collected two data sets from a well-known uh, uh, restaurant, but uh, they had not, uh, they were not allowed to specify. Uh, next one.
Okay, so uh, uh, demand forecasting using machine learning and statistical analysis. So uh, here the demand of customers is uh, predicted using in internal external data such as weather and events. Uh, so this is mainly based in Japan uh, and uh, mainly the service industry in Japan. Uh, so here they use boosted decision tree, Bayesian linear, and uh, decision forest. Uh, and statistical uh, method they use was stepwise method. Data like weather, holiday, uh, special events, and all such data were used for uh, knowing the customer demand. Uh, they didn't find much difference between uh, all the three models. But the decision tree, boosted decision tree, had a slightly lesser forecasting rate. Uh, but it was found to exceed 85% most of the time. Uh, next is forecasting strong seasonal time series with artificial neural networks. Uh, in this case, they said to use time series forecasting as it has a seasonal a seasonality property, uh, which includes economic and uh, financial time series. Uh, since there are like fluctuations in uh, the data, uh, like in every season, uh, this was considered the perfect model. Uh, many of the other models, they usually de-seasonalize it uh, as it the, the, there's no seasonality function in those models. Uh, they compared it to- Your time is completed, please make it Oh, sure. Uh, okay, so they compared whole winters, uh, support vector machine, seasonal auto, uh, seasonal auto regressive integrated moving average. Uh, they found, uh, they also used an artificial neural network, which they found to be the best, but then uh, there was a lot of debate on the efficiency of it. Uh, next. Okay, so to conclude, we mainly wanted to know which is the reliable model for uh, our project. Uh, hence, we, we wanted to make an order prediction system. So we went with uh, whole Winters uh, exponential smoothing. Uh, as it, uh, we tested other, uh, uh, some other models, we found this was better. Uh, so, that, so that was the main reason for the whole survey. Thank you. Thank you so much. Session chairs can proceed if any queries are available. Thank you. Good presentation. And uh, you have collected the data. Recent data is also there. And uh, you have collected the data, data of the same domain. That's good. I just want to add you one, uh, give you one suggestion that in the case of uh, observation, you can make one more column that's called the critical review and in which you should give your uh, view on that particular contest. Because that okay, is, okay. Uh, whenever we do the literature review, it consists of four blocks. That is the better one in which after the observation, you make a critical review. And uh, okay. the second point is that whenever you are uh, uh, quoting any, citing any, any of this, uh, any researcher work, you need to mention the efficiency. Because you have not mentioned about the efficiency. You have just talked about their efficiency is this, accuracy is this. But what is the value? like 90%, 80%, then only that uh, model, what you are going to predict in the future that will be better than that or not, that you have to conclude that from that. So okay. what I feel, it's better if you can increase the, uh, include these two points. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ma'am, I would like to call the next participant. This Vaibhav, Vaibhav R. Raman and Ulasini is on survey on classification of insects for insect Best management using computation methodology. Good afternoon, sir. I'll be sharing the screen. Yes. Sir, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. I'm talking to Mr. Vaibhavi R. Raman. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. I'm a team, the team member, actually. Oh, please start sharing the screen. Please. Just a minute, sir. Good afternoon all, I'm Rishabh from Vidyavadaka College of Engineering, Mysuru. A survey paper is titled Survey on Classification on Insects for Insect Pest Management Using Computational Entomology. My other co-authors are Ulasini, Tanmay Ashok, Vaibhavi Raman. The paper is done 
under the guidance of a guide, Professor Nitin Kumar, coming to our paper. Our paper is primarily focused on agriculture. Agriculture has been practiced in India for ages. In fact, it can also be termed as the backbone of the Indian economy. Modern agriculture depends on pollinators, our entire ecosystem, including the food we eat, every breathe, counts on pollinators. Many hurdles are faced by farmers in crop cultivation, mainly pest diseases. Here we use computational entomology, which is an emerging field in agriculture that uses appropriate sensors for classifying pests based on images and also suggests the right use of control fertilizers. So what's the need of this image-based classification? The measurement, monitoring, and classification of insects form an integral part of any biological and scientific study. The image classification and its methods provide accurate and inexpensive solutions. It also helps in knowing population density of different flies and to determine the necessary steps to be taken to improve farming in a better way. There are various technologies to save pollinators. The ones we have employed are IoT. With the help of IoT, we collect data with measurable parameters. The parameters being sound, wing beat, weather, color, and texture. The other is the computer vision. Computer vision is used for detecting threats. The vision and cloud sensors are used for detection of threats like hornets, which prey on important pollinators such as honeybees. Next is cloud. The data which is collected is stored in cloud and is analyzed through which we can monitor weight, flight activity, temperature and humidity, etc. Artificial intelligence. Using artificial intelligence, we analyze the data which is stored. It checks for patterns and will try and predict the behavior. Once analyzed, the insights will be shared with conservationists and entomologists so that they can protect them. Some of the related works done in the field of computational entomology. The first figure shows use of computer vision, machine learning and deep learning for image-based species identification. The second figure shows discriminative local soft coding for classification of insects through a hybrid approach. Some of the research done in the field of computational entomology, primarily medical entomology. It focuses on public health importance of insects, which include mosquitoes that can transmit various deadly diseases. Pesticide toxicology focuses on using natural products such as insect repellent and insecticides. Focus is also laid on insect toxicology and environmental effects of agrichemicals. The systematics and ecology of aquatic insects include biogeography of aquatic insects, conservation of biodiversity in aquatic habitats and use of aquatic insects for the indication of water quality in a specific region. Urban entomology, it deals with insect pest management in households, horticultural crops and structures. We would like to conclude by we would like to conclude by saying that the inappropriate usage of pesticides to control harmful pests is posing a great threat to environment and to pollinators, which are at the risk of getting endangered. Our paper is aimed at technically addressing farmers about the needs of farming by giving them an overview of pest population in a particular region. Keeping in bound view of boundaries like reliability and necessities which would give a trap device would be built which would give an idea for farmers about the right kind of pesticides to be used and also helps in determining the necessary steps that could be taken to improve farming in a better way. These are the references which we have opted for our survey paper. Thank you all for your time. Thank you so much. So, Sanjay, so we'll proceed with any queries. Sir? Yes, thank you so much for your presentation, Mr. Bishop. Thank you. Your uh, session chairs or participants can raise any queries or they can uh, raise the queries to the chat box as well so that respective persons can answer. Okay, sir. So, we'd like to call the next participant is Mr. P.V. China Smart and Dr. K.K. Tannamwal on a technique using association rule reduced detection based classification for spatial data. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, good afternoon sir. Yes, good afternoon, sir. Thank you, Shahid. Oh, yes, sir. Okay, sir.
Yes, sir. Good afternoon. So my technique uh, name is uh, my title is a technique using association rule reduction based classification for spatial data. My name is P D Shinasmart. My guide is uh, K K Dr K K Tanamal and my co guide is Dr S S Sujada. And based on my biography, I am a research scholar in the Department of Computer Science uh, in S T Hindu College, Nagarcoil of Tamil Nadu. I have published uh, two journals, one in A C A and one in Scopus. I have presented three conferences. So uh, my uh, special interest is data mining. And going on to my abstract, so uh, the novel technique uses an association rule reduction based classification technique for spatial data classification. This method uses a filter in association rule mining followed by the classification of data. The proposed method uh, I have given forest by data set from the UCA repository as input, and uh, the result is the fire. Classified, classified fired and non-fired regions. So the two param uh, two parameters were used for uh, testing. Uh, they are classification accuracy and classification time. Uh, based on the introduction, so the data mining techniques have grown potentially so that it is possible to extract information from spatial data. Spatial data is the data that has geographic locations. In this modern world, large sets of data are generated every day. The spatial data mining is used in many areas such as business, stock exchange, weather forecasting, remote sensing, etc. The data sets from many domains contain different attributes, noise such as redundant data, missed value, etc. And they are difficult to represent. So extracting and classifying the data has become a challenge in data mining. So uh, the new on the proposed technique is described as the technique generates rules from the set of available attributes in the training set. After rule generation, the features are assigned to the algorithm uses vertical mining process to simplify the rule extraction process. Then the classification technique is applied on these rules to classify the data as fired or non-fired region. Then this is the architecture diagram, the special data, uh, data set from the uh, the features are extracted using the association rule reduction algorithm, which consists of the association rule mining and the reduction technique. And uh, for classification, we use a cluster technique. So the, the proposed technique is the ERC algorithm. There is association rule reduction based classification algorithm, which consists of the two techniques. So in the uh, features, uh, starting with the association rule, there are two steps in association rule mining that is discovering frequent item sets and generating the rules. So in the first step, a threshold called minimum support is set as a measure for deciding which item sets are to be kept during the training phase. The support denotes the frequency of item set in the training data set. When the support of an item set is larger than the, than the threshold, the item set is considered as frequent less frequent. And when the support is less than the threshold, it is considered as infrequent data. And later on, the infrequent data are discarded. The next step, another threshold called minimum confidence is employed. Each frequent item set that contains two or more feature values will be considered, considered as the considered as a rule. Then the confidence value A to B denotes the frequency of A and B occurring together. Then confidence value is a measure of for rules where only high correlations between the feature values are kept. Here, we use a vertical mining approach that is used to find the frequent item sets. A data set in vertical mining is represented by items along with its line numbers into a simple data structure called T-list. So uh, since we are using vertical mining, it is, this reduces the number of passes over the data set into a single time. That is, we need not, uh, we need not come to the data set again and again for, uh, for calculating the support and confidence values. Then once the rules are generated, a filter method called pruning procedure is called to reduce the redundant rules and only those rules which are highly protected will retain. Then once the rules are discovered, once the rules are discovered, the features and information are used to calculate the available features. Then, then the, ascend, the features are arranged are according to the ascending order of the scores. Then finally, we use the clustering technique that splits the training set into various clusters so that uh, for each, uh, we can get a set of 
clusters that um, for uh, for this particular temperature for the we will get a value and the color of the fire will be in such a way etc we can set a group of clusters we have which are classified for with which we can predict the values easily so finally for the results and discussion i can analyze the proposed technique with existing two techniques logic boost tensor based decision tree and a gcnn technique and the parameters used were classification accuracy and classification type so based on classification accuracy uh, it is a uh, we are using a vertical mining here so uh, vertical mining reduces the time reduces the time so classification time is obtained and classification accuracy means it is a uh, number of related spatial data that are rightly classified to the total number of data present in the spatial database so here we are using a reduction technique so in the reduction you know, since we are using the reduction technique so number of uh, uh, missing redundant data will be uh, discarded so our accuracy will be attained so coming to the conclusion the technique association rule uh, reduction based classification enhances the classification accuracy and reduces the classification time the association rule reduction method generates association rules based on vertical mining the use of vertical mining reduces the time for computation the rule set generated is used for classification a final results predict the burnt area of forest fire with enhanced accuracy and finally these are the reference papers used for uh, and the this paper thank you sir Thank you so much. Yes, yes, sir. Session chairs can okay. proceed with any of the queries. Oh, yes, yeah. sir. Yes. Uh, yeah, good evening, ma'am. Uh, this is Lakshmi here. Right, you have uh, given a detailed uh, presentation, a good presentation on classification algorithm, and your classification efficiency is uh, noted with your parameter as classification accuracy and accu uh, classification time. Uh, is it, ma'am? Yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, your uh, per performance parameters, classification, accuracy, and time. That's what you have mentioned. And can you please uh, tell me why you have chosen accuracy alone as your evaluation parameter? And you still have so many parameters uh, that could that could uh, give you more uh, on this uh, performance evaluation. Uh, you have chosen only your classification accuracy. How do you think uh, it will uh, give a better evaluation for your algorithm? Uh, uh, because uh, my uh, current papers, I have chosen uh, classification accuracy. As uh, here, I have uh, given given two parameters: classification accuracy and classification time. Uh, for my uh, uh, our research work, also I have chosen classification accuracy and classification time for the parameters. Ah uh, yes, ma'am, that's okay. Fine. My uh, good suggestion for you is we have uh, uh, much more performance measures that will. Uh, Actually, uh, evaluate your classification model. You may have your precision recall, F1 score, and sensitivity ROC curve, and so much more. Performance evaluation parameters are there. Okay. Should give you much more uh, uh, weightage to your performance of your algorithm. Just having a classification accuracy alone, um, I, I think you can have. But still, if you add on more parameters, I think uh, you can learn much okay. more about sure, algorithm. Thank okay, you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Next participant is Ms. Pooja Agarwal, Professor R. K. Shivatsuma on hybrid technique of instruction detection classification model using software computing. Ms. Pooja Agarwal, Professor R. K. Shivatsuma. Present. Hello. Yes, sir. I am present. Kindly share the screen with us. Yes, I am sharing my. Hello. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry for the interruption. Yes. Okay, sir. Sorry for the interruption, sir. I actually am suffering with COVID. Sorry, ma'am. Uh, can we take care of yourself? Uh, anyway. Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, sir. Uh, the uh, my topic is hybrid tech. Oh. intrusion detection classification model 
using soft computing uh, i am pooja agarwal i am a research scholar working in dr shakunti's uh, dean and head over the in computer science department <coughs> in to uh, uh, actually in this uh, paper we are use two techniques uh, to finalize the feature set of the um, uh, data set available data set we used in this uh, paper uh, the data set which is nsl kdd it is a standard intrusion detection database available on the public uh, domain and uh, Uh, actually there are 42 different features in the nsl kdd it's a vast uh, data set available in the public dom- domain uh, so we uh, what we have done we try to um, uh, you know reduce the feature set it is 42 feature set we reduce trying to reduce it <coughs> and classify it by the neural network classification neural network technique as a classifier Uh, to uh, finalize the features uh, features that we use the neighborhood component analysis as a feature selection technique to finalize the feature and uh, after that used to classify the network uh, traffic in the attack and the normals so the main objective of uh, this uh, uh, study is to you know uh, uh, reduce the uh, features uh, sele- uh, feature sets and uh, increase the accuracy <coughs> uh, as we know intrusion detection system is used to provide the framework for the network security uh, to protect against threat uh, to audit the network traffic follow for the detection <coughs> and prevention of the information from intruders in this uh, uh, paper actually we have uh, gone through with uh, several techniques but in this paper we just used uh, to describe only two techniques which is the combination of uh, neighbor component analysis uh, to finalize the feature set and uh, for as a classifier uh, neural network as a, we use neural network as a classifier <coughs> as you know neural network is an a numerous parallel appropriate data handling framework that has different performance factors <coughs> which implement organic uh, neural system of the human mind i am not going uh, through with the neural network uh, detail uh, and this is the <coughs> excuse me <clears throat> never the component analysis it's a non parametric and uh, rooted techniques for choosing highlights with the point of target of benefit uh, from estimate the precision of the grouping calculations as i earlier said <coughs> in our investigation we to utilize the proposed strategy on nsl kdd data set in the experiment uh, we used uh, the nsl kdd 20% training data set model in which uh, we 80% we did as a training and 20% as a test testing uh, in the given data set uh, we uh, we classified our uh, data set in three different classes uh, class 2 uh, class 5 and class 22 <clears throat> here is the description of classes <coughs> in the class 2 only uh, the target uh, is uh, attack and normal in class 5 dos props r2l <coughs> u2r and normal and in uh, 22 classes we we took all the types of uh, uh, available uh, features uh, target as given in the nsl kdd 20% data set <clears throat> again after applying the uh, neighborhood component analysis uh, by varying the the threshold we find three different uh, uh, feature set in first feature which we named as nca214 
having 15 different feature out of 42 <coughs> and in NCA 5.5 having uh, we have 16 different features out of 42 and in NCA 17 we can name having 18 different features out of um, 42. These uh, uh, these uh, different data models belongs to the different uh, classes as mentioned here. Two one four belongs to the uh, class two. Five one five belongs to the class five. <coughs> and NCM as seventeen belongs to the class twenty two. Our uh, proposed method is uh, first we have taken the data set. Uh, the size of the data set is. Uh, for testing, we have just because we have taken 20% <coughs> of the whole data set, we have taken uh, 25,192 records for testing and 11,850 uh, for the training. Oh, for, sorry, uh, for the uh, training, 25,192 for the training and 11,850 for the testing. <coughs> After taking the data set, uh, we uh, pre uh, processed the whole data set and then we applied the neighborhood component analysis uh, to extract the different features as I mentioned earlier and we found uh, uh, three different models uh, though we found uh, too many but we chose the, uh, the uh, best ones after taking uh, some other uh, experiments. Uh, on the whole, on the all three data sets, we apply the classification. And uh, for the classification uh, results, we uh, taken three uh, performance matrices: matrices, <coughs> accuracy, detection rate, false positive rate. And uh, after getting the results, we compare it with the uh, different other models uh, mentioned in the research paper. So here is the performance criteria, detection rate, <coughs> false positive rate, accuracy. These are the experiment results. Though we have taken uh, too many ex uh, uh, too many uh, readings, but we chosen the uh, uh, the best one to display here. These are the readings. As we now going through with the experiment result, we found that NCA214, which is uh, belongs to class two, having uh, 15 features, uh, get the best accuracy rate and the detection rate in our uh, proposed model. Uh, by comparing with the other models, uh, which we have taken uh, uh, from the different research papers, as I uh, indicated here, these are the uh, you know, uh, references, uh, reference of <coughs> different research papers. Uh, we have gone through with these research papers and when we compared it with their uh, uh, techniques, we found that our technique is far better. As you can see, PCA plus VA, uh, the combination of PCA and VA is uh, get the 99.60 and uh, in this uh, paper, uh, the, uh, the researchers mentioned that they have taken <clears throat> 22 feature sets. So in that way, our feature set are uh, less than the <clears throat> compared model, uh, which is PCA plus uh, GA. We have taken only 15 uh, uh, features. And uh, by reducing the feature set, we uh, reduce the time to execution. And uh, accuracy is also uh, improved. So the conclusion is the proposed study removes the rated features from the standard necessary KDD 20% training data set. And before applying classification techniques, NC and uh, neural network classifier approach uh, characterize the system traffic as normal as an attack based on diminished list of the capabilities. These are the references, as I mentioned, some of uh, uh, in the experimental table with the other, here I'm mentioning all the references. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Pooja. I really appreciate you. Uh, even in this pandemic situation, you have suffered with COVID. Uh, it's, it's 
Mr. Miraki. Thank you so much for your valuable presentation. Thank you, sir. Can proceed with any of the queries. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. We'll go to the next presentation. So, is the sister and yes, sir. On world level analysis of the impact caused by the COVID 19 pandemic. Yes, Mr. Sister, you can start sharing the screen. Good afternoon, everyone. So, um, is my screen visible? Yes, sir. It's visible. Yes, sir. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my paper title is World Level Analysis of the Impact Caused by COVID 19 on Mental Health. So, I am Srishti Vashishta, and my co authors are my students, uh, Yukta Yadav and Yukti Agrawal. So, uh, this is a brief biography. So, uh, I've done my bachelor's uh, in information technology from, from a college. Uh, MSIT College uh, from uh, GGCIP University in Delhi. And uh, similarly, I have uh, received MTech degree from GGCIP University. I'm currently working in as, uh, as an assistant professor in computer science department at the North Cap University, Gurgaon. Uh, also pursuing PhD in IT department from Delhi Technological University. My area of interest include data mining, natural language processing, fuzzy logic, and machine learning. Uh, my students Yukta Yadav and Yukti Agarwal are, are currently pursuing BTEC in Computer Science Department. Uh, they are currently uh, in fourth semester. And they have a very good uh, hands-on on uh, Python language. So uh, coming on to my other abstract. So basically COVID-19 has impacted the lives of all people around the world. And uh, the trauma of being locked up uh, economic loss and social distancing, closure of workplaces, educational institutions, etc., has imparted, imparted negative thinking in the mindset of humans. So this uh, paper was written uh, uh, seeing the view, uh, the lockdown which was uh, which was there last year. But unfortunately, we didn't knew that uh, it will be repeated again. And currently, again, we are living the same phase that we were living last year. So that same feeling of uh, being locked up and you know, closure of uh, workplaces, etc. So that gives a negative thinking uh, in the mindset of humans. So in this paper, we have discussed how COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the mental health of individuals. So this all all, all of these effects has you know uh, been you know had a great impact on the mental health of these uh, of individuals. We have analyzed the most searched words related to mental health for seven countries. Canada, US, UK, Iran, Japan, South uh, America, South Korea, and Italy. So, a com and also a comparative analysis of searched words in the pre and the post COVID 19 era for Canada uh, has been done. And that indicates that the incremented surge is due to the fact the people are suffering from mental health issues like anxiety, stress, depression, etc. So, uh, Overall, uh, seeing the experimental setup of a paper, uh, our approach is basically based on the Google search terms. So words, as you all know, that they all you know, the words play a very important role in determining the, you know, the opinions, feelings, and sentiments, and the mental outlook of an individual. So in this paper, the focus is around the words. The words which are being searched by people that reflect the mental health concerns. Particularly, here the authors have examined which words were searched by the public before and after the uh, pandemic of COVID-19 and what impact it had on the people around the world. So particularly, we have focused on words which were being searched by people in different countries. The, uh, the search terms cover mental health, insomnia, anxiety, OCD, Obsessive compulsive disorder, depression, counseling, psychiatrist, uh, panic attack, etc. And these words had been the major exploration of the pandemic in the uh, in the areas of uh, following seven countries. Uh, this data set also contains information about Canada for the past four years. So, like from 2016 to 19, 
uh, what all words were being searched by the people and uh, related to mental health. So we can see that there is, we will see uh, later on that there is a rise of, uh, in these, uh, the search of these words after a pandemic. So we have applied a, a country-wise analysis where different growth search terms is compared over time. Uh, so for each country, we have done this analysis. Also, we have done a keyword analysis, which compares each country's trend, uh, trends rise, along with the comparison between the Canada pre and post COVID-19. So moving ahead to the results section, let us see what analysis has been done. The analysis for United States is deployed by combining all the data sets for the region of US over the period of 50 weeks. And in the, uh, in the following figure, uh, we will see that uh, the most searched term before being, being is uh, anxiety for that year. So we will see that anxiety particularly, so here you can see anxiety is a purple color. This has been the most searched. So here you can see anxiety is being most searched word. Then uh, the mental health and psychiatrists were sooner or later in that year. So after that, we can see that these words like mental health and psychiatrist this means people are worrying about the mental health. So green line, here you can see the mental health, a peak is there here. And as well as psychiatrists, so blue color also, you can see the peak, uh, they, they are very rising. So this means that people are looking for uh, a psychiatrist for dealing, uh, for dealing with their mental health issues. While uh, doing analysis uh, uh, for the United Kingdom, uh, we can say that uh, this figure uh, you know, gives an implementation. Again, we have done for the for the for the time period of fifty weeks, and this figure portrays how people had peeked through these terms. The most looked term was anxiety. Again, anxiety is the most peaked word. Then we have depression, OCD, and then psychiatrist had a minimal pattern. So here people were not looking for psychiatrists, but yes, they were being uh, dealing with anxiety, depression, and OCD. So let us see here again, anxiety, purple line, you can see the, it is like most searched. So this is a time print. This is the words being searched. So here you can see anxiety in the most search. And then depression. The depression is the green line. Again, just below the purple line is the green line. And this it depicts that uh, the people are searching for, like they are, they are feeling depressed. Uh, moving on to Italy. So here all the depression again has reached its peak. Uh, so this is again we have done for year 2020. We can see that depression has reached its peak. Whereas obsessive compulsive disorder, panic attack, mental health and counseling were at the highest in the end of the 2019. Whereas in 2020, these words were there. So insomnia, psychiatrist, and depression. So again, these words, as you can see, they are the highlighted words here. So you can see the top notch, psychiatrists are there. For so the gray color, you can see the depression is there. So this shows the trend of the people that they are you know, dealing with. Insomnia also, there is a high rise. You can see this black line. That the people are more, not uh, are deprived of sleeping, and here you can see this the peak here that for the insomnia you can see for the week for the, so this can be observed. Uh, again, in uh, we, if we compare for you know, Iran, we can see that anxiety had been there, anxiety and psychiatrists. Well, the curve for mental health was low. So here again, anxiety and uh, psychiatric. Exactly 10 minutes, you can uh, write a page. Yes, yes. So uh, then following for Japan also, you can see the trend is higher for, for these similar words. And for South Korea also. So overall picture shows that for different countries, uh, more or less the, uh, the words are like... Um, the, the top words which are being there are anxiety, depression, uh, which is being there, and psychiatrist. These words are the most searched words. 
Uh, now I just want to particularly focus on the post and pre Canada. So here we are doing an examination of the words uh, like in 2019 and in, to, in 2020. So in 2019, there was uh, no pandemic and afterwards there was a pandemic. So this uh, uh, in the graph, we can see the number of words have been, you know, there is a rise in the number of words searched for all these words for depression, anxiety and this. So this clearly indicates, this clearly indicates that people are suffering from mental health issues like anxiety, stress, depression, and we should focus on the solutions to decrease these health issues so that the people can be happy again and adapt to live with this virus. So finally, we can say that uh, we have you know, focused on the words, on the health of the individuals. And uh, the adverse effect of the pandemic can be observed by detecting an increased search for the words related to mental health. So we examined the top health uh, search terms and investigated their trend. And these trends exhibit that the mental crisis has drawn upon the people across the whole group over the course of these 50 weeks. Finally, uh, 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 this uh, basically picture concludes, this figure concludes the worldwide uh, the percentage of uh, words that is being searched. And the country wise analysis clearly states at the people. Okay, are. Time is completed. Please stop this issue. Yes, so this is okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, some chance can proceed with any queries or raise the queries in chat box. So, would like Come to call up. the would like to call the next participant, Ms. Rija Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Share the screen. Oh, okay, sir. Okay, sir. Sir, is it possible? Yes, yes, it's possible. You can proceed. Okay, okay, okay. A good afternoon. Uh, my name is Srija Esa, and I'm a research scholar at Amrita Vishwavidya Peter, Amrita Puri. First of all, let me thank ICACCT team for giving me an opportunity to present my work on this conference. So, today I'm going to present a work on the prediction of Parkinson's disease from voice signals using machine learning. The objective of this work is to predict Parkinson's disease from voice signals using traditional machine learning model like SBM and deep neural nets like CNN and LSTM. The contents of the presentation includes description, methods, results, conclusion, and references. So before getting the details of my work, I would like to give a brief introduction about the uh, neurological condition Parkinson's disease. As we all know, Parkinson's disease is a progressive neurological condition that affects the movement of an individual. So one of the factors affecting a PD is age. So most of these people develop the disease at the age of 60s, and about 5 to 10 percent people have early onset disease. And other factors are hereditary and environmental exposure to toxins. So basically what happens in Parkinson's disease? So Parkinson's disease occurs when the neurons in the basal ganglia responsible for movement get impact. These neurons produce a vital organic chemical called dopamine. Due to the depletion of these dopaminergic neurons or the dopamine neurons, less dopamine will be produced, resulting in the inhibition of the movement. And even the studies have revealed that uh, one of the reasons for the depletion or the destruction of the cells may be the deposit of Lewy body, which is the accumulation of a protein alpha synuclein. This is what's happening in Parkinson's disease. So coming to symptoms of Parkinson's disease, like sleep disturbance, off time, freezing diet, unilateral hand tremor, speech impairment, difficulty concentrating, rigidity, postural instability, difficulty swallowing. We are focusing on the symptom of speech impairment, which may result as a combination of motor deficit, like stoop posture and low facial expression, and non-motor deficits like memory problems, cognitive problems, and thinking problems. So in our work, we have taken the voice signals of the PD patients for doing the prediction. So the studies on these neurological conditions were fueled by the different techniques in the field of artificial intelligence, especially machine learning and deep learning have given a remarkable contribution in refining the diagnostic or accuracy of this diagnostic, diagnostic procedure. So, and this is the architecture of a proposed system where we extract the voice signal from the UCI machine learning repository 
and the clinically relevant features were extracted and dispatched into the classifiers for respective classifiers for classification. As I said earlier, we use a data set uh, that is audio signals from the UCA machine in repository. And uh, in the feature extraction, like uh, the voice recording as well as the clinically relevant features were extracted with the help of the feature representation methods like MEL frequency, sexual coefficient, FFCC, vocal fold features, and time frequency features. And some of the clinically relevant features are jitter, shimmer, HNR, NHR, et cetera, uh, which is being extracted and fed into the classifiers uh, for classification. And the machine learning algorithms that we used are uh, first one is a traditional machine learning model support vector machine, which is well known as a margin classifier and works well for low and high dimensional data. And so also uh, studies have proved that SVM is, uh, can handle the audio signals very easily. And next is a deep neural network like CNN, which is a prominent uh, deep learning network, which has its application in different fields like computer vision, then uh, speech processing, linguistics, etc. And here, uh, it, has, it, it has its application speech processing because the pooling layer in CNN can efficiently handle small frequency changes in voice signals. And it's the LSTM model, which is a type of RNN designed for the sequential data and is much more powerful than the traditional RNN architectures. So in our work, uh, you know, to take the advantage of both these models, we have combined the CNN and LSTM, and we could find that the CNN model helped in multi-level feature extraction, and LSTM model helped in interpretation and classification. And we have used a tenfold cross-validation to evaluate the model, and 80% of data had been taken for training and 20% for testing. And to avoid screening of the model or screening the result, we are sure that the train and test that contain the same personally distribution of data from each class. And the models were trained with RMS probe optimizer for 20 epochs with a learning rate of 0 0.001 and batch size of 128. And we could find that the computation model converged to a better accuracy of 85 percent in 20 epochs itself when compared to other models with relatively less model loss. Uh, these are the results. So the first graph is accuracy graph or the learning curve of CL. An LSTM model exhibiting an accuracy of 85 percentage. Second one is the LSTM model exhibiting an accuracy of 83 uh, percentage. Further, the first table is a confusion matrix of CN LSTM model, and we could observe that there's a notable confusion between the seven samples out of the total samples taken for testing. And second is our ROC curve. And uh, we also use the uh, modern valuation matrix like position recall and F1 measures. Uh, first table shows the precision measures of the CNLST model with other models, and second one is a recall measure with other models. And third one is F1 measures of CNLST with other models, and the last graph shows the overall activities of all the models being used in the paper. So I would like to conclude my session by uh, saying that we have successfully implemented the prediction of Parkinson's disease from voice signals uh, taken from the UCA machine repository. And it was observed that uh, by uh, extracting the relevant features and by combining the CNN LSTM classifiers, the prediction accuracy can be further enhanced. The references. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. So, or participants can raise the queries or raise the queries through chat box. Uh, sir, yes. uh, sir, shall I do next, sir? Uh, Nag Lakshmi here. Nag Lakshmi, uh, please wait. Uh, okay, sir. Both the, uh, the previous presenter when the start at the start of the time, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mister. Yes, uh, we will Excuse would like to call Mr. Ganesh Dinulkar on employee placement application. We would like to come Mr. Ganesh Dinulkar. Good afternoon, sir. Yes, start sharing the screen. Uh, sir, sir, excuse me. Uh, sir, the first session is over, no, sir? It's going to get over, no? Uh, because the previous people who had uh, presented so far, I mean the persons who have missed at the starting, are are going to present now. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, sir. Okay, I thought it it got over because the second session I have the first uh, presentation. Okay, yes, thank I mean, you, sir. Once, once it is uh, sir, 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 I'm Srija. Sir, I'm Srixian, Sir, my, I'm Srija. Can I quit my presentation? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Th thank you, sir. Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. So, Ganesh, can you share the screen? Sir, is it visible? 
yes so good afternoon sir our topic is developing service providing app for tata projects and the guide name is Or is it visible? Oh, oh your screen is still sharing. Yeah, now it yeah. is shared. Yes. Yeah, now it's visible. Okay. Now you can. Stop. So, so our abstract is maintaining uh, employees' payment record is one of the most important tasks in today's era. Most of the organization maintain it on hard copies, that is on pa paperwork. And when it comes to billing, it gets difficult to calculate each employee's payslip. As it is <clears throat> entered manually, let me. uh we have the chance of <clears throat> of some entries have been misplaced and uh, for a particular pay slip and have have some human errors such mistakes can be disadvantage to the employee and due to the lack of record maintenance it's hard for, it, it's hard for the company to explain the financial bills to the employees to overcome this problem we are going to develop an application pay, uh, pay slip management for employees to financial record in in this we are going to uh, going to develop an automated pay slip which uh, which will send pay, pay slip in a digital format to particular employee in such a way it will help to maintain the record of pay slip and avoid human errors <clears throat> it promises a correct pay slip entries on the time delivery of the <clears throat> pay slip in the digital format over the email whatsapp and we are trying to develop an application which sends the digital copy as a image to employees now every company has uh, every company uh, pays salary to its employees it it is a pro it's this procedure is done every month and record of the salary is kept on the hard copy uh, what the future use work of payment and salary uh, paying to its employee it's very important for the company therefore this work should be automated to uh, make process quick secure easy and reliable thus reliable system is required to handle the process automation of the pay slip system will reduce to the chances of error and max max the process of fast secure and reliable uh, procedure it helps the employee managing and manager uh, managing staff to concentrate on its other activities rather than concentrating on recording keeping in such manner it will help the company to utilize the resources it's it's a best particular company it can maintain the uh, uh, maintain its computerized records without redundant entries that means there should be no loss of data entries and respected authorities access the information anytime easily so major outcomes of this project will lead to easy employee enquiries details of uh, employee records financial incomes then salaries of the employees and employees detail not taken from uh, taken salary in a month it will also help to maintain a report of the various modules and record maintaining the distributed salary funds of the company so to generate the enquiry of employee on demand to print uh, uh, salary slip to uh, salary slip uh, sal <coughs> salary slip to make enquiry of salary to be paid for each grade employee to keep details of fund distribution to to make inquiry of various databases tables pay slip application financial aspects uh, of the employee salaries there are allowances and deduction it also shows out, outstanding benefit of pay slip application with easy implementation so description of our project is most of the Uh, companies that we are we are pro, uh, producing this app for a tata company so system will calculate salary tax and extra incomes of their employees to maintain the salary slip and tax papers it requires a lot of paperwork uh, we have developed a application which can overcome the human errors which saves times overall system will store the information over to 1000 to 2000 employees this is the data will be stored in a csv or excel file and this salary slip will be signed at the end of the month it will reduce the chances of miscalculation and less employee problems 
it will reduce the chances of miscalculation uh, the application will be user friendly flexible enough to adapt the need of the company the application will allow the authority to send the pay slip to the particular employee on the request it will be able to generate automatic salary slip and financial income reports so this is the uh, flow uh, design of our uh, app so in uh, in this diagram we can see that uh, employee uh, employee salary automation system the employee requests the salary where uh, it is uh, it is uh, requested to the management and then uh, it is issued report to, uh, the report is issue, issued to the management then they uh, then the data is uh, stored in the database and it is it is updated and uh, uh, we get the direct access uh, to the database through our app so the uh, co comparing with the existing existing technology payroll system uh, payroll system and our payslip app our payslip is easy to implement and can send pay, payslip at any time can operate from anywhere and a simple uh, user interface and it is very uh, less costly so conclusion so presented work on the payslip application is to develop an application which will uh, which will generate an automated payslip to reduce human errors so our so we are using android studio which is an emulator which is used for integrated development environment for android application it it uses uh, intel ij idea and uh, top classes powerful code editors of development tools android studio offers extra features that helps to enhance the productivity while building android apps it has a flexible uh, gradle based uh, build development system, which is a virtual environment for uh, developing an app, a fast and well uh, feature rich emulator to unique environment where we can develop application for all Android devices. It is also, it is also apply. It will also apply changes to push code and update those changes to your developing app without restarting your app. It, it, it also works with the code templates of uh, code templates and GitHub integration to help and build common application feature. It, it uses extensive tool testing debugger and uh, framework. So uh, this is the basic code file overview. So we are going to import a CSV file, which is, which is a Java code file, it converts the Excel file into CSV file for better data handling and easy manipulation of the data. Then this, uh, this CSV file or Excel file will be converted into, uh, into an image. This, uh, this uh, Java code will convert the CSV file into a digital copy of a uh, digital copy format. That is the image format, which is going to use for sending particular employee, uh, employee as per the re request. Then employee activity, the Java code uh, uh, we are using in this is will provide data to draw Java image to convert from text to image. It fetch, uh, fetches the data from CSV file. And in uh, Payslip Java, the Java code file combines the above three modules, which are CSV Java, a draw image and employee activity modules to use as a one uh, as as one and for final work of the application and we are also using uh, json api which uh, which is an open source uh, online api server which is used to integrate regular api and responses to uh, regular applications uh, thank you sir thank you so much mr ganesh i would like to call uh, the next participant is uh, maralak Yes, I yes, 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 I'm going to present the project on uh, intelligent security monitoring system with video based face recognition. Uh, first, let's see the introduction of the project. Uh, security is not the absence of danger, but the presence of God, no matter what the danger is. Today's world is facing with major security issues. Consequently, we need several specially trained personnel for surveillance to attain the desired level of security. These personnel as human beings may commit mistakes that might affect the level of security. Hence, an intelligent video retrieval system which integrates video processing 
artificial intelligence that greatly increases the efficiency and accuracy in security monitoring. The security of any organization can be enhanced using face recognition also. Face recognition is no longer only an application for high risk location, but also a growing number of businesses realize that the ability to identify and recognize specific individuals can help to improve customer service and to serve as a proactive way of protecting their assets. Thus, this versatile nature of facial recognition makes it a preferred choice for added security. So objective of our project to design and develop an efficient face recognition system to detect and recognize faces accurately from a video using Violagen's algorithm for face detection and CNN model by extracting the facial features and that would bring a great contribution in social stability. Abstract. Uh, here, the areas with large flow of people, like airports, border control areas, may have frequent emergencies, which would require a high degree of security. While the security endowed in those conditions is so traditionally, and so the monitoring is very difficult to provide with the high rate of security. And also, the huge video data brings about a difficulty in video analysis, which is hard to overcome by manpower. An intelligent video retrieval technology has become a crucial part of video monitoring and face recognition has been proven very effective in security critical environment. Hence, this system has been developed to recognize the faces of suspect with violence algorithm uh, and which would be capable of identifying a person from a video frame. This system also applies CNN to process the image information from the video to verify the person. The faces in the video in real time has been extracted, recorded, and with the use of a CNN model, with facial images has been detected and recognized to effectively assist the security personnel in dealing with the crisis. So let me explain about the proposed system. Here, the uh, when we give an input video, the frame from the in given input video has been extracted and it will be sent to the face detector. Generally, the system consists of uh, two parts, face detection and face recognition. Face detection is the process of uh, identifying the facial region uh, in a video or, or either from an image, while recognition is of uh, verifying the uh, face of the individual. So with this network, the face is being recognized from the input video. So this is our system architecture. So when an input video is given to the system, the video gets fragmented and it would be given to the face detector. Face detector is actually built using Viologen's algorithm. Here, the, these are the four parts of Viologen's algorithm. Then the detector frames uh, need to be recognized uh, before uh, given to recognition. It has been pre-processed. Uh, the fa uh, face region has been cropped and it has been converted to grayscale and the pixel values have get uh, normalized. Then uh, in face recognition, the features of the uh, detected frames would be compared with the features of the images that have been placed in the database. So that uh, for that feature comparison, a CNN model has been developed. Uh, then this would give an uh, image which has uh, get recognized. Uh, so the first module is video fragmentation. So here, a main purpose of video fragmentation is to capture a frame from the input video and to provide the frames to a face detection framework uh, since it is impossible to identify faces directly in a video. As a result, when a video is given to the system, it gets portioned into uh, frames and a key frame would be extracted. Key frames uh, or faces here. Uh, so, and it would be given to the face detection framework. So, this is the uh, here. The uh, image for face uh, video fragmentation has been here. We have given a video of 10 seconds, uh, 300 frames have been extracted. So next comes face detection. Here the face region is detected from video frames uh, using Viologen's algorithm. To detect facial region, the model has been established where features have been extracted. Face region would be detected by referring to the features being extracted in the model. So while it is for them, it uh, actually consists of four parts, hard like features, integral image, adaboost training and cascade uh, classifier. Uh, here, the, here we have been using a CBCL uh, database. Uh, 
the harley features have been accepted for those images and integral image has been calculated then with these features the uh, training has been done and class uh, using a cascade classifier the facial images has been classified next comes uh, pre processing of a frame actually uh, when we are detecting the face from the uh, video frame we are in need of only the face region hence we are uh, hence uh, pre processing comes into picture here here the uh, detected frames has first be con converted into grayscale and from the grayscale frames the face region has been cropped then the images in order to ensure the images have same size uniform aspect ratio has been uh, given here then the uh, in order to normalize the pixels over the images uh, normalization has been done then comes the cnn training the suspect images has been used to train the cnn model in order to recognize the suspect in the video in the images the facial features such as eyes nose mouth is detected and learned using cnn which are the keys to distinguish each face different cnn layers has been built uh, like uh, pooling layers in order to uh, read the features of the face and the model has been built then in order to uh, get the accuracy and the overall performance of the model confusion matrix has been generated next comes face recognition here the uh, comparison of features between the pre-processed frame and the images that are placed in the database has been done so uh, the comparison is uh, based on cosine similarity the advantage of using cosine similarity is that it doesn't depend on the size of the image this then identify a match with the exact feature in the provided database and returns the image which is being matched along with the label of the image if the image is not matched then it would show the label as an unknown so these were the social impact so uh, this system would bring in better uh, improvement in security and then the offenders can be identified manpower can be reduced in surveillance which would uh, increase the security in monitoring then there would come uh, a satisfaction in the side of uh, customers so a conclusion with the rapid development of uh, video monitoring which plays a cr crucial part in society for detecting crime in public areas people put forward higher requirements on safety reliability of identification detection and accuracy hence uh, this system has uh, this system has bring in uh, better <coughs> this system has bring in better security and enhanced uh, social stability these were the differences we have referred thank you thank you so much mr nagalakshmi and uh, with this we have completed the session one conference session thank one you. participants as well i would like to proceed with the technical two participants prior to that uh, from the college side i would request to introduce our session chairs. Good afternoon, Anand. Yes. For tech, sir, shall I continue? Yes, please. Yeah, for technical session two, the uh, session chairs are Dr. Lakshmi Narayanan, Associate Professor, EC Department from Francis Xavier Engineering College, and Professor Dr. Bupesh Kumar, Faculty, CSC from Arbam Mensch University. Introduction, introduction to the uh, session chats. Dr. K. Lakshmi Narayanan is working as an as an associate professor in Francis Xavier Engineering College, Tirunelveli. He did his research in VLSI based image processing from St. Peter's University. He has about 10 years of teaching experience and two years of industrial experience. And he is an EMC certified data science associate. He is a member of various professional bodies and uh, organized various funded workshops and seminars. He has a wide publication in high impact journals in the area of artificial intelligence, deep learning and communication, image processing and the internet of things. He has published more than eight patents. He has hosted AACT sponsored STPP and organizes various workshops for faculties and students. His research 
may interest include artificial intelligence, deep learning, image processing, and Internet of Things. Presently, he is a reviewer of various publishers such as IPP Access, Springer, IOS Press, and for various Scopus Index conferences. He is also a member of IPP, CSP, and ISI. Welcome, sir. From IFPRP, I welcome both the session chairs, Dr. Lakshmi Narayan and Dr. Bhupesh Kumar, sir. So with this, we will start with the technical session part two, which... So, yes, ma'am, you want to proceed? No, 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 no sir. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I would like to call the first participant, Mr. Sharon Krista, on and uh, four others on the, top, on the topic of private cloud using Raspberry Pi network. Mr. Sharon Krista. Hi, uh, am I visible? Yes, yeah. your presentation yeah, is visible. Yes. Uh, but I am, uh, just a minute, I am not able to see. Thank you, Daniel, ma'am. I uh, was uh, facing a small... Uh... Yeah, okay. Uh, I think I can, I can present now. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, very good afternoon to one and all. Uh, so uh, I'm Dr. Sharon. Uh, this is a project uh, that uh, was done by my students. So they are having a workshop. That is why they are not uh, you know, available now. Uh, so I'll do the presentation. So basically, um, you know, um, okay, uh, so this is my uh, brief biography. So I'm working as a faculty in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, RV Institute of Technology. Uh, so uh, our uh, topic today uh, is private cloud containerization using Raspberry Pi network. So um, why we uh, started with the project is because, you know, basically the students who want to learn about cloud or how to deploy various applications in cloud, they need to understand, uh, you know, the basic, uh, how the deployment happens and all, they need to understand. But the currently available open source systems and all uh, basically targets the enterprises. Okay, basically it tar targets the you know the service providers. So it is not uh, you know feasible uh, to actually use that and uh, you know the, uh, by the students to learn. Or basically, you know, if any any you know any um, developers who want to start learning, you know, they cannot afford to maintain their own cloud. Uh, also, to have a technical knowledge and all, it is pretty difficult. That is why uh, we thought, okay, you know, uh, why not uh, we uh, do something about it so that, you know, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the uh, juniors, uh, their juniors can also uh, learn from this and, uh, you know, can work on this and uh, build on this, whatever the project that they have done. So that was the whole point. So basically, you know, uh, the, the project, what in this project, what we did is uh, we took a Raspberry Pi device and we spawned uh, cloud servers on demand uh, uh, using the Raspberry Pi device. So this, uh, you know, uh, basically, so they build a pocket cloud. Uh, like you know they, we can they can carry it like that so raspberry pi devices basically support docker and kubernetes so you know uh, this is used to orchestrate the cloud containers so this is the brief of the work that we have done uh, so you know coming to a brief description of um Sure. Uh, just a minute. Uh, 
um, can i uh, start presenting uh, you know in the next uh, next slot i'm sorry because you know um, some network i'll use another network connection yes ma'am but uh, we will we will um, we will uh, complete with the sessions and then we can make it as a last presentation so meanwhile you kindly uh, i hope yeah, it is uh, visible now ma'am okay so your presentation yeah. is visible for us kindly proceed yeah yeah okay fine so basically you know what we did is um um okay so what we did is uh, you know basically raspberry pi is a single board de device um, so uh, you know its uh, processor is arm processor okay uh, so basically you know this is used um, uh, you know to teach basic uh, you know uh, you know basic uh, you know uh, you know uh, iot based applications and all okay uh, so uh yeah and uh, now coming to containers so containers are uh, like uh, you know it is a basically a software uh, um, that we can use uh, you know uh, that we can use to uh, you know deploy deploy various applications so basically you know it is lightweight and it is more efficient whereas docker you know it is also a container platform you know where you know we will be able to if we want to work with multiple machines then we will be able to use this okay so uh, the methodology that we followed here is you know um, uh, so uh, you know this uh, first we uh, you know we had to set up a static ip because we are actually you know um, uh we are um, uh, this uh, yeah basically we use static ip because you know we'll be using for the for the application setting up of applications and all we'll be using um static ip so we set it up using the libvirt uh, you know um, uh, so basically uh, this uh, you know it it basically helps us in managing the uh, virtualization platform further we install docker containers and uh, you know um, uh, and then uh, you know to automate the entire process you know the further scripting and all is done and then a command command line interface was used uh, to implement the web interface so that that is what we did basically uh, so the basic yeah so the basic implementation is you know basic uh, initially we installed the raspberry pi operating system in the uh, in a in a laptop and then you know uh, as i told we use the libvirt uh, and uh, we assigned static ip to the raspberry pi devices and various laptops that we used in the setup and then we deployed the uh, ssh uh, so ssh keys and all are deployed uh, so that is we installed basically the cloud stack you know, and uh, on demand uh, virtual machines uh, so that we can spawn on demand virtual machines then uh, once this is done then uh, you know parallelly we install the cloud stack and you know the docker engine so basically you know um, uh, yeah uh, so basically uh, uh, this this was deployed and uh, then you know the system was uh, tested so uh, we for, um, uh, so you know on uh, we set up the applications in the Uh, in this, uh, on top of this, this is the process that we followed, and uh, this is the basic uh, testing um, uh, that we performed uh, to see if the application is working uh, properly or not, and all. So, yeah. Uh, so this is the uh, application that um, basically we. uh you know deployed, and this is the workload load that is there on the. Uh, uh docker uh, uh that was also monitored uh, to see how much you know um, load that it can take so this is what uh, we did but uh, you know um, so basically what we did was uh, you know uh, we try to overcome the uh, 
uh, overcome uh, the uh, problems that we faced uh, in in learning cloud that hands on cloud uh, in um, uh, you know so basically what we did we uh, you know spawn uh, various nodes uh, using uh, docker and uh, kubernetes so that is ex that is what we did so this is all about the work that we did uh, so basically now uh, we need uh, uh, what we are planning to do is you no know, we should be able to share on your presentation time is completed please by okay oh, so basically you know uh, a single system so the future work what we are planning to do is you know um, we are planning to uh, you know build a sing uh, one stop solution for virtualization and containerization thank you thank you so much ms shara i would like to uh, proceed with session chairs for the their own raise any queries they can raise them please I would like to call the next presenter, Dr. Prakash Vadapalli, improving on the topic of improving the power issues of a grid using Strata Pump. Prakash Vadapalli. Yeah. Okay, sir. Uh, can uh, other one can stop the share screening? Stop already. You can share the screen. Am I able to share? Yes, you can. My screen is visible. No, not yet. It is visible. Oh, Mr. Professor, it's not visible. It's not visible. Just a minute. Now it's okay, sir. No, sir, it's not visible. You haven't shared it yet. Yeah, I shared my yes, screen. No, to share. Yes, we shared. Proceed the screen. You can proceed. Thank Just a minute. It is visible, sir. Yes. Hello, it is visible. Yes, sir. It is visible. Yes, sir. It is visible, sir. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, myself, Dr. V. Prakash. I'm the from I'm from the Department of Triple E, Kit uh, Kagutha Institute of Technology and Science, Varangal. It is in the Telangana district. So the district name is Telangana. So my topic is improving the power issues of a grid using Statcom. So actually, the concept which is behind uh, doing this research work is how to mitigate how to compensate the different power quality issues as a customer everyone we want the good quality of power why because everyone we are forced to use different types of modern power electronic converter devices either maybe our computers laptops either it based any of the devices or maybe any any of the motors which is uh, equipped with the latest power converters so slowly the the devices which are in the nature of non linear non linear in nature so as we as we are using the load is which is of combination of linear and non linear so that there might be some power quality issues arises in the in the system so which may affects the grid so this is uh, my topic so based on by using statcom and by using uh, abc to dq0 control algorithm we can uh, compensate the power quality issues so this is uh, myself uh, uh, Prakash, Dr. V. Prakash, I am from the past 21 years, I am in the teaching field. I worked as an assistant associate and uh, worked as a principal uh, for the different uh, colleges. And right now I am working in Kids Varangal. So my research interests are like uh, power quality integration and UPIC VC and uh, electric vehicles, distributed generation and renewable energy sources and integration of the distribution distributed sources. So the, that's what I, I, I mentioned. The main focus on the topic is in order to mitigate the power quality issues, how Statcom will work, which may not impact the grid. So the work is completely 
in uh, concentrating on by using distributed energy sources like uh, uh, wind energy source as well as photovoltaic source so in order to by using these two sources how to mitigate the power quality issues as well as how to balance the active and reactive power in the system why because these powers are very very much important in order to maintain in order to balance the system in order to balance the given system so that's why so these are very very important and uh, by using statcom by using statcom we can use we can uh, uh, mitigate from medium to high voltages and moreover by using the statcom we can try to uh, try to uh, work we have done uh, in this and here this is the main circuit of the statcom so we have the uh, control voltage the source volt and like the same load part and which we have assumed that we are connected a non linear load and by using renewable energy sources here i considered wind and photovoltaic sources so the control algorithm which i've used here is sr controllers static reference uh, synchronous reference frame control algorithm so this control algorithm is used is used in order to uh, convert the abc frame quantities either the voltages vsca vsv vbc like the voltages at the source side and similarly the source current isc isv isc so we are sending the quantities from the abc to dq dq0 stationary frame so by sending these variables so we are using the pulse transformation to inverse pulse transformation so by using these variables we are controlling the voltages and also we are using hysteresis current controller it's a controller which which will have an hysteresis band so it will control the current values how much it has to be depends on the control algorithm depends on the specified values it is to be given and based on those issues i worked here and this is my uh, simulation diagram actually it is a very big diagram when i compressed it comes to a like a, it is compact size it may not looking properly and this is a simulation of statcom by using a wind energy source and similarly uh these are the simulation results my concentration is i want to use two case studies when i am using the battery load as a load i want to use as a battery when i am using the battery as a load so if i run the given system what exactly the source voltage source currents and injecting currents and similarly how the power factor which is improving in the different cases so this is the battery so uh when i am using the load as a battery these are the source voltage load voltages uh source current load currents and compensating currents compensating currents are nothing but injecting currents into the grid so finally i have the grid voltages that is maintaining constant as in the fourth uh, row it is showing that the grid voltages so here it is showing that so where almost the current and voltages are even though i am using a non linear load so here the current and voltages are almost maintaining in the in, in line so we can say that the power factor the power factor is almost improved and and in order to reduce the total harmonic distortion i use uh, pv also in that so these uh, two sources wind energy source as well as pv the, these are acting like backup sources one is auxiliary other one is uh, extra extra backup source so this will try to reduce the total harmonic distortion why because every device every non linear device which will try to induce introduce the harmonic components into the system so slowly slowly it will it will spoil the functioning of that particular equipment and slowly it, it spoils the network also so as we are in the distribution network all as we are customers so myself i am a customer like we are all the customers we are utilizing we are utilizing the source either single phase or pre phase voltages currents so we don't want any sudden impacts sudden uh, jerks sudden uh, uh, harmonics into the system so that's why we are connecting uh, to these two sources into grid so it will try to reduce the total harmonic distortion i got it is 2.48 h and in the part of as a part of a 50 analysis so in order to create a disturbance i use a circuit breaker here uh, in the phase a i opened the i created a disturbance in the circuit so when i created disturbance in the circuit and uh, when i measured the total harmonic distortion uh, by maintaining the constant voltage in the grid i got it is 7.88 value 8% similarly i am using the other source as pv energy pv energy has other other thing and here also i maintain almost constant voltages and sinusoidal voltages at at the 
at, at the grid side. And similarly, see here, this is an active and reactive power composition, active and reactive powers which are available. So in order to maintain the power factor, definitely we need to maintain the reactive currents as well as reactive powers. So that's why it plays very, very important in order to maintain uh, reactive Dr. power. Uh, Dr. Prakash, uh... These two are very, very important. So my conclusion is, so here I'm using the STATCOM is a, one of the custom power device, which will use to uh, compensate all the PQ problems by using these sources. And similarly, which is using uh, mitigating all the either load, we can also use for uh, current load, load unbalancing, power factor improvement and re reduction of total harmonics into the system. So th this can be very, very use useful as uh, the STATCOM can, will be worked as a stabilizer as per the IEEE standards. The simulation results, which are also already showing that performance of the STATCOM uh, has been uh, satisfactory by improving. Means here, my control algorithm, which is very, very much satisfied uh, by mitigate, in, in mitigating the issues, it is working fine. And slowly, and STATCOM control algorithm is capable of correcting power factor. That's what we have seen. So power factor, which almost becomes unity, almost in the same line, and in, in supplying the currents, the compensating currents, so that uh, it is tried to regulate it, means the voltage regulation is very, very uh, less, means uh, the percentage of regulation is very less, and it is correcting the voltage profiles at PCC. It's a point of common coupling where all the loads can be connected by using uh, PV systems. And I got all these uh, THD values, uh, 2.4 are these values. I got the source currents, which is uh, should be less than 5%. I got all the values as per the standard IEEE 519 standards. So thank you. These are the references I used uh, for carrying out this work. And thank you very much. I think just in closing with any queries or raise the queries yeah. through the chat box. So we would like to call the next participant. So Patel, you can uh, stop sharing the screen. So we'd like to call the next Yeah, just a minute, just a minute. Ati Savla and Sahil Jaiswal. On yes, sir. extractive text image summarization and yes, Mr. Pratik, start sharing the screen. Uh, is my screen visible? Yeah, is yes. the presentation visible? Yes, visible. Yes, sir. It is visible. Eight minutes, kindly proceed. Okay. Now, can you see my presentation now? It's not Hello. Uh, no, no, sir, it is not available. Yes, is it available now? Just a minute. Yes, it is available. Okay. So my topic is extractive text summarization in Hindi language. Me and my friend, like Sahil Jaiswal, we are from final year students from SRM University. And we have made this project under the guide, Dr. G. Manju. She has done a PhD from Anna University and she has 20 years of experience in the education field. Uh, so motivation is from like um, internet nowadays is, has a vast amount of data and we cannot go through all the data by ourselves. So if we just try to Google computer science, we get these short summaries under these Article titles, which you can see here in the example. So the sum, what is summarization? The summary is basically the that contains significant portion of information from the original text or multiple texts. Uh, summaries can be classified into two types, extractive and abstractive. Extractive summaries are the ones in which the summary is has the sentences from the original text an abstractive summary has the summary has paraphrasing of the original text yes here is an example of abstractive summary so our abstract so we have we are trying to develop a system to create summary from the news articles and the images present in it basically since images contain a lot of useful data, which is sometimes lost during summarization, 
we have tried to develop a data set of about 55000 hindi news articles from uh, the dainik bhaskar news website and we have manually created the testing data set of 200 articles from the hindi knowledge expert so the challenges in the text summarization are the various textual formats since like text data is available in multiple places like blog articles and the captions of different images and all the notebooks like all these data is different types and the amount of data yeah we have a lot of articles being published every day and there is no standard summary like summary is dependent on person to person so the proposed method we have tried to stick to the news domain data set for our project and news is structured and news has a structured format and it is very diverse we try to collect all the different categories of news like international national and business etc we had to make our own evaluation data set for the summaries this is our model architecture so we have two different parts one is sentence feature extraction and one is image feature extraction for first we try to get uh, the text from the article and remove stop words and punctuation from the text and we do the pos tagging of all the sentences present like part of speech tagging and we score these sentences based on the presence of verb which is one of the text features which we are considering for final summarization we also match the similarity of sentences or pres present in the article to the headline as well and finally for images we do the image pre processing by resizing and get the image embeddings so like we get the word embeddings from image images and then score the sentences based on the similarity of that image to other sentences and finally we combine all the features scores and return the top n ranked sentences these are some of the stop words in hindi language which we use and like which we remove in the part of pre processing uh, so sentence feature extraction we start with pre processing and then we get the word embeddings of those sentences do the pos tagging and finally we calculate the frequency of the words occurring in the headline and try to match every sentence with the headline this is also another feature used in sentence feature extraction and for image feature extraction here are the like, best belu scores for our model like belu is one of the evaluation technique so for images we try to train a machine learning algorithm like vgg16 and resnet15 on a hindi version of flickr 8k data set like flickr 8k is a data set which has 8000 images and the captions in english language we had google translation running on it for converting those english captions into hindi to get us the hindi word embeddings now finally we get those cosine similarity scores to the images from the article sentences and, and in the end we combine all the scores multiply them with their respective weights and get the top end sentences here is an example of a summary like the main article is presented over here and this was the image in that article and we have this file line summary generated from it as you can see the model has maintained the similarity like try to condense the article and it also has kept the numbers which were in english format in the data and kept it similar yeah so here are some of the results like with these are the image encoder results of hindi captioning so we decided that vgg16 encoder with uh, 128 layers in the final uh, model was the best result among the things which we tried and here is our plot of a uh, rogue metric rogue evaluation metric it, it is an evaluation metric for this text summarization it matches the text similarity between the testing and the predicted summaries uh, so in conclusion our text image summaries a proposed feature extraction technique to generate summaries for hindi language we have 
achieved good results in comparison to summaries which we manually extracted and also we realized that there is very less done in the field of hindi text summarization since we had to extract our own data set from the daini baskar news website and we the proposed method can be used in various nlp applications like question answering system cross domain summarization and so on thank you thank you so much for your presentation so since i can proceed with any queries or raise the queries in the chat box yes uh, uh, the presenter has uh, and their uh, yes. project well uh, in, uh, in uh, most of the slides i can see that uh, uh, you have done uh, many extractions do you follow any algorithms for those extraction that is my first no question. sir we try to find features on our own like the cosine similarity of sentences to the headline and then similarity to the images present in the article and then verb extraction like we found out that the amount of verbs in a sentence does matter in the extractive summary and also the amount of similarity between the, all the sentences in the article itself so we have not used any already present uh, methods for the summarization part but we did use transfer learning on vgg16 model for the image feature extraction what's my second question is there any uh... Uh, uh, statistics for uh, uh, using this VGG, CNN VGG. Uh, yes, I had uh, the result. Wait, table. I'll present my screen again. Yeah. So here is the scores for the VGG image encoder with different number of layers and neurons in the final layer, which was the transfer learning part. so this is like the highest score was about 5.555 which is pretty good like high the current state of the art results are about 0.6 so we went with this vgg16 marked in red color thank you yes thank you thank you sir so much I would like to call the next presenter, Pratik Savala and Sahid Jaiswal. Next, I have to text him each. I'm sorry. Sir, uh, we just presented. Absolutely, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, for the confusion, I would like to call the next presenter, A. Supa Lakshmi and M. Revathi, on multi-layer enhanced production algorithm for multiple attacks and wireless sensor detection. A. Supa Lakshmi and M. Revathi. Name the person who will be. क्वालिटी Is it visible? Yes, it's visible. You can start proceeding. Yeah. Time is eight. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, today we are making a conference presentation on the project, our final project. Me, our authors are pay, uh, our project authors are Sampit, Karthik, and Prasanna. We are finally students. We are studying in Hindustan University, Hindustan University, Chennai. And our co-authors or our uh, guides, Sri Bharti Ma'am and Angela and Geetan Ma'am, and our project is determining the quality and efficiency of the fridge using machine learning. The the main aim of our project is to determine the quality of a given food for apple and mango, whether it's a good quality, bad quality, or worst quality. Here we using uh, convolutional neural network uh, concept, and by and extracting features like size and color, um, by extra by using these features. We did uh, with the help of convolutional neural network. We determine the uh, output of the output. 
and here we are using classification the main aim of our project is to build a machine learning model so uh, which help, which tells quality and a number of days it will be fresh uh, fruits for like apple and mango uh, here we using here we are collecting data sets from the uh, google this data set consists of uh, three categories good quality bad quality and worst quality for each uh, fruit so basically for two fruits we have a total six classes of data sets and we will pre process and we will create a model a uh, proposed method our proposed uh, here we discuss about proposed method and our proposed method is to determine the quality of a fruit uh, for apple and mango here we using data sets uh, which consist of six classes Uh, of two fruits, good quality, bad quality, and worst quality. Here we are using the algorithm CNN algorithm, which is known as a convolutional neural network, which is a concept of deep deep learning and extracting features like color and surface to determine the fruit and quality. Uh, this is a flow diagram of our uh, system. Once we give, once when the input image is given, it will be, be, be the data preprocessing starts. this data preprocessing in the data preprocessing you will uh, change the image dimensions into 224 to 224 and remove the extract noise then we will train the data by using cnn algorithm uh, fully connected layer we will classify the image into good quality bad quality and worst quality this is a system architecture as you can see it in data collection once once the data set is collected we will uh, do the data separation here we use here we contributing 24% of data set to Training and twenty five percent for testing, and other the other main process which we are doing in the data set data data processing is data augmentation, which we will see in further slides. And here, uh, while uh, training the model, we are giving here twenty to four uh, twenty to twenty epochs. What these epochs do? These epochs will tell us like how many times the data set has to be uh, learned learned by the model learned by the model to learn the features. This is model description. the first model in our uh, project is data set here we are data here we are taking the colorful images color images from the google which consist of the uh, rgb color values of three channel and contributing 75% of uh, data set to the training and 25% of to the data set uh, testing data set and next and the next comes data pre processing what in the pre processing in the pre processing we will try to do two two processes in the first process we will try to resize the image Uh, of the given input image in the data sets into 224 to 224 dimension and in the next uh, the data pre processing image uh, process we'll try to convert the given image into array of values as we know that the computer system will identify the image by the array of values so in the second pre processing process we will try to convert the given image into array of values uh, between the data pre processing we will So we will do a method called data augmentation. What this data data augmentation will do? This data augmentation will try to take a in one input image from the data set and try to create a ten to twenty copy images of that given image by zooming it, by zooming out, by applying horizontal flip, by applying uh, cropping and rot um, ro rotation process. This you can we can apply this data augmentation process by using uh, deep learning library. and the image data center class i will show you the images as you can see in the slide uh, these are the images which we derived from the single image and copy create of another images by zooming in by zooming out and by cropping and by changing horizon when the data augmentation process is comes will come to the training model this is uh, here we using vgg16 architecture which is a concept with a concept of a, uh, comes under cnn what vgg16 architecture consists of it consists of five hidden layers In the first hidden layer, we consist of two convolution layer, one pooling layer. In the second um, hidden uh, hidden layer, it consists of two convolution layer and one pooling layer. And the third convolution layer, it consists of three convolution layers and one pooling layer. As it follows, and at last, we consist of a three dense layer, which helps us, which helps in classifying the image. Now I will talk through every hidden uh, hidden layer. What is convolution layer? The first first layer in the convolution layer, uh, seen in our text, which is sixteen is convolution layer. Uh, once we input the image into the system, the image will will be the input for the convolution layer. What this convolution will layer help uh, help us to do is it's try to extract the features from the given image. This uh, features can be a detecting edges or a uh, 
finding an object in image as we need to find a true tom which object in a given image we will try to we are we using convolution layer which help us to extract the features here the, the features which we are extracting is edges how do we extract these edges we use a kernel this kernel is a 22 uh, 22 4 matrix which we upload on the rf values of in, given input, input image as as in the figure as you can show that as we are here, here we are applying three into three kernel on a given uh, array values which uh, give you an array values of the input image and we are decreasing the main uh, use of the convolution layer is to decrease the feature map so that which is easy for the computation process the next uh, point is rectified linear unit this rectified linear uh, unit is a, a non linear function which help us to introduce non linearity in the network basically what this rectified linear activation will do it will try to convert uh, negative values uh, into the zeros as we cannot process the image with the with consist of a negative values so we will try to convert this negative values into zeros and then comes max pooling layer what is max pooling layer will do is again try to convert decrease the feature map which is uh, which is so that we can easily compute and find the edges and features in the map in the features in the given image so i can show in the image so this is how the max pooling layer works from the given input, input image values we will try to apply a uh, kernel which consists of 22 max pool size and for each uh, kernel we will try to take a maximum value so as you can see in the figure 29 15 0 100 and that we are taking 100 value so the main use of this max pooling layer is to decrease the feature map and we'll interrupt your eight minutes time is completed okay so okay, okay i just give me one minute i will try to conclude it, it's completed almost okay uh, all this layers before hidden layers are is useful for the feature extraction in the fully connected layer we will try to classify the image this fully connected layer will get the uh, all the information from the previous layers and here we apply sophisticated gradient algorithm and adam algorithm and try to classify the given image as a good quality bad quality and worst quality user interface we are using here html uh, css and java and react js these are the scan, uh, sample screenshots of our dataset and this is our gui uh, basically website which is developed using html css and react js and this is configuration matrix about it. as you can see the, the 59 and uh, uh, apple good images it uh, correctly predict 59 and apple good the 55 apple medium images it correctly predict it, it is apple medium fault thank you Can you please request and process the queries or raise the queries which I box? Even participants can raise the queries to the chat box. Sorry, sir, I can't hear you. Your voice is too low. Could you speak low? Yes. Session chairs can raise any queries or participants can also raise the queries. Thank you so much, Mr. Sundari. I would like to call the next presenter. What is the amount of uh, data set you have uh, utilized here? Yeah. First, firstly, we have taken uh, 10, 10 to 15 images for each class. Then we apply data augmentation. So once data augmentation is applied, we could increase. Suppose for Apple Good, we have taken three images first, two images first. We apply data augmentation so that these two images are extended up to 300 images. So it like 400 to 300 images for each class. So six classes, approximately 500 images. But for these fruits, uh, data sets are available in the online. No, uh, we can upload as many number of uh, data sets for this uh, fruit classification. No. Why do you go for uh, data augmentation, sir? It's like a learning. No, we never done a data augmentation process, or it's like a new thing for us to implement. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Like to call the next presenter, Ms. Priyanka. Yes, on filtering of unsolicited email using classifiers, Ms. Priyanka. Ms. Priyanka. We have to call the next participant, Dr. Prakash Vadapalli, on solar power generation system with a seven-level inverter. Dr. Prakash Vadapalli. So, Prakash. Yes, sir. Your screen is visible. Yeah, just a minute, sir. Start presenting. Your time is. It is visible now. 
yes sir myself dr v prakash uh, i given my uh, introduction just before this presentation so my topic is solar power generation system with a seven level inverter so the the basic uh, intention of uh, doing this work is so by uh, converting converting a three level to seven level so this composed of the circuit completely composed of a dc dc power converter with a new seven level inverter dc dc power converter integrates the converter and as a transformer to convert to convert the output voltage of its, of the solar array into two independent uh, voltage sources with uh, whichever you want the relation you want to draw for multiple relationships so here it is consisting of a capacitor selection circuit which consisting of which converts the two output voltage sources dc dc power converter into a three level dc voltage and also the full bridge power converter further converts into a three level to seven so in while converting the to seven level the produced output voltage is sinusoidal or not so for that we have got so here this is the basic simulation diagram for a pv array with dc dc converter and here uh this is a solar panel model actually we have used two solar panels for that we have checked whether in the transient conditions whether it is maintaining almost constant value or not so the purpose of dc dc converter is to maintain to maintain the, the voltage even though the voltage the input voltage is less so it will try to boost the voltage to the required voltage for, uh, for the given system so here we have used uh, the pvrs along with the dc so the resonance at the condition from zero to one second so almost the it is maybe the the moment will be it is uh, uh what we can say the value it will be very accelerated and uh, transient time is almost from 1.5 seconds to almost 9 seconds is almost maintaining constant even if this is the panel one and this is the panel two also here at the beginning it's very transient after it is being uh a short period of time is maintaining constant value even we can do also so here it is we have uh, tried to draw uh, for the v characteristics it is almost maintaining the same. it is uh, unique for even for the panel one and panel two so see here it is uh, the k signal and the sinusoidal signal so here it is uh, we have considered why because if you consider an inductive load or capacity load it will be a problem for uh, generating the voltages it may be may not maintaining at that much constant so here if you consider the rl load the output voltage with the rl load see here the carrier signal and uh, the given voltages so here in both the, both the cases almost it is stepped one but almost maintaining sign this is what the work we have done actually the equations and all will takes uh, very uh, lengthy that's why i have not uh, put into this slides but my conclusion is so actually in order to reduce the losses the switching losses so we we have we can use we, we can use this type of system and here we got the maximum efficiency also efficiency also which is improved and moreover the seven level uh, inverter which contains only six uh, power power electronic switches uh, is a uh, parity based switches and one uh, main switch so at, a, at any point of the time you want you can convert into the three level to seven level output voltage so this is what my conclusion on this topic and these are all the references i referred for the solar power generation and the dc dc converters thank you sir yeah Hope your first presentation is completed. Uh, Sorry. Hope your first presentation is completed, and I am sure yeah. that the next presentation also your title only. Yeah, just a minute, just a minute. Yes. yes. my screen is visible now just a minute it is visible yes yeah 
so this is the work which is on the power quality issues so as i mentioned the power quality introduction like uh, so how to reduce the power quality issues as the customers we are uh, as every day the uh, the rural uh, uh, the rural part of the society which is becoming urban as the number of users are increasing and uh, the part of uh, uh, utilizing every system every office which become automated automated and everyone forced to use all the electronic devices and uh, automated devices so why because the process will be become automation so that's why uh, we, we we need to improve the power quality issues as concerned as possible why because the distribution engineers will concentrate on these issues so based on the, the uh, as per the ieee standards power quality is defined as is a set of parameters which is defining the property of the power supply as delivered the user which is normal operating conditions and the voltage and similarly the powering and grounding delicate equipment in such a way that to satisfy the functioning of the equipment so these are all the basic uh, definitions i want to utilize I, i want to tell and here this work this uh, proposed scheme which is used where a ubic vc ubic vc is nothing but unified power quality condition which is a single structure which combining the both series inverter as well as parallel so series series converter as well as parallel converter which can be used as series apf active power filter and shunt active power filter which will try to deal a balanced and unbalanced loads in order to mitigate in order to compensate the sag and swells in the system along with the dc dc converter so these are all the very common literature i've used so this voltage dip how the voltage dip is within the actually the power quality we cannot observe there is no only by using thd values we can say but we cannot observe practically why because the momentary interruption it is 0.5 to 0.8 second within one minute only less than one minute all the things will be happen like voltage sag swell distortion and all this so here i am i am skipping all this see here this this is all the different uh, power uh, conflicts power uh, waveforms whenever there is a conflict which has happened in the system sudden breakage so here uh, the introduction part uh, the, the, why the power quality used is uh, i mentioned by using so many devices in the regular uh, life as com comes to residential life as well as industrial sector also we are using different types of power furnaces adjustable speed drives induction motors and uh, overheating devices and in our houses we have non linear equipment by using all this and there may be sudden falls which may happen line to ground or line to line falls or maybe sudden short circuit may be taken place and lightning strikes uh, so our object is so to compensate the different power quality issues by in a three phase distribution system which is containing balance and balance system so what i want to compensate the voltage sags swells and uh, power factor so this what i want to concentrate here so uh, this is a very common uh, literature i've used ubic pc what is ubic pc consisting of ubic ubic is consisting of mentioned it is series compensator uh, Uh, shunt compensator series series can be used as dvr uh, dynamic voltage restorer as well as the parallel which can be used for statcom static compensator and uh, dvr can be used for in order to correcting the voltage profiles it is try to maintaining the always maintaining the constant voltages at pcc pcc is nothing but point of common coupling whereas uh, statcom will take care of all the current distortion current uh, distortions in the supply so here i used uh, along with the ubic vc i integrated fuel cell so if you want to say fuel cell advantage so many advantages have been modeled and low cost there is no noise which is from the cells and advantage of here i used proton exchange membrane fuel cell pemfc so because of high energy density and compact design and uh, fast startup even though in the low temperature conditions also it will be started very easily and safe handling less maintenance and less emission so this is all application we can use anywhere we can use in the med medical medical fields and uh, laptops gad all the electronic gadgets smart meters and uh, uh, warehouse trucks and in the defense and all the medical setups we can use uh, the pmcs and the disadvantage only it is the reaction rate of that particular fields is very very slow and uh, and compact design so these are all the disadvantages and i listed here what are the different fuel cell which is available but my my actual uh, configuration is this ubic vc along with the fuel cell with the battery unit i combined a fuel cell along with the battery 
in order in 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 connection to the ubic vc ubic vc itself will take care of all the voltage and uh, uh, current issues and whenever there is sudden disturbance which is up, happened into the system the fuel cell will take care of and uh, even the fuel cell will which is not able to operate the battery storage is sorry your iterates is completed for the first presentation yeah yeah okay just a minute just i'll show my waveforms and i'll stop it so these are all the voltage distortion and the voltage compensation and this is the current compensation and here i as I, I, i said it is uh, current and voltage almost maintaining co co uh, power factor is maintaining constant so this is the power factor and these are all the dhd values i got i got 1.42 and 13.5 3.5 and source current and load voltages and by this way i can mitigate my source current and load voltage as per the ieee standards that is less than 5 percentage i got both the values less than 5 only so this role even this work can be extended to flywheel energy systems or hybrid capacitors and lithium capacitors so this role my work and uh, fuel cell uh, uh, integrated with battery along with the upcs thank you thank you everyone thank you so much if you have any questions i'll try to answer so we appreciate our participants from these any queries okay uh Dr. Prakash, you can proceed with your next presentation, please. Yeah, over, sir. Actually. Okay. Thank you so much. So actually, uh, in the in the schedule, they have in the last uh, they 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 have repeated the same uh, 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 title, but it is mistaken from their end. I have three presentation. I have finished. Completed from your side. Uh, it's fine. I would yeah. like to call the next presenter, Sheikh Joha, and Khan Ikram, on customer service ticketing system. Yes, sir. Can you share the screen and start presenting? Is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am. Time is eight minutes. Please proceed. Yeah. Good evening. Our topic is customer service ticketing system. So we are from Ahmed Sabo Siddiq College of Engineering. B and Ikra Khan. We are pursuing B E in Computer Engineering. We did our diplomas from Ahmed Sabo Siddiq only. We did our implant training in Master Effects Enterprises and saw that they were handling the customers issue manually. So we offer them an automated system called Customer Service Ticketing System. Farhana Siddiqui is our professor. She has been our guide and she is helping us in developing this project. She did her B E in Computer Engineering from F R C R C E University. She did her M Tech in Computer Engineering from Baba Sahib Technological University. She in total have eighteen years of experience, nine years of lecturer, and nine years of assistant professor. So. We are developing a web application for the company Master Effects Enterprises, situated in Mumbai. The purpose of customer service ticketing system is to provide services to the customer in an efficient way by automating the existing manual system with the help of full-fledged computer system and computerized equipment. Here, the project represents an efficient way to provide fast and better services to the client. IT ticketing system is used by many enterprises to deliver rapid and reliable internal customer services, which results in better. and improved it department performances and content employees the customer service ticketing system comes into the existence to avoid the problem in the existing manual system this software is mainly developed to reduce or in some cases lessen the problems faced by the already present system moreover the system is developed for the certain need of the company to execute the operation in an even and efficient efficient way the rapid increase in the communication has also affected the demand for efficient maintenance of the knowledge for the help desk services enabled by such computer system customer service ticketing system handles the system which automate tasks such as ticket sorting and prioritizing ticket forwarding notifications and warnings managing ticket status and other tasks customer service ticketing system where customer can raise a ticket giving a detail about their issue and the company will be notified about the issue thus this will assist the company in providing fast and final services to the customers some of the objectives of our project are to allow better monitoring of the problems expressed by customers to allow customer to raise a ticket that is notify company about the issue that they are facing to allow admin to create and manage users of the system those are customers and technician to allow admin to add or remove services which are provided by their company to allow admin to create update and close or delete any client service ticket at any point of time 
to allow technician to change the status of ticket to in progress while they are working on the issue and once fixed they can make the status resolve now the further explanation will be done by ikra khan am i am i audible yes, yes you are audible thank you professor okay uh the proposed work describe an automated system where customer can raise a ticket giving a detail about their issue and the company will be notified about the issue later the company will send a technician or service provider to rectify the issue the crux for developing the web application is to get easy way to provide services to the customer analysis framework and algorithm what we have what we have here is our users so in user sorry Let's see, please. Your slide is not moving. It's still in introduction. Yeah. so uh, so excuse me yes actually i have made only one slide for introduction and uh, i'm doing the explain uh, explanation on that okay okay please proceed please proceed okay proceed okay. proceed so uh, we have users in users we have administrator customers and technician um, so what is administrator the application will be handled by a single admin user with full access to all the operations the application can carry, carry out the admin access needs to be protected with proper username and password the admin will be able to change the username and password at any point what does customer do the customer created by admin can log into the system with the provided credential and can raise service tickets in case of any issue the customer can see the current or previous raised ticket additionally they can also manage the profile details while creating the request ticket they can update the urgency and, uh, urgency and impact of the raised issue once the ticket is closed customer can provide feedback regarding technician's performance what is what is technician so when the technician start working on any assigned ticket he she can change the status of ticket to in progress and once once fix can make the status to resolver what is services service ticket the service ticket can be created by customer or if needed by admin too this ticket will have subject description service type cctv fax intercom ep abx etc level of impact the issue have an urgency level which help to prioritize the ticket customer can add attachment to ticket those can be image of uh, word or for pdf format each ticket more or less will have following status from the point when they created to the point when they can they get completed that is open pending in progress resolve and close then we have services so following are the services provided by masterfax enterprises currently the services can be added or removed by admin time and attendance with access control cctv multi function devices building intercom fax machine now conclusion so the proposed work describe an automated system that allow customer to raise a ticket and provide the required services to the customer the system is easy to use and simple knowledge of computer our aim is to propose a web application that will help the masterfax enterprises to enhance their company's performance next these are all the references we have used to build our uh, project completely thank you thank you so much If anyone wants to raise the queries, they can proceed by using the chat box. The participants dedicate sessions as in every work. I request the next participant to proceed. Who is Mr. Sonali? Sorry, Ms. Sonali Ambro on security protocol for electronic health record using blockchain. 
sunar. Film sunali belabı. I would like to call the next participant Ms. Susmita T and Subha R, Vaishnavi MP on smart band for women's safety. Susmita. Sir, is my voice is audible? Yes. Can you share the screen with us? Just a minute, sir. Is my PPT is visible? Yes. Okay. Okay, sir. Very good evening to one and all present here. This is Sushmita Subha Vaishnavi MP from Electronics and Communication Department, Vanariaman Institute of Technology, Satya Mangal, is here to present our paper, Smart Solution for Women's Safety. The objective of our project is to find the critical issues that are faced by women and help them to solve through techn technological gadgets. In this project, Arduino is a main component for the smart band. Temperature sensor, pulse rate sensor, GSM and GPL mod GPS module are the other components which are used with Arduino. These components are programmed without any connection with Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. If any one sensor detects different temperature or pulse rate, an alert message is sent to one of a family member. Location number is also sent with the message. This project helps a, each and every woman to overcome their fear, fear about their safety and security. So this gadget is designed as a smart band. We can wear this gadget like a watch in our waist so that the band can monitor the behavior of the person. This gadget will monitor the temperature and pulse rate of a person. Uh, in this project, Arduino is act as a heart of this heart of the smart band. With Arduino, there are four components are connected with it. There are temperature sensor, pulse rate sensor, GPS, and GSM module. Temperature sensor is used to monitor the temperature of a person. Pulse rate sensor is used to monitor the pulse rate of a person. GSM module is used to send a message to one of the family members when some unusual behavior is detected from any one of the sensors. GPS module is used to track the location of the person. When a person is in danger, his temperature or pulse rate will differ. So that time, any one sensor will be detected through the smart band. When anyone, any unusual behavior is detected, uh, excuse me, an alert message will be sent to one of his or her family members, uh, name, their temperature, pulse rate, and location number will be sent to one of his or her family member. So the proposed works of this project is the temperature and pulse rate sensor will monitor the behavior of a person. When an unusual behavior is detected, the sensor sends the detected signal to the Arduino. These situations are pre-programmed into the system based on which the device can make the decision. Arduino alerts GPS module to track the location. Then it will, it will also alert GSM module to send the message to one of the family members. These are the results which we are tested in Proteus software. As you can see, when the temperature or pulse rate sensor increases or decreases, a message will be sent in another window. So in this project, we have concluded that this project can be implemented in different areas. So it, uh, it monitors the good accuracy. When a message is received, he or she needs to make sure whether they are in danger or not. 
if they are they are in danger he or she has asked to report to the police for the immediate action with the help of the location number we can track out the person this helps to save a person in danger so these are the references we have taken so thank you for giving us the wonderful opportunity thank you so much yes so do you have done any prototype model uh, with your uh, proposed system Sir, so have you done any prototype model with your proposed system? Uh, yes, sir. We have done a prototype model in uh, Proteus software. Okay. Uh, we have got, uh, we have done uh, for as a testing like uh, uh, we operated my pulse rate sensor and temperature. Whether it is feasible. Uh... Uh, to design this model because uh, we are telling that it is a wearable model. When we consider that GPS and uh, uh, your uh, uh, GPRS module, the size of the device will become big now. Uh, then how come it, it will be wearable one? So that is my first question. And is there any difference between the, the existing model and uh, your proposed model? Whichever is available in the market. Hello, Sushuta. Sushuta, can you hear? Can we release the mute, Mr. Sushuta? Okay, sir. I think uh, they are not there. There is a network problem, sir. Sorry, shall I proceed? Sir, uh, can I proceed with the next presenter? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I think they are not there. So, the next presenter is Ms. C. Edwin Singh and Dr. J. Amar Pratap Singh on a survey on security challenges in mobile data workers. C. Edwin Singh and Amar Pratap Singh. Any of the persons available? Mr. Edwin, sir. Oh. Good evening, sir. Very good evening. Can you share the screen, please? Just a minute. Or is it visible? Yes, it is visible. You can proceed in the time is eight Okay, thank you. Sir. Good evening to uh, one and all. Uh, I am Edwin Singh, uh, research scholar uh, from Noorul Islam University. Uh, also worked as an assistant professor uh, in DMA Engineering College, Arul Bai uh, Dr. Amar Pradap Singh, uh, who is my uh, research guide, uh, professor of NI University. So the My research uh, topic is Improved Intrusion Detection Framework for uh, MANET, that is Mobile Ad Hoc uh, Network. Uh, that is uh, to find an improved intrusion detection system for uh, MANET. Uh, for, uh, for my research work, a detailed uh, survey regarding the MANET and its uh, security challenges were uh, discussed. That, uh, that will be uh, present in this uh, paper. Uh, then, uh, this, uh, in introduction, um, wireless ad hoc network uh, are ma <coughs> managed, uh, which is a decentralized type of uh, wireless, uh, wireless network. Uh, that is, uh, there is no um, fixed infrastructure or uh, there is no uh, wired connections. Uh, this is uh, uh, whenever we want to uh, add a node or when, uh, whenever we want to remove a node from a, a network mix, uh, it is uh, easily carried out in these uh, types of networks. Uh, <coughs> Uh, the network is ad hoc because it does not rely on a pre-existing infrastructure such as uh, router in wired networks or access point in managed wireless network. So the, um, this is a managed architecture. Uh, normally, the communication will be carried out between the uh, nodes only, uh, uh, handheld uh, devices uh, like uh, mobile or uh, laptop, uh, PDA. Likewise, the devices will be 
and transfer the uh, data the communication will be uh, carried out in uh, like uh, broadcasting message broadcasting way uh, the once the particular receiver receive the message if uh, that receiver is not a intended receiver means that will uh, forward to the nearby node likewise the data will be transferred so this is the man manet architecture <clears throat> there are various applications are there uh, in manet uh, that is mobile attack network uh, mainly uh, military sectors uh, then commercial sector low level then data networks then sensor network and military sector means uh, to maintain the uh, network information between the soldiers vehicles and uh, military information headquarters uh, whenever uh, required and uh, required to form a network means uh, we can easily form a network in this uh, military applications areas then commercial sectors uh, manet are mainly used in disaster relief such as uh, flood uh, then fire and earthquake earthquake they uh, likewise then a low level means used to communicate with the home networks where device communicate to exchange the data then data networks in the sense uh, manet see commercial applications needs high level computing of data for this allowing uh, computers to uh, compute the forwarding data to others then uh, in sensor networks uh, these types of uh, are used to detect uh, detection mostly that is um, like uh, temperature uh, pressure likewise uh, rainfall uh, pollution likewise the in, uh, if uh, we want to sense some information means this sensor networks are applicable then the characteristics of uh, manetors are um, uh, high mobility uh, since uh, uh, the nodes are in a, a move, move, moving way so the mobility will be high then unpredictable network topology because of uh, mobility uh, the topology will uh, get change in a frequent uh, manner then unbounded network size um, we can't uh, fix a size uh, because the uh, manet is uh, infrastructure less so we can add or remove a node in any time so the size of the uh, network is is not fixed then adequate information sharing uh, there is a need to share information from rsu um, uh, to mobile side mobile to mobile which result excessive amount of sharing between nodes in uh, frequent uh, then wireless communication manetor designed for uh, wireless environment to manetor interconnected and exchange their informative via wireless then uh, time critical uh, there is a very short limit short uh, limit of sharing information between nodes to be deliver uh, sufficient energy normally mobiles uh, mobile nodes equipped with sufficient energy with built in battery resources then uh, physical protection uh, manage uh, manets are highly protected than manets in nature manets nodes are more difficult to compromise these are the uh, characteristics of uh, main characteristics of manets then in the security uh, requirements uh, these are the key things that is first one is uh, authentication uh, authentication means this ensure that uh, the message are uh, request users in uh, legitimate user uh, likewise then integ uh, integrity means um, this ensure that the message is received by that authenticated users and ensure that the message is not Uh, tampered or not altered or unauthorized creation of data then confidentiality uh, confidentiality in the sense uh, on the communication between nodes and base stations the message should be secured such that uh, outsiders in the networks are uh, other than the sender and receiver should not be able to understand the confidential information then availability uh, in the availability in the sense that network kind applications uh, should remain in the Uh, presence of critical situations like attacks or fault then access uh, control uh, access control in the sense uh, determining the roles and privilege for the messages and nodes such as the sensitive communications by military uh, and military head office service should not be heard by the other uh, network then uh, unlinkability uh, this is also one of the uh, security requirement in uh, manet then 
Mr. Edwin Singh, sorry to interrupt you. Seven more minutes completed. Only one more minute to complete. Oh, yes, sir, yes, sir. Okay. Okay, then uh, the, um, these are attacks. Um, some of the security attacks are there in managed. Then also, um, routing is the important uh, thing in managed. That is, um, uh, if the data uh, want to be uh, shared, means the routing protocols are uh, used. Uh, there are um, the different types of uh, type, uh, routing protocols are also there. Uh, in our proposed uh, system, uh, we are uh, we are uh, trying to implement the uh, intrusion detection system. Uh, with uh, routing protocol uh, and we'll find an improved intrusion detection method. Uh, find an intrusion detection system for ad hoc wireless network and define an adopt architecture for an intrusion detection system for managed. That is a, a proposed system. Uh, for that only the uh, survey has been uh, done. Uh, the work in the work was in the uh, initial stage only. Uh, then the uh, this is um, this is a proposed system diagram. Okay, uh, then uh, in this survey we have discussed about the factors of authentication, routing, and key sharing techniques for Manet uh, to develop an authenticated and efficient routing which avoids collision attacks and isolates malicious nodes. Okay, these are the references. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, can you please explain your proposed system so that? Uh... Uh, this, is the, uh, this is the proposed uh, system diagram. Uh, actually, uh, Within the node, also uh, within the network, uh, there are two categories of uh, intrusion detection systems uh, we are trying to implement. Uh, that is, um, uh, within each and every node, uh, there must be an intrusion detection system. Uh, it will find if there is any intruder uh, in um, assessing that node means, it will find automatically, then that information will be carried out uh, or uh, that information will be stored. Uh, likewise, uh, in a network also, there is an intrusion detection system, which will also find the intruder in a network and it will alert the uh, remaining nodes uh, regarding the intrusion. Likewise, uh, uh, we are uh, going to implement the uh, uh, work. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. I would like to call the next presenter. This is Mr. Ms. Neil Agarwal on stock market protection using recurrent neural networks. Uh, am I audible, Neil sir? Aryan Agarwal. Yes, kindly share the screen in person. Yes, sir. just a second, please. Uh, is my screen visible, sir? Yes. The time is 8 minutes, kindly proceed. Sure, sir. So, sir, uh, the topic on which we have worked is uh, the stock market prediction using recurrent neural networks, which comes under uh, artificial intelligence and deep learning. And uh, the people who have worked on this is myself, Neil Agarwal, Aryan Agarwal, uh, A. Ritesh Chandra, we are the students of Lovely Professional University, and we've been guided, guided by our assistant professor, uh, which is Ankita Wadhavan. So first, uh, I would like to talk about the prediction of stock market, the analysis of stock market as a problem, as an issue, which is a prominent uh, and widely challenged and discussed uh, issue in um, invest investors and stockholders. So currently, uh, so far, uh, in so many years and decades, a lot of methodologies have been used uh, to be able to predict the stock market. And uh, however, this, this problem, this uh, particular uh, way, or this, this particular issue of uh, predicting the stock market, the, to be able to do that, we identify uh, the prediction uh, problem as a time series problem because the uh, values in the future, the upcoming values 
depend on the prior values or the or the pattern that has been so uh, so far and for this uh, we have used uh, recurrent neural networks because recurrent neural networks in a way uh, they use uh, memory to be able to store the intermediate values while learning or while training the algorithm and uh, more to be more specific with uh, recurrent neural networks we have used uh, lstm uh, which is uh, short for long long short term memory what lstm does is that it uh, improvises uh, on the long term dependencies of the recurrent neural network and it helps in achieving accuracy and uh, stability uh, for the prediction and uh, uh, generally uh, the prediction of stock market uh, it relies on uh, the market sentiment uh, market sentiment can be influenced is generally influenced by a lot of external factors such as uh, social media presence uh, the market reputation of the company business plans in motion uh, reliability of the stock uh, however to incorporate the influence of these factors in the prediction algorithm it would involve the correlation of a lot of factors or each of these factors individually uh and we'll have to quantify the respective significance and integrate it with the uh, model that we are going to use however uh the primary factor which is significant in influencing the stock values is uh on the past numerical data which makes the stock stock market prediction that's why we identify the stock market prediction problem as a time series problem so we train a model based on recurrent neural networks uh identifying the pattern that has been so far and use it to predict the future values so far lstm does this the best uh, in all of uh, other algorithms which have which have been uh, employed employed uh, for example support vector machines estimated hypothesis etc lstm in recurrent neural networks works the best and we have worked on the same um, with some metrics which we have used on our own so here this flow chart uh, it's a, it's a part of, part of the full complete flow chart this flow chart uh, basically uh, shows uh, the flow of program or code that we have uh, that we have uh, put down and uh, here as as you can see that we have used uh, the stock data of apple incorporated uh, for 9 uh, 9 years which is from the 1st of january 2012 up till now like the code if we run it any time it will run uh, it will uh, fetch the uh, stock values from uh, yahoo finance online and use that to train our model and uh, we have used 90% of those uh, of, of the data as you uh, is used for training and the remaining 10% is used for testing and uh, the, the other flow is a is a very cliched uh, uh, program flow for any machine learning um pr for any machine learning program and uh, here we can see that um as an optimizer we've used adam and we've used mean squared error for loss and accuracy as a metric and we have trained the model uh to be able to learn and uh, predict the values uh, stock values for the future uh and we have done this on apple on the data for apple incorporated later we used the same trained model to be able to test uh our model for other uh, for other four companies so here we can see that the result that we have obtained is quite phenomenal as you can see here that the curve in orange it represents the valid data and the curve in green it represents the predicted value with blue uh, representing the training curve uh, we'll be able to infer that the predicted values closely follow very closely follow the valid data in terms of pattern now the errors in magnitude or intensity um however they are explicit but the rise and fall of maxima and minima are almost perfectly aligning with the actual recorded data this implies that recurrent neural networks uh using lstm layers is capable of telling us at least whether uh, a stock value in time will rise or fall the intensity of the drop or growth however can be relative Uh, relatively harder uh, to to determine now here you can see that uh we have used the same model to be able to predict for other companies such as microsoft google and amazon we've again done the same for apple but for a different time frame and you can see that how well uh, the data values have been predicted
and uh, I think this but is pretty much. Uh, yes, sir. Last two more minutes to go with your presentation. Uh, sir, I'm pretty much done. Uh, this uh, we have, in fact, uh, to be able to be concluding. We have, in fact, uh, used. We have already, in fact, work, began working on the future scope of the same algorithm, where we're using R2 score and better metrics to be able to get uh, better results. And in real time, um, the the like we can be able to uh, employ. Uh, uh, correlation and regression for individual uh, uh, cases of stock values uh, so that in the for, for the time series data, we can have the uh, challenges that we are facing when it comes to magnitude uh, come down to a really small level so that in real time, uh, stock, value, sto stock values uh, can be fetched and uh, predictions, very close, uh, very close predictions above 90% can be made uh, this is the future scope of our current uh, of our current work. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Is it as a participant can place the queries or place the queries through chat box as well? I would like to present, I would like to call the next presenter, Sri Vidya V and Jay Sunarayan on short descriptive concept evaluation using word and word numeric techniques. Sri Vidya and Jay Sunarayan. Yeah, but it wasn't the other one. Sleep with you. Request to unmute. Sir, am I audible? Yes. The system is stuck. It's because your network is shade schemes. Still there. And it is all the issue and you will be presenting next. Meanwhile, we will be complete with Mr. Jeeva R and okay. then Mr. Kumaran on detection of false ranking apps using level aggregation. Mr. Jeeva. Good evening, sir. Yes, yes sir. I'm I'm share the screen and proceed. Okay, sir. So, uh, Sri Vijay has to stop the screen sharing, oh, sir. You can, you can, you can proceed. You, you share your screen so that it will be closed. Sir, it is not allowing me to sharing the screen. Is it not allowing? Sri Vijay. Yes, now you start presenting. Uh, share the screen, Mr. Jeeva. Yeah, sure, sir. Can you share? Yes, sure. Can you? Yes, my screen is visible now. No. Yes, now it is visible. 
Please proceed. So we need to on as my topic is uh, direction of false pointing apples apps using level aggregation as my name uh, or Jiva. I mentor Dr. Yen Murtukum, Francis Survey Engineering College, Kanal Valley. Uh, abstract. Uh, normally, we are using mobile devices in order to carry out our daily routines. For that, we are installing so many apps in that. Uh, when we all want to install something apps like that, we will consider the app based upon by, through our friends or through ads like that. When we want to purchase it from the store, the uh, solution is we have to download it, install it, and we have to use it. If it is compatible, then we can have it. Otherwise, we will install it. But we can't uh, do this uh, all for all the apps. So we need something. Now, the known parameters uh, that are given by all the app stores are nothing but review, ranking, and rating. Uh, we know how it uh, has been calculated. It is calculated from our inputs only. Whenever we are using, we are using app, it will asking some feedback. How it is um, using, whether you are satisfied with this app, just give me some rating. If you are okay with it, we are giving the rating, we are giving you the reviewing, whatever it is, we have that. Based upon that, they are calculating some value and they will consider it as a ranking on the app. It is the statement that has been given by the Google and App Store state, App Store uh, representatives. Okay. So, what my consideration is, apart from that, what are the various things that may affect the contributing factor of that? And the common factor is reviews. So in reviews, they are using a sentiment analysis process. So many algorithms has been used and considering the only outcome has become positive or negative. Okay, so only these parameters can affect the app. My, my idea is a little more different. So what are the other parameters like versions, update frequencies, keyword matching levels, and these parameters are affect the app's sustainability and survivability in a daily routine. So these are three parameters that I have mentioned here version change level, keyword matching level, and feature matching level. And these parameters as combinedly can affect the app's ranking, rating, and reviewing parallelly. So in the app's universe, so ranking is one of the major role because whenever you want to download and install an app, we just click the category and we will see only top 10 apps, whether it is useful or not. They have tried for it. Okay, it is a ranking one. We can choose from there based upon that. But the review platforms, that means one uh, ranks of the Play Stores has been differing from the other Play Stores because no, so many app stores are available in the market. Each mobile uh, manufacturing company has in its own app store in order to provide the app services to the players. So it's just a statistics I'm having this. That means over the application, 66% have not gotten a solitary ranking and 99% viewers and beneficiary. Because whenever we want to use an app regarding, for example, scanning the document, playing the music, playing the video, or some other purposes, we just feel category and select the app. So most of the time, it will become unbeneficial because we only know that this app can easily go to the top and doesn't give any uh, useful purposes. So it becomes unbe unbeneficial. Later, it becomes down. But for that time, it is just a waste of time for the user. It's just my survey paper. So I will shut, cut it off short, right? So this there was nothing but is using a multi-homing technique. So in this stage, it identifies what are the various identifiers the application having. Okay, in each category, it identifies based upon that it differentiates the applications. Likewise, the application can be easily categorized. Next one, application level instigation and vendor level examination. So it both considers about developer and the user side, and based upon that, how this application can be easily used. It doesn't look at, I mean, explicit parameters. Okay, they're just explicit. What are the various attributes that can be contributed from the user side that can affect the position, that is ranking of the application. Next, MOS. It's just a rating scale. And it's another tool which can be used. What are, what are the same so far now? It's just a theoretical. But in this concept, they have evaluated this MOS scale for evaluating the app. Sajiva, am I audible? Yes, 
retailers support one of the best degree that is a messaging application we are no so many messaging applications are there so from that the messaging applications how it can be activated easily okay so even for Sajiva, on your side, there are Sajiva? Sir, he is not in Yes, uh, I would like to call Ms. Srividya to proceed, to proceed with her presentation. Ms. Srividya? Kindly uh, share the screen and proceed, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Very good evening to all. This is Sridhya V. My project topic is short descriptive answer evaluation using word embedding techniques. In this project, we are focusing on ways to evaluate short descriptive student answers using word, ed word embedding techniques. And the algorithms used for this analysis are LSI, word to vec and sentence word. In this project, we are using University of North Texas Computer Science Short Answer Dataset created by Michael Morse for his paper, Learning to Grade Short Answer Questions Using Semantic Similarity Measures and Dependency Graph Alignments. In this, we uh, calculate the uh, word uh, vector representation of each student answer and the model answer using the uh, word embedding algorithms and we calculate the cosine similarity between them and then uh, we uh, we compare the performance of each model based on its uh, accuracy. Uh, automatic scoring systems have attracted much attention during the past years. It saves the time for the instruction spent for evaluating student answers and also it gives a fair, accurate score based on the algorithm provided. Short answers are basically asked, uh, uh, which is, uh, short answers will be asked basically about a specific concepts or topics. Then uh, by evaluating the short answers, we could uh, get a good understanding about how a student know about a specific topic. In uh, This can be easily done using automatic scoring systems. Uh, automatic scoring systems basically work by comparing the student answers with the model answer provided. This is a sample question and model answer available in the data set. This is a set, uh, image of a set of student answers for the sample and question provided. This is the block diagram of our model. First, uh, we pre-process the data, uh, data set uh, by removing stoppers and punctuation for LSI and Virtuac model, but the pre-processing is not done for uh, sentence word model. Then the resu resultant text is inputted to the uh, res each uh, respective word to uh, respective word embedding algorithms, and we create a, a vector representation for both the student and model answer, and we calculate the similarity between both the vectors using cosine similarity, and this similarity measure is scaled to a range uh, 0 to 5 scale to generate the score. Then uh, we calculate the accuracy of the generated score by comparing it with the ans answer score provided in the data set. Then we compare the performance of each model based on the score predicted. This is one of the algorithms used in our model, LSI. It is a topic modeling algorithm and uh, indexing and retrieval method is that uses a mathematic 
skill technique called singular value decomposition to identify the patterns and relationship uh, between the terms and concepts contained in an unstructured collection of text. First, we index the documents available in the data set. Then, uh, then we remove all the stop words and punctuation and clean the text. Then uh, a term by document matrix is uh, created where each column represents the document and each uh, row represents the words present in the set of documents. And each cell in the term by document matrix represents the count of uh, that word present in a particular document. Then we calculate the singular value decomposition of the term by document matrix to get the inherent structure of the text. And uh, for query also this uh, count of uh, this uh, vector is calculated and we calculate the cosine similarity between them to get the similarity measure. And then it is scaled to a zero to five scale to generate the score. This is under model used in the, uh, this is under algorithm used in our model. Uh, word to vec is, an, uh, is used for computing continuous vector representations of words from very large data sets. Uh, it is, there are two types included in word to vec models that is continuous bag of words model and uh, continuous kickgram model. We use this continuous kickgram model in our project. Uh, the vector representation of the current word is fed into the logistic linear classifier. Then the classifier predicts the vector, vector representation of the possible neighboring words of the current word. Then uh, there is a window of uh, words used in this model. Uh, we the window means the word count before and after the current words. We the order gen propose to keep the window of uh, neighboring words small because uh, distance because since the distance words are less related to the current word. Sorry to interrupt, Mr. Nimitha. It is a completed translation. Find the passage. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, this is at the model uh, sentence bird, a modification of the pre trained bird network that uses Siamese and triangular uh, network structure to derive semantically meaningful sentence embeddings that can be compared using cosine similarity. The S bird using pooling operation to the output of bird to derive a fixed sized sentence embedding. There are three pooling strategies op opted. Uh, using the output of CLS to token and using uh, other strategy is mean strategy by computing the mean of all the output vectors. And uh, another strategy used is a maximum max strategy that is compute max over type of the output vectors. We, we created a confusion matrix for our model since the Evaluation is different for each instructor. We included the predictor scores having an absolute difference less than or equal to one from the actual score to the true positive category. If the absolute difference is more than one and the predicted score is less than the actual score, we consider those scores as false negatives. If the absolute ne difference is more than one and the predicted score is greater than the actual score, we consider those as false positive. This confusion matrix is used to generate the accuracy of our model. These are some of the good predictions of each model. Here we can see that if the uh, word keywords from the model answer is not present in the answer set, and uh, if the answer set is low, we can find that the word to act shows uh, good predictions. And this is some of the bad predictions of each model. And in this, we can see that uh, if the answer is very long and ha have some keywords present in the student answer, then 
attendance but shows better accuracy. This is the performance matrix of each algorithm used in the uh, analysis. To conclude, we uh, we have found that Virtuvec shows better accuracy in all the cases and uh, LSI shows better accuracy if the tokens and the synonyms of tokens present in the model answer after pre-processing are present in the student answer. Uh, and for long answer and which do not have or less number of tokens or the synonyms of tokens present in the model answer after pre-processing is present in the student answer, sentence per shows better accuracy. These are the references included. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Vidya. And with this, we have completed our day one secondary participants sessions. And I request everyone to turn on the video so that uh, I will I would like to take just a snip of uh, pick to my uh, system so that it will be a comprising for a, for this day one conference. I request everyone to just turn on the video. All the participants who are available can turn on the videos. Is it, is it possible uh, for the respective participants to turn on the videos? That's okay, no problem. Uh, we will go with the this picture. Yes. Thank you so much. And I hope you had a very nice and great useful information with the respective conferences. So I thank everyone to be as a part for this respective conference on the day one. I would like to uh, close this session currently and we will Meet up again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. for the respective conference of the day two. So thank you so much. And I thank all the session chairs, keynote speakers, who have given multiple sessions and inputs for our technical participants. Thank you so much, everyone. We will meet up tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Thank you so much.